As Long as You Wish by John O'Keefe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times. As Long as You Wish by John O'Keefe. If somehow you get trapped in a circular time system, how long is the circumference of an infinitely retraced circle? The patient sat stiffly in the leather chair on the other side of the desk. Nervously, he pressed a coin into the palm of one hand. Just start anywhere, I said, and tell me all about it. As before? Without waiting for an answer, he continued, the coin clutched tightly in one hand. I'm Charles J. Fisher, professor of philosophy at Riser College. He looked at me quickly. Or at least I was until recently. For a second his face was boyish. Professor of philosophy, that is. I smiled and found that I was staring at the coin in his hand. He gave it to me. On one side I read the words. The statement on the other side of this coin is false. The patient watched me with an expressionless face. I turned over the coin. It was engraved with the words, The statement on the other side of this coin is false. That's not the problem, he said. Not my problem. I had the coin made when I was an undergraduate. I enjoyed reading one side, turning it over, reading the other side, and so on. A fiendish enjoyment, like boys planning where to put the tipped-over outhouse. I looked at the patient. He was thirty-eight, single, medium build, had an M.A. and Ph.D. from an Eastern University. I knew this and more from the folder on my desk. Eight months ago, he continued, I read about the spheres found on Paney Island. He stopped, looking at me questioningly. Yes, I know, I said. I opened my desk drawer, took out a clipping from the newspaper, and handed it to him. That's it. I read the clipping before putting it back into the drawer. Manila, September 24th. INS. Archaeologists from University of California have discovered in earth fault of recent quake a sphere two feet in diameter of unidentifiable material. Dr. Carl Schwartz, head of the group, said the sphere was returned to the university for study. He declined to answer questions on the cultural origin of the sphere. There wasn't any more in the newspapers about it, he said. I have a friend in California who got me the photographs. He looked at me intently. You won't believe any of this. He pressed the coin into the palm of his hand. You won't be able to. The photographs, he continued, as if lecturing, were of characters projected by the sphere when placed before a focused light. The sphere was transparent, you see, embedded with dark microscopic specks. By moving the sphere a certain distance each time, there was a total projection of 360 different characters in 18 different orderings, or 19 different orderings if you count one which was a list of all the characters. I made a mental note of the numbers. I felt they were significant. As I said, he continued, I obtained the photographs of the characters. Very strange shapes, totally unlike the characters of Oriental languages, but yet that is the closest way to describe them. He jerked forward in his chair, except, of course, ostensibly. Later, I said, I wanted to get through the preliminaries first. There would be time later to see the photographs. The characters projected by the sphere, he said, weren't like the characters of any known language. He paused dramatically. There is reason to believe that they had origin in an unknown culture, a culture more scientifically advanced than our own. And the reasons for the supposition? I asked. The material. The material of the sphere. It could only be roughly classified as ferroplastic, totally unknown, amazing imperviousness, a synthetic material hardly the product of a former culture. From Mars? I said, smiling. There were all kinds of conjectures, but, of course, 
The important thing was to see if the projection of characters was a message. The message, if any, would mean more than any conjecture. You translated it? He polished the coin on his jacket. You won't dare believe it, he said sharply. He cleared his throat and stiffened into a more rigid posture. It wasn't exactly translation. You see, to us, none of the characters had designation. They were just characters. So it was a problem of decoding, I asked. As it turned out, no. Decoding is dependent on knowledge of language characteristics, characteristics of known languages. Decoding was tried, but without success. No, what we had to find was a key to the language. You mean like the runestone? More or less. In principle, we needed a picture of a cow, and a sign of meaning indicating one of the characters. For me, there was no possibility of finding similarities between the characters and characters of other languages. That would require tremendous linguistic knowledge and library facilities. Nor could I use a decoding approach. That would require special knowledge of techniques and access to electronic computers and other mechanical aids. No, I had to work on the assumption that the key to the sphere was implicit in the sphere. You hope to find the key to the language in the language itself. Exactly. You know, of course, some languages do have an implicit key. For example, hieroglyphics, or picture language. The word for cow is a picture of a cow. He looked at the toes of his shoes. You won't be able to believe it. It's impossible to believe. I use the word impossible in its logical sense. In most languages, he continued, looking up from his shoes, the sound of some words themselves indicate the meaning of the word. Onomatopoetic words like bow-wow, buzz. And the key to the unknown language, I asked. How did you find it? I watched him push the coin against the back of his arm, then lift it to read the backward letters pressed into his skin. He looked up at me and smiled. I built models of the characters, big material ones exactly proportionate to the ones projected. Then, quite by accident, I viewed one of them through a glass globe the size of the original sphere. What do you think I saw? What? I noticed he had the boyish look again. A distortion of the model. But that's not what's important. The distortions, on study, gave specific visual entities, like when looking at one of those trick pictures and suddenly seeing the lion in the grass. The lines outlying the lion are there all the time. Only the observer has to view them as the outline of a lion. It was the same with the models of the characters, except the shapes that appeared were not of lions or other recognizable things, but they did suggest. He pressed the coin against his forehead, closed his eyes, and appeared to be thinking deeply. Yes, impossible to believe. No one can believe it. In addition to the visual response, the distortions gave me definite feelings. Not f mixtures of feelings, but one definite emotional experience. How do you mean? One character, when viewed through the globe, gave me a visual image, and, at the same time, a strong feeling of light hilarity. I take it, then, that these distortions seem to connote meanings, rather than denote them. You might say that their meaning was conveyed through a gestalt experience on the part of the observer. Yes, each character gave a definite gestalt, but the gestalt was the same for each observer, or at least for thirty-five observers there was an eighty percent correlation. I whistled softly. And the translation? Doctor, what would you say if I told you the translation was unbelievable, that it couldn't be seriously entertained by any man. What if I said it would take the sanity of any man who believed it? I would say that it might well be incorrect. He took some papers from his pocket and laughed excitedly, slumping down in the chair. <laughs> this is 
the complete translation in idiomatic English. I'm going to let you read it, but first I want you to consider a few things. He hid the papers behind the back of his chair. His face became even more boyish, almost as if he were deciding on where to put the tipped-over outhouse. Consider first, Doctor, that there was a total projection of 360 different characters, the same number as the number of degrees in a circle. Consider also that there were 18 different orderings of the characters, or 19 counting the alphabetical list. The square root of 360 would lie between 18 and 19. Yes, I said. I remembered there was something significant about the numbers, but I wasn't at all sure that it was this. Consider also, he continued, that the communication was through the medium of a sphere. Moreover, keep in mind that physics accepts the path of beam of light as its definition of a straight line. Yet, the path is a curve. If extended sufficiently, it would be a circle, the section of a sphere. All right, I said. By now the patient was pounding the coin against the sole of one shoe. And, he said, keep in mind that, in some sense, time can be thought of as another dimension. He suddenly thrust the papers at me and sat back in the chair. I picked up the translation and began reading. The patient sat stiffly in the leather chair on the other side of the desk. Nervously, he pressed a coin into the palm of one hand. "'Just start anywhere,' I said, and tell me all about it. "'As before?' Without waiting for an answer, he continued. The coin clutched tightly in one hand. "'I'm Charles J. Fisher, professor of philosophy at Riser College.' He looked at me quickly. "'Or at least I was until recently. For a second time,' His face was boyish. Professor of philosophy, that is. I smiled and found that I was staring at the coin in his hand. He gave it to me. On one side, I read the words, the statement on the other side of this coin is false. The patient watched. End of As Long As You Wish by John O'Keefe The Beast of Space by F. E. Hardert Read by Mark Nelson This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. The Beast of Space by F. E. Hardert Here the dark cave, along which Nat Sterrett had been creeping, broaden into what his powerful searchlight revealed to be a low, wide, smoothly circular room. At his feet lapped black, thick-looking waves of an underground lake, a pool of viscous substance that gave off a penetrating, poignant odor of acid, sweetish and intoxicating, unlike any acid he knew. The smell rolled up in a sickening, sultry cloud that penetrated his helmet, made him cough and choke. Near its center projected from the sticky stuff what appeared to be the nose of a spaceship. He looked down near his feet at the edge of the pool where thick, slowly moving tongues of the liquid appeared to reach up toward him as if intent on pulling him into its depths. As each hungry wave fell back it left a slimy, snake-like trail behind. Now came a wave of strange music, music such as he had never heard before. Faintly, it had begun some time back, so faintly he was barely aware of it. Now it swelled into a smooth, impelling wail, lulling him into drowsiness. He did not wonder why he could hear through the soundproof space helmet he wore. He ceased to wonder about anything. There was only the strange sweetness of the acid and the throbbing music. Abruptly the spell was broken by something shrilling in his brain sending little chills racing up and down his spine. Digger, a small, oddly canine-like creature with telepathic powers, a space-dweller which men found when they first came to the asteroids. 
the relationship between spacehounds and men was much the same as between man and dog in the old earthbound days. Appropriate name for the beast, Digger. With those large, incredibly hard claws, designed for rooting in the metal makeup of the asteroids for vital elements, the spacehound could easily have shredded the man's spacesuit and helmet, could, at any time, tear huge chunks out of men's fine ships. The half-conscious man jerked his thin form erect. His mouth, which had gaped loosely, closed with a snap into firm lines. "'She isn't in this hell-hole, Digger. You wouldn't expect her to be where we could find her easily.' Scooping the small beast up under his good arm, he quickly climbed the steep, slimy slope of the cave. The other arm in his suit hung empty. That empty arm in the spacesuit told the story of an Earthman become voluntarily exile, choosing the desolation of space to the companionship of other humans who would deluge him with unwanted sympathy. The space-hound was friendly in its own fashion. Fortunately, such complex things as sympathy were apparently outside its abilities. The two could interchange impressions of danger, comfort, pleasure, discomfort, fear, and appreciation of each other's company, but little more. Whether or not the creature could understand his thoughts, he could not tell. As he went on, he reviewed, mentally, the events leading up to his landing here. The sudden appearance on his teleview screen of the face and slim shoulders of a girl. Her attractiveness plainly distinguishable through her helmet. For a moment, he forgot that he disliked women. The call for help cut short, but not before he had learned that, apparently, she was being held prisoner on asteroid Moira. He knew he'd have to do what he could even if it meant unwanted company for an indefinite length of time. The spell was gone soon after her face vanished. He remembered former experiences with attractive-looking girls. Damn traditions! A change in his course and a landing on asteroid Moira. Here he'd found a honeycomb of caves, all leading from one large main tunnel. The cavern walls had been of a translucent, quartz-like substance, ranging in color from yellowish-brown to violet-gray. It looked vaguely familiar, yet he could not place it. There was not time to examine it more carefully. The room in which he had found the evil, hungry lake had been the first one to the right. Now he crossed to the opening in the opposite wall. The mouth of this cave was much larger, wider than the other. He stood in the opening, slowly swung the beam of his torch around the smooth walls, still holding Digger, who by now was indicating that he'd like to be set down. Nat released him unthinkingly, his mind fully taken up with what the light revealed. Spaceships. The room was packed with them all sizes, old and new. A veritable sargasso. At first he thought they might be craft belonging to nameless inhabitants of this world, but as he approached them he recognized terrestrial identifications. The first was a scout ship of American spaceways. Nat recognized the name, Ceres, remembered a telecast account of its disappearance in space. There was a neat little reward for information as to its whereabouts. Nat's lips curled in derision. It wouldn't equal the expense of his journey out here. There was a deep groove in the smooth material of the floor where the ship had been dragged through the doorway into the room. What machines could have done this work without leaving their own traces? He went to the other ships. All were small, mostly single or two-passenger craft. The last entry in the logs of many was to the effect that they were about to land on the asteroid Moira to rescue a girl held captive there. None had crashed. All ships were in perfect order. But all were deserted. Two doors were gone from the interior of one of the vessels. They might have been removed for any of a hundred reasons. But why here? Nat's glance swept around the room came to rest on the figure of a heavy-duty robot of familiar design. Semi-human in form, it looked like some misshapen, bent, headless giant. He inspected it. Myers Robot, Inc., Earth designed for mining operations on Mars. 
Well, Digger, I can see now how these ships were brought in here. That robot could move any of one of these with ease. But that doesn't explain where the humans have gone. It might be space pirates using this asteroid for a base, or it might be some alien form of life. We're still free. Shall we beat it, or stay and try to check this out?" He did not know how much of this got over to the Space Hound, but the impressions he received in answer were those of approving their remaining where they were. I suppose the best system is to explore the rest of the caves in order. Let's go. Followed by Digger, he walked quietly toward the next cave on the left, slipped through the doorway, and standing with his back against the wall, swung the light of his torch in a wide, swift arc about the room. Halfway around, he stopped abruptly. A slim, petite figure appeared clearly in the searchlight's glare. The girl he had seen on the televisor stood in the middle of the room, facing a telecaster, her back toward him. She did not seem aware of him as he moved forward. What could be wrong? Surely that light would arouse her. The figure did not turn as he approached. So near was he now that he could seize her easily, still she made no move. Nat stepped to one side, flashed his torch in her face. Her beautifully lashed eyes stared straight ahead, unblinkingly. The expression on her lovely composed face did not change. A robot. He laughed bitterly. But then he was not the only one. She was an Earth product. Nat opened her helmet and found the trademark of Spurgeon's robots hung like a necklace about her throat. But whoever had lured him here easily could have removed her from one of the vessels in the front cave. It did not seem like the work of pirates, more likely unknown intelligent beings. He turned to examine the televisor. It too was an Earth product. The mechanism was of old design. Evidently, it had been taken from the first of the ships to land here. Outside of the telecaster and the solitary robot, there was nothing to be seen in this cave. A sound behind him. He whirled, heat-rod poised for swift, stabbing action. Nothing, except small bowling-ball things rolling in through a narrow door ridiculous things of the same yellowish quartz material as composed the cave walls. At regular intervals a dull bluish light poured forth from rounded holes in their smooth sides. And issuing forth from within these comic globes was the same weird, compelling music he had heard before. They rolled up to him, brushed against his toes, a shrilling in his brain told him that Digger was aware of them. Back, Digger, he thought, as he drew away from the globes. They poured their penetrating blue light over him, inspectingly, while the music from within rose and fell in regular cadences, sweetly impelling and dulling to the senses as strong oriental incense. But Digger was not soothed. The space hound lunged at one of the globes. Instead of slashing its sides, he found himself sailing through the air toward it. Nat received impressions of irritation combined with astonishment. Within the globes the music rose to a furious whine, while one of the things shot forth long tentacles from the holes in its side. Lightning swift they shot forth, wrapped themselves about the body of the space-hound, constricting. Digger writhed vainly, his claws powerless to tear at the whip-like tentacles. Nat severed the tentacles at their base with a heat-beam. He turned, strode toward the door watching the spheres apprehensively out of the corner of his eye, ready to jump aside should they roll toward him suddenly. But they followed at respectful distances, singing softly. Before he reached the door he found himself walking in rhythm to the music, his head swaying. It came slowly, insidiously. Before he was aware his body no longer obeyed his will. Muscles refused to move other than in coordination with the music. His arm relaxed, the heat-rod sliding from his grasp. But Digger! The space-hound sent out a barrage of vibrations that fairly rocked his brain out of his skull. Simultaneously 
the beast attacked the nearest globes, tearing fiercely at them. Rapidly the others rolled away, but two lay torn and motionless, the music within them stilled. Nat reached down, retrieved the heat-rod. "'I think we'd better look for a squeaker. Next time they might get you, Digger.' They returned to the room of the spaceships, seeking one of the small, portable radio amplifiers used for searching out radium. It was known as a squeaker because of the constant din it made while in use. The noise would cease only when radium was within a hundred feet of the mechanism. He found one after searching a few of the smaller ships. With the portable radio strapped to his back, power switched on, he started again down the main tunnel. The globe set up their seductive rhythms as before, but he could not hear them above the discord of his squeaker. Failing to lure him as before, they sought to force him in the direction they desired him to go by darting at him suddenly, lashing him with their tentacles. But it was a simple thing to elude them. Still remained the question, why could they want to lure him into that stinking pool of acid? He flashed a beam of heat at the nearest of the annoying globes. Under the released energy it glowed, yet did not melt. But the tentacles sheared off and the blue lights faded. The flow of music changed to shrill whines, as of pain, and its rolling ceased. The others drew back. He turned down another tunnel. They stopped at the cave beyond the one where he had found the robot girl. It was sealed by a locked door, one of the airlock doors from that space vessel, firmly cemented into the natural opening of the cave. Nat bent forward, listening, his helmeted head pressed against the door. No sound. He was suddenly aware of the dead silence that pressed in on him from all sides now that the globes no longer sang, and his squeaker had been turned off. The powerful energy of his heat-beam sputtered as it melted the lock into incandescent droplets which sizzled as they trickled down the cold metal of the door. The greasy quartz-like material at the side of the door glowed in the heat from his rod, but no visible effect upon it could be seen. What was that material? He knew, yes, he knew, but he could not place a mental finger on it. He thrust the shoulder of his good arm against the heavy door, swung it inwards, stepped inside. The light of his torch pierced the silence, picked out a human skeleton in one corner. He hurried toward it. No, it was not entirely a skeleton as yet. The flesh and bone had been eaten away from the lower part of the body to halfway up the hips, as though from some strong acid. The rest of the large, sturdy frame lay sunken under the remains of a spacesuit, which was tied clumsily around the middle to retain all the air possible in the upper half of it. Evidently, some acid had eaten away the lower half of the man's body after he had suffocated. The face was that of a Norwegian. By one outstretched hand a small notebook lay open with a leather back upward. The corners of several pages were turned under carelessly. Nat swung the torch around the room. It was bare. The notebook, quickly he picked it up. The page on which the writing began was dated May 10, 2040, about two months ago. Helmar Swenson. My daughter Helena, age nineteen, and I were lured into the maw of this hellish monster by a robot calling for help in our television screen. This thing, known to man as Asteroid Moira, is in actuality one of the gigantic mineral creatures which inhabited a planet before it exploded, forming the asteroids. Somehow it survived the catastrophe, and, forming a hard crustaceous shell about itself, has continued to live here in space as an asteroid. It is apparently highly intelligent and has acquired an appetite for human flesh. The singing spheres act as its sensory organs, separated from the body and given locomotion. It uses these to lure victims into its stomach in the first cave. I escaped its lure at first because of the squeaker I carried with me. We set up these two doors as a protection from the beast while we stayed here to examine it, but the monster got me when I fell and the squeaker was broken. My daughter rescued me after the acid of the pool had begun eating away my flesh. 
My Helena is locked in the room opposite this one. She has food and water to last until July 8th. Oxygen seeps in here somehow. The beast wants to keep her alive until it can get her out of the room to devour her." Here the writing became more cramped and difficult to read. I have put the key in my mouth to prevent the spheres from opening the door should they force their way into this room. Someone must come to save my Helena. I can't breathe." The writing ended in a long scrawl angling off the page. The pencil lay some distance from the body. July 8th. But that had been almost a week ago. He unscrewed the man's helmet, tried to pry the jaws open. They would not move. The airless void surrounding the tiny planetoid had frozen the body until now it was as solid as the quartz cave walls. But there was but one thing to do. The other door must be melted down. He leaped halfway across the room toward the door in the opposite wall. Could it be possible that he was in time? Anxiously, he flung a bolt of energy from his heat rod toward the lock, holding a flashlight under the other stump of an arm. The molten metal flowed to the floor like a rivulet of lava. The door, hanging off balance, screeched open. Air swooshed past him in its sudden escape from the room. He squeezed himself through, peered carefully about to see a slim spacesuit start to crumple floorward in a corner. The girl was alive. He started toward her. The slim figure pulled itself erect again. He saw a drawn, emaciated face behind the helmet. Then, with a fury that unnerved him, she whipped out a heat rod, shot a searing bolt in his direction. He felt the fierce heat of it as it whizzed past his shoulder. In his brain, Digger's thoughts of attack came to him. He flung an arm around the space hound, dragged it back as he withdrew toward the door. The girl continued to fire bolt after bolt straight ahead, her eyes wide and staring. They made the door, waited outside while the firing within continued. When at last it was still within, he peered around the corner of the room. She lay in a crumpled heap in the corner. Quietly, he re-entered, picked her up awkwardly. Through the thin, resistant folds of the spacesuit, he could feel the warmth of her, but could not tell whether the heart still beat or not. They would have to take her to one of the ships. Her limp form was held tightly under his good arm as Nat hurried down the main tunnel. Digger apparently realized the seriousness of the situation, for he received the impressions of must hurry from the beast and another creature, looking much like him, surrounded by small creatures of the same type, trapped in a crevice. "'Aren't you a bit premature, old fellow?' he chided. Halfway there the globes met them again. The things were not singing. From their many eyes poured a fierce, angry blue light. They rolled with a determination that frightened him. Yet he strode on, until they were barely a foot away. "'Jump, Digger!' The spheres stopped short, reversed their direction toward the little group at a furious rate, flinging out long, whip-like tentacles. One wrapped itself around Nat's ankle, drew him down. He shifted the limp form over to his shoulder, slipped out his heat-rod. Quickly the tentacle was severed. But now others took their place. He continued firing at them, making each bolt tell, but the numbers were too great. Digger sprang into action, rending the globes with those claws that were capable of tearing the hulls of spaceships. But tentacles lashed around him from the rear, snaked about him so that he was helpless. The girl was slipping off Nat's shoulder. He could not raise the stump of an arm to balance her. It was stiff and useless. He stopped firing long enough to make the shift, even as the spheres attacked again. The bolts had put out the lights in fully half the marauders, but the others came on unafraid. Nat straddled Digger's writhing body, held the space hound motionless between his legs. At short range he seared off the imprisoning tentacles, knowing that it would take far more than a heat-bolt to damage the well-nigh impregnable creature. He swooped the dog up under his good arm and fled from the madly pursuing spheres, 
thanking nameless deities that the gravity here permitted such Herculean feats. The spheres rolled faster, he soon found, than he could jump. So long as he was above them, all was well, but by the time the weak gravity permitted him to land, they were waiting for him. He tried zigzagging. Good, it worked. He eluded them up to the mouth of the cave, then jumped for the door of his ship's outer airlock. Nat placed the girl in his bunk, removed the cumbersome spacesuit. Her eyes blinked faintly, then sprang open. But they did not see him. They were staring straight ahead. Her mouth opened and shut weakly, as though she were speaking, but no sound issued from it. He brought her water, but when he returned she had fallen asleep. He returned to the kitchen to prepare some food. "'You're still running around in that pillowcase,' he remarked to Digger, as he extracted the space-hound from it. "'Attend me now. We know why and how those people disappeared. It would take the space patrol ship at least a month to arrive here. I don't intend to perch on the back of this devil as long as that. And if we leave, old thing, it'll just lure other chivalrous fools to very unpleasant ends. And we've got to get this kid back to civilization. She needs a doctor's care, preferably a doctor with two arms." Digger's vibrations were one of general approval. We could poison it, he went on. Only, I'm not a chemist. Even if I knew the compounds contained in that reeking stomach, I wouldn't know what would destroy them. Might blow it up, but we haven't enough explosive. No, we'll have to get down into the thing's insides again. In fact, he paused suddenly, mouth open. Congratulate me, Digger. I have it. The smell of burning vegetables cut short his soliloquy. He fed the starved, half-blind girl, then left her sleeping exhaustedly as he squirmed into his suit. No sooner had he entered the mouth of the cave than a half-dozen of the singing sensory organs rolled quickly, yet not angrily, toward him. The beast was apparently optimistic, for the globe sang their most soothing, seductive tones. They tried to herd him into the first cave on the right, but he had remembered the squeaker. They could not distract him. Effortlessly, he leaped over them toward the mouth of the cave on the left. That was where the spaceships lay, pointing in all directions, like a carelessly dropped handful of rice. All the ships were in running order. Good. Had there been one vessel he could not move, then all was lost. The fuel in several ran low, but after a few moments of punching levers and pulling chokes, the under-rockets thundered in the big room. Taking care not to injure the motor compartments of the other ships, using only the most minute explosion quantities, he jockeyed each ship around until all their noses pointed in one direction. The exhausts pointed out through the wide doorway. It was well that the beast had formed curved corners in the room, otherwise the scheme would not have worked. The exhausts, which did not point toward the door directly, were toward the curved walls which would deflect the forceful gases expelled doorward. When he emerged from the ship, the spheres attacked. He seared off their tentacles throughout what seemed to be eternities. His body was becoming a mass of bruises from the lash of their tentacles. He burned his way through the swarm onto ship after ship. As he stepped from the last vessel, there was a rumbling beneath his feet. Did the monster understand his intent? Was it stirring in its shell? Most of the globes had disappeared. Now a nauseatingly sweet odor penetrated the screen in his headpiece, which permitted him to smell without allowing the oxygen to escape. He hurried around to the rear of the ship, an apprehensive, sickening feeling at the pit of his stomach. A thick, jelly-like wave of liquid was rolling over the floor, the reeking, deadly juices from the beast's stomach. If the liquid touched him, it would eat through the heavy fabric, exploding the air pressure from around his body. How was he to escape from the cave? The answer came to him suddenly. Quickly he darted back toward the nearest vessel. Two of the screaming spheres blocked his way. 
he sent bolt after searing bolt into them, more of a charge than he had given any of the others. The lights in the globes went out, their voices ceased, and they burst into slowly mounting incandescence. Yet they were not consumed by their fire, only glowed an intense white light like that of a lighthouse. Lighthouse! The word flashed through his mind clearly, strongly. They glowed like the zirconia lights of a lighthouse. Why hadn't he recognized the greasy, quartz-like material before? It was zirconia, a compound of zirconium, of course. A silicate-based creature could easily have formed a shell of it about itself. Zirconia, one of the compounds he'd intended prospecting for on the moons of Saturn worth over a hundred dollars per pound. Because of its resistance to heat, it was used to line the tubes of rockets. Terra's supply had long been used up. Here was a fortune all around him. But that fortune was about to be destroyed, he along with it, if he did not hurry. If he could only reach the timing mechanism to yank from it the wires connecting it to the other ships. It was at the other end of the line. He started in that direction, but a surge of fatal, thick acid rolled before him, reaching for him with hungry, questing tongues. When it was almost touching his toes, he leaped. As he floated toward the floor, he placed a chair beneath him so that his feet landed on the seat. The legs of the chair sank slowly into the liquid. Again he leaped, his moment retarded by the fluid which now reached halfway up the chair legs, sucked and clung there. The sweetly evil-smelling stuff was rising rapidly. But the next leap carried him into the main cave. Abandoning the chair, he leaped once more, out through the cave's mouth, pursued by the waving tentacles of the sensory spheres. He had lost precious minutes eluding the deadly acid. It would take at least five minutes to get his ship away from the asteroid. He must hurry before all those rocket motors were thrown into action, or it would be too late. Leap and leap again. It seemed ages, but he reached the ship, bolted the door shut. Thumps against the door as the pursuing globes ran up against it. A thought came to him. Swiftly, he opened the door, permitted a few of them to enter, then slammed it shut. With the heat gun, he sheared off their tentacles. He could sell the zirconia in the entities. Then he turned to the controls, and the ship zoomed up and out. Nat had barely raised his ship from the asteroid Moira when he saw the small planetoid lurch suddenly, bounding off its orbit at almost a right angle. The sudden combined driving force of all the rockets within the cave had sent it hurtling away like a rocket itself. The asteroid housing the monster was heading into the flora group of asteroids. There, the fifty-seven-odd solid bodies of that group would grind, crack, and rend that dangerous beast into harmless dead fragments. "'A good job,' said a weak but softly friendly voice behind him. He whirled. The girl stood in the doorway of the pilot room, supporting herself against the door frame. Digger rubbed thoughtfully against her legs. "'We'll just follow that asteroid, miss,' he said, "'and see if we can't pick up some odd fragment of zirconia when it's smashed in the grindstone there. Then we'll light out for Terra.' She smiled. Earth, to him, seemed like a very good place to go as soon as possible. The End of the Beast of Space by F. E. Hardert The Big Trip Up Yonder by Kurt Vonnegut, Jr. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Greg Marguerite The Big Trip Up Yonder by Kurt Vonnegut, Jr. If it was good enough for your grandfather, forget it. It is much too good for anyone else. 
Gramps Ford, his chin resting on his hands, his hands on the crook of his cane, was staring irascibly at the five-foot television screen that dominated the room. On the screen, a news commentator was summarizing the day's happenings. Every thirty seconds or so, Gramps would jab the floor with his cane tip and shout, Hell! We did that a hundred years ago! Emerald and Lou, coming in from the balcony, where they had been seeking that 2185 A.D. rarity, privacy, were obliged to take seats in the back row. Behind Lou's father and mother, brother and sister-in-law, son and daughter-in-law, grandson and wife, granddaughter and husband, great-grandson and wife, nephew and wife, grandnephew and wife, great-grandniece and husband, great-grandnephew and wife, and, of course, Gramps, who was in front of everybody. All save Gramps, who was somewhat withered and bent, seemed by pre-anti-Gerasone standards to be about the same age, somewhere in their late twenties or early thirties. Gramps looked older because he had already reached seventy when anti-Gerasone was invented. He had not aged in the one hundred and two years since. Meanwhile, the commentator was saying, Council Bluffs, Iowa, was still threatened by stark tragedy, but two hundred weary rescue workers have refused to give up hope and continue to dig in an effort to save Albert Hagedorn, 183, who has been wedged for two days in a— I wish he'd get something more cheerful, Emerald whispered to Lou. Silence! cried Gramps. Next one shoots off his big bazoo while the TV's on is going to find himself cut off without a dollar. His voice suddenly softened and sweetened. When they wave that checkered flag at the Indianapolis Speedway and old Gramps gets ready for the big trip up yonder. He sniffed sentimentally, while his heirs concentrated desperately on not making the slightest sound. For them the poignancy of the prospective big trip had been dulled somewhat through having been mentioned by Gramps about once a day for fifty years. Dr. Brainerd Keyes Bullard, continued the commentator, president of Wyandotte College, said in an address tonight that most of the world's ills can be traced to the fact that man's knowledge of himself has not kept pace with his knowledge of the physical world. Hell! snorted Gramps. We said that a hundred years ago. In Chicago tonight, the commentator went on, a special celebration is taking place in the Chicago Lying In Hospital. The guest of honor is Lowell W. Hitz, age zero. Hitz, born this morning, is the twenty-five millionth child to be born in the hospital. The commentator faded away and was replaced on the screen by young Hitz, who squalled furiously. Hell, whispered Luda Emerald. We said that a hundred years ago. I heard that, shouted Gramps. He snapped off the television set and his petrified descendants stared silently at the screen. You there, boy. I, I didn't mean anything by it, sir, said Lou, aged 103. Get me my will. You know where it is. You kids all know where it is. Fetch, boy. Gramps snapped his gnarled finger sharply. Lou nodded dully and found himself going down the hall, picking his way over bedding to Gramps' room, the only private room in the Ford apartment. The other rooms were the bathroom, the living room, and the wide windowless hallway, which was originally intended to serve as a dining area and which had a kitchenette in one end. Six mattresses and four sleeping bags were dispersed in the hallway and living room, and the daybed in the living room accommodated the eleventh couple, the favorites of the moment. On Gramps' bureau was his will, smeared, dog-eared, perforated, and blotched with hundreds of additions, deletions, accusations, conditions, warnings, advice, and homely philosophy. The document was, Lou reflected, a fifty-year diary, all jammed onto two sheets, a garbled, illegible log of day after day of strife. This day Lou would be diminished for the eleventh time, and it would take him perhaps six months of impeccable behavior to regain the promise of a share in the estate, to say nothing of the daybed in the living room for M and himself. Boy, called Gramps. Coming, sir. Lou hurried back into the living room and handed Gramps the will. Pen, said Gramps. He was instantly offered eleven pens, one from each couple. Not that leaky thing, he said, brushing Lou's pen aside. Ah, there's a nice one. Good boy, Willie. He accepted Willie's pen. That was the tip they had all been waiting for. Willie, then, Lou's father, was the new favorite. 
Willie, who looked almost as young as Lou, though he was a hundred and forty-two, did a poor job of concealing his pleasure. He glanced shyly at the daybed which would become his, and from which Lou and Emerald would have to move back into the hall, back to the worst spot of all, by the bathroom door. Gramps missed none of the high drama he had authored, and he gave his own familiar role everything he had. Frowning and running his finger along each line, as though he were seeing the will for the first time, he read aloud in a deep, portentous monotone, like a bass note on a cathedral organ. I, Harold D. Ford, residing in Building 257 of Alden Village, New York City, Connecticut, do hereby make, publish, and declare this to be my last will and testament revoking any and all former wills and codicils by me at any time heretofore made. He blew his nose importantly and went on, not missing a word and repeating many for emphasis, repeating in particular his ever more elaborate specifications for a funeral. At the end of these specifications Gramps was so choked with emotion that Lou thought he might have forgotten why he'd brought out the will in the first place. But Gramps heroically brought his powerful emotions under control, and after erasing for a full minute began to write and speak at the same time. Lou could have spoken his lines for him. He had heard them so often. I have had many heartbreaks ere leaving this veil of tears for a better land, Gramps said and wrote. But the deepest hurt of all has been dealt me by— He looked around the group, trying to remember who the malefactor was. Everyone looked helpfully at Lou, who held up his hand resignedly. Gramps nodded, remembering, and completed the sentence. My great-grandson, Louis J. Ford. Grandson, sir, said Lou. Don't quibble. You're in deep enough now, young man, said Gramps. But he made the change, and from there he went without a misstep through the phrasing of the disinheritance, causes for which were disrespectfulness and quibbling. In the paragraph following the paragraph that had belonged to everyone in the room at one time or another, Lou's name was scratched out and Willie substituted as heir to the apartment and the biggest plum of all, the double bed in the private bedroom. So, said Gramps, beaming. He erased the date at the foot of the will and substituted a new one, including the time of day. Well, time to watch the McGarvey family. The McGarvey family was a television serial that Gramps had been following since he was sixty, or for a total of one hundred and twelve years. I can't wait to see what's going to happen next, he said. Lou detached himself from the group and lay down on his bed of pain by the bathroom door, wishing M would join him. He wondered where she was. He dozed for a few moments until he was disturbed by something stepping over him to get into the bathroom. A moment later he heard a faint gurgling sound, as though something were being poured down the washbasin drain. Suddenly it entered his mind that M had cracked up, that she was in there doing something drastic about Gramps. M? he whispered through the panel. There was no reply, and Lou pressed against the door. The worn lock, whose bolt barely engaged its socket, held for a second, then let the door swing inward. Morty! gasped Lou. Lou's great-grandnephew, Mortimer, who had just married and brought his wife home to the Ford Menage, looked at Lou with consternation and surprise. Morty kicked the door shut, but not before Lou had glimpsed what was in his hand. Gramps' enormous economy-sized bottle of anti gerasone which had apparently been half-emptied and which Morty was refilling with tap water. A moment later Morty came out, glared defiantly at Lou, and brushed past him wordlessly to rejoin his pretty bride. Shocked, Lou didn't know what to do. He couldn't let Gramps take the mouse-trapped anti gerasone but if he warned Gramps about it, Gramps would certainly make life in the apartment, which was merely insufferable now, harrowing. Lou glanced into the living room and saw that the Fords, Emerald among them, were momentarily at rest, relishing the botches that the McGarveys had made of their lives. Stealthily he went into the bathroom locked the door as well as he could, and began to pour the contents of Gramps' bottle down the drain. He was going to refill it with full-strength anti gerasone from the twenty-two smaller bottles on the shelf. The bottle contained a half-gallon, and its neck was small, so it seemed to Lou that the emptying would take forever, and the almost imperceptible smell of anti gerasone like Worcestershire sauce, now seemed to Lou in his nervousness to be pouring out into the rest of the apartment through the keyhole and under the door. 
The bottle gurgled monotonously. Suddenly up came the sound of music from the living room, and there were murmurs and the scraping of chair legs on the floor. Thus ends, said the television announcer, the twenty-nine thousand one hundred and twenty-first chapter in the life of your neighbors and mine, the McGarveys. Footsteps were coming down the hall. There was a knock on the bathroom door. Just a sec, Lou cheerily called out. Desperately he shook the big bottle, trying to speed up the flow. His palm slipped on the wet glass and the heavy bottle smashed on the tile floor. The door was pushed open and Gramps, dumbfounded, stared at the incriminating mess. Lou felt a hideous prickling sensation on his scalp and the back of his neck. He grinned engagingly through the nausea and, for want of anything remotely resembling a thought, waited for Gramps to speak. "'Well, boy,' said Gramps at last, "'looks like you've got a little tidying up to do.' And that was all he said. He turned around, elbowed his way through the crowd, and locked himself in his bedroom. The Fords contemplated Lou in incredulous silence a moment longer, and then hurried back to the living room as though some of his horrible guilt would taint them, too, if they looked too long. Morty stayed behind long enough to give Lou a quizzical, annoyed glance. Then he also went into the living room, leaving only Emerald standing in the doorway. Tears streamed over her cheeks. Oh, you poor lamb! Please don't look so awful. It was my fault. I put you up to this with my nagging about Gramps. Nah, said Lou, finding his voice. Really, you didn't. Honest, Em. I was just— You don't have to explain anything to me, hon. I'm on your side, no matter what. She kissed him on one cheek and whispered in his ear. It wouldn't have been murder, hon. It wouldn't have killed him. It wasn't such a terrible thing to do. It just would have fixed him up so he'd be able to go any time God decided he wanted him. What's going to happen next, Em? said Lou hollowly. What's he going to do? Lou and Emerald stayed fearfully awake almost all night, waiting to see what Gramps was going to do. But not a sound came from the sacred bedroom. Two hours before dawn they finally dropped off to sleep. At six o'clock they arose again, for it was time for their generation to eat breakfast in the kitchenette. No one spoke to them. They had twenty minutes in which to eat, but their reflexes were so dulled by the bad night that they had hardly swallowed two mouthfuls of egg-type processed seaweed before it was time to surrender their places to their son's generation. Then, as was the custom for whoever had been most recently disinherited, they began preparing Gramps' breakfast, which would presently be served to him in bed, on a tray. They tried to be cheerful about it. The toughest part of the job was having to handle the honest-to-God eggs and bacon and oleomargarine on which Gramps spent so much of the income from his fortune. Well, said Emerald, I'm not going to get all panicky until I'm sure there's something to be panicky about. Maybe he doesn't know what it was I busted, Lou said hopefully. Probably thinks it was your watch crystal, offered Eddie, their son who was toying apathetically with his buckwheat-type processed sawdust cakes. "'Don't get sarcastic with your father,' said Em. "'And don't talk with your mouthful, either.' "'I'd like to see anybody take a mouthful of this stuff and not say something,' complained Eddie, who was seventy-three. He glanced at the clock. "'It's time to take Gramps' breakfast, you know.' "'Yeah, it is, isn't it?' said Lou weakly. He shrugged. "'Let's have the tray, Em.' We'll both go." Walking slowly, smiling bravely, they found a large semicircle of long-faced Fords standing around the bedroom door. Em knocked. "'Gramps,' she called brightly. "'Breakfast is ready.' There was no reply, and she knocked again, harder. The door swung open before her fist. In the middle of the room, the soft, deep, wide, canopied bed, the symbol of the sweet by-and-by to every Ford was empty. A sense of death as unfamiliar to the Fords as Zoroastrianism or the causes of the Sepoy mutiny stilled every voice, slowed every heart. Awed, the heirs began to search gingerly under the furniture and behind the drapes for all that was mortal of Gramps, father of the clan. But Gramps had left not his earthly husk but a note, which Lou finally found on the dresser under a paperweight which was a treasured souvenir from the World's Fair of 2000. Unsteadily, Lou read it aloud. 
Somebody who I have sheltered and protected and taught the best I know how all these years last night turned on me like a mad dog and diluted my anti gerasone or tried to. I am no longer a young man. I can no longer bear the crushing burden of life as I once could. So, after last night's bitter experience, I say good-bye. The cares of this world will soon drop away like a cloak of thorns, and I shall know peace. By the time you find this, I will be gone." Gosh, said Willie brokenly. He didn't even get to see how the five thousand mile speedway race was going to come out. Or the solar series, Eddie said, with large mournful eyes. Or whether Mrs. McGarvey got her eyesight back, added Morty. There's more said Lou, and he began reading aloud again. I, Harold D. Ford, etc., do hereby make, publish, and declare this to be my last will and testament, revoking any and all former wills and codicils by me at any time heretofore made. No, cried Willie, not another one. I do stipulate, read Lou, that all of my property, of whatsoever kind and nature, not be divided, but do devise and bequeath it to be held in common by my issue, without regard for generation, equally share and share alike. Issue? said Emerald. Lou included the multitude in a sweep of his hand. It means we all own the whole damn shootin' match. Each eye turned instantly to the bed. Share and share alike? asked Morty. Actually, said Willie, who was the oldest one present, it's just like the old system where the oldest people head up things with their headquarters in here, and— I like that, exclaimed Em. Lou owns as much of it as you do, and I say it ought to be for the oldest one who's still working. You can snooze around here all day waiting for your pension check while poor Lou stumbles in here after work all tuckered out, and— How about letting somebody who's never had any privacy get a little crack at it? Eddie demanded hotly. Hell, you old people had plenty of privacy back when you were kids. I was born and raised in the middle of that goddamn barracks in the hall. How about— Yeah? challenged Morty. Sure, you've all had it pretty tough, and my heart bleeds for you. But try honeymooning in the hall for a real kick. Silence! shouted Willie imperiously. The next person who opens his mouth spends the next six months by the bathroom. Now clear out of my room. I want to think." A vase shattered against the wall inches above his head. In the next moment a free-for-all was under way, with each couple battling to eject every other couple from the room. Fighting coalitions formed and dissolved with the lightning changes of the tactical situation. M and Lou were thrown into the hall, where they organized others in the same situation and stormed back into the room. After two hours of struggle, with nothing like a decision in sight, the cops broke in, followed by television cameramen from mobile units. For the next half hour, patrol wagons and ambulances hauled away Fords, and then the apartment was still and spacious. An hour later, films of the last stages of the riot were being televised to five hundred million delighted viewers on the eastern seaboard. In the stillness of the three-room Ford apartment on the seventy-sixth floor of Building 257, the television set had been left on. Once more the air was filled with the cries and grunts and crashes of the fray, coming harmlessly now from the loudspeaker. The battle also appeared on the screen of the television set in the police station, where the Fords and their captors watched with professional interest. M and Lou, in adjacent four-by-eight cells, were stretched out peacefully on their cots. M, called Lou through the partition. You got a washbasin all your own, too? Sure. Washbasin, bed, light, the works. And we thought Gramps' room was something. How long has this been going on? She held out her hand. For the first time in forty years, hon, I haven't got the shakes. Look at me. Cross your fingers, said Lou. The lawyer's going to try to get us a year. Gee, Em said dreamily, I wonder what kind of wires you'd have to pull to get put away in solitary. All right, pipe down, said the turnkey, or I'll toss the whole kit and caboodle of you right out. And first one who lets on to anybody outside how good jail is ain't never getting back in. The prisoners instantly fell silent. 
The living room of the apartment darkened for a moment as the riot scenes faded on the television screen, and then the face of the announcer appeared, like the sun coming from behind a cloud. And now, friends, he said, I have a special message from the makers of anti gerasone a message for all you folks over a hundred and fifty. Are you hampered socially by wrinkles, by stiffness of the joints and discoloration or loss of hair? all because these things came upon you before anti gerasone was developed? Well, if you are, you need no longer suffer, need no longer feel different and out of things. After years of research, medical science has now developed super anti gerasone In weeks, yes, weeks, you can look, feel, and act as young as your great-great-grandchildren. Wouldn't you pay five thousand dollars to be indistinguishable from everybody else? Well, you don't have to. Safe, tested, super anti gerasone costs you only a few dollars a day. Right now, for your free trial carton, just put your name and address on a dollar postcard and mail it to Super, Box 500,000, Schenectady, New York. Have you got that? I'll repeat it. Super, Box 500,000. Underlining the announcer's words was the scratching of Gramps' pen, the one Willie had given him the night before. He had come in a few minutes earlier from the Idle Hour Tavern, which commanded a view of Building 257 from across the square of asphalt known as the Alden Village Green. He had called a cleaning woman to come straighten the place up, then had hired the best lawyer in town to get his descendants a conviction. A genius who had never gotten a client less than a year and a day. Gramps had then moved the daybed before the television screen so that he could watch from a reclining position. It was something he'd dreamed of doing for years. Schenectady, murmured Gramps. Got it. His face had changed remarkably. His facial muscles seemed to have relaxed, revealing kindness and equanimity under what had been taut lines of bad temper. It was almost as though his trial package of super anti gerasone had already arrived. When something amused him on television, he smiled easily, rather than barely managing to lengthen the thin line of his mouth a millimeter. Life was good. He could hardly wait to see what was going to happen next. End of The Big Trip Up Yonder by Kurt Vonnegut, Jr. Cost of Living by Robert Sheckley. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tabithat. Cost of Living by Robert Sheckley. Karen decided that he could trace his present mood to Miller's suicide last week, but the knowledge didn't help him get rid of the vague, formless fear in the back of his mind. It was foolish. Miller's suicide didn't concern him. But why had that fat, jovial man killed himself? Miller had had everything to live for—wife, kids, good job, and all the marvellous luxuries of the age. Why had he done it? "'Good morning, dear,' Karen's wife said as he sat down at the breakfast-table. "'Morning, honey. Morning, Billy,' his son grunted something. "'You just couldn't tell about people,' Karen decided, and dialed his breakfast. The meal was gracefully prepared and served by the new Avignon electric auto-cook. His mood persisted, annoyingly enough, since Karen wanted to be in top form this morning. It was his day off, and the Avignon electric finance man was coming. This was an important day. He walked to the door with his son. "'Have a good day, Billy.' His son nodded, shifted his books, and started to school without answering. Karen wondered if something was bothering him, too. He hoped not. One warrior in the family was plenty. "'See you later, honey,' he kissed his wife as she left to go shopping. At any rate, he thought, watching her go down the walk, at least she's happy. He wondered how much she'd spend at the A.E. store. Checking his watch, he found that he had half an hour before the A.E. finance man was due. The best way to get rid of a bad mood was to drown it, he told himself, and headed for the shower. The shower-room was a glittering plastic wonder, and the sheer luxury of it eased Karen's mind. He threw his clothes into the A.E. automatic clean-presser, and adjusted the shower-spray to a notch above brisk. The five degrees above skin-temperature water beat against his thin white body. Delightful! And then a relaxing rub-dry in the A.E. auto-towel. 
Wonderful, he thought, as the towel stretched and kneaded his stringy muscles. And it should be wonderful, he reminded himself. The A. E. Auto Towel, with shaving attachments, had cost three hundred and thirteen dollars plus tax. But worth every penny of it, he decided, as the A. E. Shaver came out of a corner and whisked off his rudimentary stubble. After all, what good was life if you couldn't enjoy the luxuries? His skin tingled when he switched off the auto towel. He should have been feeling wonderful, but he wasn't. Miller's suicide kept nagging at his mind, destroying the peace of his day off. Was there anything else bothering him? Certainly there was nothing wrong with the house. His papers were in order for the finance man. "'Have I forgotten something?' he asked out loud. "'The Avignon electric finance man will be here in fifteen minutes,' his A.E. bathroom wall reminder whispered. "'I know that. Is there anything else?' The wall reminder reeled off its memorised data— a vast amount of minutiae about watering the lawn, having the jet-lash checked, buying lamb chops for Monday, and the like. Things he still hadn't found time for. All right, that's enough. He allowed the A.E. autodresser to dress him, skilfully draping a new selection of fabrics over his bony frame. A whiff of fashionable masculine perfume finished him, and he went into the living room, threading his way between the appliances that lined the walls. A quick inspection of the dials on the wall assured him that the house was in order. The breakfast dishes had been sanitised and stacked, the house had been cleaned, dusted, polished, his wife's garments had been hung up, his son's model rocket ships had been put back in the closet. "'Stop worrying, you hypochondriac,' he told himself angrily. The door announced, "'Mr. Pathis from Avignon Finance is here.' Karen started to tell the door to open when he noticed the automatic bartender. "'Good God, why hadn't he thought of it?' The automatic bartender was manufactured by Castile Motors. He had bought it in a weak moment. A. E. wouldn't think very highly of that, since they sold their own brand. He wheeled the bartender into the kitchen and told the door to open. "'A very good day to you, sir,' Mr. Pathis said. Pathis was a tall, imposing man dressed in a conservative tweed drape. His eyes had the crinkled corners of a man who laughs frequently. He beamed broadly and shook Karen's hand, looking around the crowded living room. "'A beautiful place you have here, sir, beautiful. As a matter of fact, I don't think I'll be overstepping the company's code to inform you that yours is the nicest interior in this section.' Karen felt a sudden glow of pride at that, thinking of the rows of identical houses in this block and the next and the one after that. "'Now, then, is everything functioning properly?' Mr. Pathis asked, setting his briefcase on a chair. "'Everything in order?' "'Oh, yes,' Karen said enthusiastically. "'Avignon Electric never goes out of whack. "'The phone all right? "'Changes records for the full seventeen hours?' "'It certainly does,' Karen said. "'He hadn't had a chance to try out the phone, "'but it was a beautiful piece of furniture. "'The Solido projector all right. "'Enjoying the programmes? "'Absolutely perfect reception. "'He'd watched a programme just last month, "'and it had been startlingly lifelike. "'How about the kitchen? "'Auto cook in order?' "'Recipe master still knocking them out? Marvellous stuff, simply marvellous. "'Mr. Pathis went on to inquire about his refrigerator, "'his vacuum cleaner, his car, his helicopter, "'his subterranean swimming pool, "'and the hundreds of other items Karen had bought from Avignon Electric. "'Everything is swell,' said Karen, a trifle untruthfully, "'since he hadn't unpacked every item yet. "'Just wonderful.' "'I'm so glad,' Mr. Pathis said, leaning back with a sigh of relief. "'You have no idea how hard we try to satisfy our customers. "'If a product isn't right, back it comes, no questions asked. "'We believe in pleasing our customers.' "'I certainly appreciate it, Mr. Pathis.' "'Karen hoped the A.E. man wouldn't ask to see the kitchen. "'He visualised the Castile Motors bartender in there like a porcupine in a dog-show.' "'I'm proud to say that most of the people in this neighbourhood buy from us,' Mr. Pathis was saying. "'We're a solid firm.' "'Was Mr. Miller a customer of yours?' Karen asked. "'That fellow who killed himself?' Pathis frowned briefly. "'He was, as a matter of fact. That amazed me, sir, absolutely amazed me. Why, just last month the fellow bought a brand-new jet-lash from me, capable of doing three hundred and fifty miles an hour on a straightaway. He was as happy as a kid over it, and then to go and do a thing like that. Of course, the jet-lash brought up his debt a little. Of course. But what did that matter? He had every luxury in the world, and then he went and hung himself. Hung himself? 
"'Yes,' Pathis said, the frown coming back, "'every modern convenience in his house, and he hung himself with a piece of rope. Probably unbalanced for a long time.' The frown slid off his face, and the customary smile replaced it. "'But enough of that. Let's talk about you.' The smile widened as Pathis opened his briefcase. "'Now then, your account. You owe us two hundred and three thousand dollars and twenty-nine cents, Mr. Caron, as of your last purchase, right?' "'Right,' Caron said, remembering the amount from his own papers. "'Here's my instalment.' He handed Pathis an envelope, which the man checked and put in his pocket. "'Fine. Now you know, Mr. Caron, that you won't live long enough to pay us the full two hundred thousand, don't you?' "'No, I don't suppose I will,' Caron said soberly. He was only thirty-nine, with a full hundred years of life before him, thanks to the marvels of medical science. But at a salary of three thousand a year, he still couldn't pay it all off and have enough to support a family on at the same time. "'Of course we would not want to deprive you of necessities, which, in any case, is fully protected by the laws we help formulate and pass. To say nothing of the terrific items that are coming out next year, things you wouldn't want to miss, sir.' Mr. Caron nodded. Certainly he wanted new items. "'Well, suppose we make the customary arrangement. If you will just sign over your son's earnings for the first thirty years of his adult life, we can easily arrange credit for you.' Mr. Pathis whipped the papers out of his briefcase and spread them in front of Karen. "'If you'll just sign here, sir.' "'Well,' Karen said, "'I'm not sure. I'd like to give the boy a start in life, not saddle him with—' "'But, my dear sir,' Pathis interposed, "'this is for your son as well. He lives here, doesn't he? He has a right to enjoy the luxuries, the marvels of science.' "'Sure,' Karen said. "'Only—' Why, today, sir, the average man is living like a king. A hundred years ago, the richest man in the world couldn't buy what any ordinary citizen possesses at present. You mustn't look upon it as a debt. It's an investment. That's true, Karen said dubiously. He thought about his son and his rocket ship models, his star charts, his maps. Would it be right? he asked himself. What's wrong? Pathis asked cheerfully. Well, "'I was just wondering,' Karen said. "'Signing over my son's earnings, you don't think I'm getting in a little too deep, do you?' "'Too deep, my dear sir!' Pathis exploded into laughter. "'Do you know Mellon down the block? Well, don't say I said it, but he's already mortgaged his grandchildren's salary for their full life expectancy. And he doesn't have half the goods he's made up his mind to own. We'll work out something for him. Service to the customer is our job, and we know it well.' Karen wavered visibly. "'And after you're gone, sir, they'll all belong to your son.' That was true, Karen thought. His son would have all the marvellous things that filled the house. And after all, it was only thirty years out of a life expectancy of a hundred and fifty. He signed with a flourish. "'Excellent,' Pathis said. "'And, by the way, has your home got an A.E. master operator?' It hadn't. Pathis explained that a master operator was new this year, a stupendous advance in scientific engineering. It was designed to take over all the functions of house-cleaning and cooking, without its owner having to lift a finger. Instead of running around all day, pushing half a dozen different buttons, with a master operator all you have to do is push one. A remarkable achievement. Since it was only five hundred and thirty-five dollars, Karen signed for one, having it added to his son's debt. "'Right's right,' he thought, walking Pathis to the door. "'This house will be Billy some day, his and his wife's. "'They certainly will want everything up to date. "'Just one button,' he thought. "'That would be a time-saver.' After Pathis left, Karen sat back in an adjustable chair and turned on the Salido. After twisting the easy dial, he discovered that there was nothing he wanted to see. He tilted back the chair and took a nap. The something on his mind was still bothering him. "'Hello, darling,' he awoke to find his wife was home. She kissed him on the ear. "'Look!' She had bought an A.E. sexitizer negligee. He was pleasantly surprised that that was all she had bought. Usually Leela returned from shopping laden down. "'It's lovely,' he said. She bent over for a kiss, then giggled, a habit he knew she had picked up from the latest popular Salido star. He wished she hadn't. 
"'Going to dial supper,' she said, and went into the kitchen. Karen smiled, thinking that soon she would be able to dial the meals without moving out of the living-room. He settled back in his chair, and his son walked in. "'How's it going, son?' he asked heartily. "'All right,' Billy answered listlessly. "'What's the matter, son?' The boy stared at his feet, not answering. "'Come on, tell Dad what's the trouble.' Billy sat down on a packing-case and put his chin in his hands. He looked thoughtfully at his father. "'Dad, could I be a master repairman if I wanted to be?' Mr. Caron smiled at the question. Billy alternated between wanting to be a master repairman and a rocket pilot. The repairmen were the elite. It was their job to fix the automatic repair machines. The repair machines could fix just about anything, but you couldn't have a machine fix the machine that fixed the machine. That was where the master repairmen came in. But it was a highly competitive field, and only a very few of the best brains were able to get their degrees. And although the boy was bright, he didn't seem to have an engineering bent. "'It's possible, son. Anything's possible. But is it possible for me?' "'I don't know,' Karen answered as honestly as he could. "'Well, I don't want to be a master repairman anyway,' the boy said, seeing that the answer was no— I want to be a space pilot. A space pilot, Billy? Leela asked, coming into the room. But there aren't any. Yes, there are, Billy argued. We were told in school that the government is going to send some men to Mars. They've been saying that for a hundred years, Karen said, and they still haven't gotten around to doing it. They will this time. Why would you want to go to Mars? Leela asked, winking at Karen. There are no pretty girls on Mars. I'm not interested in girls. I just want to go to Mars. You wouldn't like it, honey, Leela said. It's a nasty old place with no air. It's got some air. I'd like to go there, the boy insisted sullenly. I don't like it here. What's that? Karen asked, sitting up straight. Is there anything you haven't got? Anything you want? No, sir. I've got everything I want. Whenever his son called him sir, Karen knew that something was wrong. "'Look, son, when I was your age, I wanted to go to Mars, too. I wanted to do romantic things. I even wanted to be a master repairman.' "'Then why didn't you?' "'Well, I grew up. I realised that there were more important things. First I had to pay off the debt my father had left me, and then I met your mother.' Leela giggled. "'And I wanted a home of my own. It'll be the same with you. You'll pay off your debt and get married the same as the rest of us.' Billy was silent for a while, then he brushed his dark hair, straight like his father's, back from his forehead, and wet his lips. "'How come I have debt, sir?' Karen explained carefully, about the things the family needed for civilised living and the cost of those items, how they had to be paid, how it was customary for a son to take on a part of his parents' debt when he came of age. Billy's silence annoyed him. It was almost as if the boy were reproaching him after he had slaved for years to give the ungrateful whelp every luxury. "'Son,' he said harshly, "'have you studied history in school? Good. Then you know how it was in the past. Wars. How would you like to get blown up in a war?' The boy didn't answer. "'Or how would you like to break your back for eight hours a day doing work a machine should handle, or be hungry all the time, or cold with the rain beating down on you and no place to sleep?' He paused for a response, got none, and went on. "'You live in the most fortunate age mankind has ever known. You're surrounded by every wonder of art and science, the finest music, the greatest books and art, all at your fingertips. All you have to do is push a button.' He shifted to a kindlier tone. "'Well, what are you thinking?' "'I was just wondering how I could go to Mars,' the boy said. "'With the debt, I mean. I don't suppose I could get away from that.' "'Of course not. Unless I stowed away on a rocket. But you wouldn't do that.' "'No, of course not,' the boy said, but his tone lacked conviction. "'You'll stay here and marry a very nice girl,' Leela told him. "'Sure I will,' Billy said. "'Sure.' He grinned suddenly. "'I didn't mean any of that stuff about going to Mars. I really didn't.' "'I'm glad of that,' Leela answered. "'Just forget I mentioned it,' Billy said, smiling stiffly. He stood up and raced upstairs. "'Probably gone to play with his rockets,' Leela said. "'He's such a little devil.' 
The Karens ate a quiet supper, and then it was time for Mr. Karen to go to work. He was on night shift this month. He kissed his wife good-bye, climbed into his jet-lash, and roared to the factory. The automatic gates recognized him and opened. He parked and walked in. Automatic lathes, automatic presses, everything was automatic. The factory was huge and bright, and the machines hummed softly to themselves, doing their job, and doing it well. Karen walked to the end of the automatic washing-machine assembly line to relieve the man there. "'Everything all right?' he asked. "'Sure,' the man said. "'Haven't had a bad one all year. These new models have built-in voices. They don't light up like the old ones.' Karen sat down where the man had sat and waited for the first washing-machine to come through. His job was the soul of simplicity. He just sat there and the machines went by him. He pressed a button on them and found out if they were all right. They always were. After passing him, the washing machines went to the packaging section. The first one slid by on the long slide of rollers. He pressed the starting button on the side. Ready for the wash, the washing machine said. Karen pressed the release and let it go by. That boy of his, Karen thought, would he grow up and face his responsibilities? Would he mature and take his place in society? Karen doubted it. The boy was a born rebel. If anyone got to Mars, it would be his kid. But the thought didn't especially disturb him. Ready for the wash, another machine went by. Karen remembered something about Miller. The jovial man had always been talking about the planets, always kidding about going off somewhere and roughing it. He hadn't, though. He'd committed suicide. Ready for the wash? Karen had eight hours in front of him, and he loosened his belt to prepare for it. Eight hours of pushing buttons and listening to a machine announce its readiness. Ready for the wash? He pressed the release. Ready for the wash? Karen's mind strayed from the job, which didn't need much attention in any case. He wished he'd done what he'd longed to do as a youngster. It would have been great to be a rocket pilot, to push a button and go to Mars. End of Cost of Living by Robert Sheckley Dead Ringer by Lester Del Rey This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Reading by Greg Marguerite Dead Ringer by Lester Del Rey There was nothing, especially on earth, which could set him free, the truth least of all. Dane Phillips slouched in the window seat watching the morning crowds on their way to work and carefully avoiding any attempt to read Jordan's old face as the editor skimmed through the notes. He had learned to make his tall, bony body seem all loose-jointed relaxation, no matter what he felt. But the oversized hands in his pockets were clenched so tightly that the nails were cutting into his palms. Every tick of the old-fashioned clock sent a throb racing through his brain. Every rustle of the pages seemed to release a fresh shot of adrenaline into his bloodstream. This time, his mind was pleading, it has to be right this time. Jordan finished his reading and shoved the folder back. He reached for his pipe, sighed, and then nodded slowly. A nice job of researching, Phillips, and it might make a good feature for the Sunday section at that. It took a second to realize that the words meant acceptance, for Phillips had prepared himself too thoroughly against another failure. Now he felt the tautened muscles release, so quickly that he would have fallen if he hadn't been braced against the seat. He groped in his mind, hunting for words and finding none. There was only the hot, sudden flame of unbelieving hope, and then an almost blinding exaltation. Jordan didn't seem to notice his silence. The editor made a neat pile of the notes, nodding again. Sure, I like it. We've been short of stock stuff lately, and the readers go for it when we can get a fresh angle. But, naturally, you'd have to leave out all that nonsense on Blanding. Hell, the man's just buried, and his relatives and friends— But that's the proof! Phillips stared at the editor, trying to penetrate through the haze of hope that had somehow grown chilled and unreal. His thoughts were abruptly disorganized and out of his control. Only the urgency remained. 
It's the key evidence. And we've got to move fast. I don't know how long it takes, but even one more day may be too late." Jordan nearly dropped the pipe from his lips as he jerked upright to peer sharply at the younger man. "'Are you crazy? Do you seriously expect me to get an order to exhume him now? What would it get us other than lawsuits, even if we could get the order without cause, which we can't?' Then the pipe did fall as he gaped open-mouthed. My God! You believe all that stuff. You expected us to publish it straight. No, said Dane thickly. The hope was gone now, as if it had never existed, leaving a numb emptiness where nothing mattered. No, I guess I didn't really expect anything, but I believe the facts. Why shouldn't I? He reached for the papers with hands he could hardly control and began stuffing them back into the folder. All the careful documentation, the fingerprints, smudged perhaps in some cases, but still evidence enough for anyone but a fool. Phillips, Jordan said questioningly to himself, and then his voice was talking on a new edge. Phillips, wait a minute, I've got it now. Dane Phillips, not Arthur. Two years on the trip, then you turned up on the register in Seattle. Philip Dean, or some such name there. Yeah, Dane agreed. There was no use in denying anything now. Yeah, Dane Arthur Phillips, so I suppose I'm through here. Jordan nodded again, and there was a faint look of fear in his expression. You can pick up your pay on the way out and make it quick before I change my mind and call the boys in white. It could have been worse. It had been worse before. And there was enough in the pay envelope to buy what he needed. A flash camera, a little folding shovel from one of the surplus houses, and a bottle of good scotch. It would be dark enough for him to taxi out to Oakhaven Cemetery, where Blanding had been buried. It wouldn't change the minds of the fools, of course, even if he could drag back what he might find. Without the change being completed, they wouldn't accept the evidence. He'd been crazy to think anything could change their minds. And they called him a fanatic. If the facts he'd dug up in ten years of hunting wouldn't convince them, nothing would. And yet he had to see for himself, before it was too late. He picked a cheap hotel at random and checked in under an assumed name. He couldn't go back to his room while there was a chance that Jordan might still try to turn him in. There wouldn't be time for Sylvia's detectives to bother him, probably, but there was the ever-present danger that one of the aliens might intercept the message. He shivered. He'd been risking that for ten years, yet the likelihood was still a horror to him. The uncertainty made it harder to take than any human-devised torture could be. There was no way of guessing what an alien might do to anyone who discovered that all men were not human, that some were zombies. There was the classic syllogism, all men are mortal, I am man, therefore I am mortal. But not Blanding, or Corporal Harding. It was Harding's death that had started it all during the fighting on Guadalcanal. A grenade had come flying into the foxhole where Dane and Harding had felt reasonably safe. The concussion had knocked Dane out, possibly saving his life when the enemy thought he was dead. He'd come to in the daylight to see Harding lying there, mangled and twisted, with his throat torn. There was blood on Dane's uniform, obviously spattered from the dead man. It hadn't been a mistake or delusion. Harding had been dead. It had taken Dane two days of crawling and hiding to get back to his group. Too exhausted to report Harding's death, he'd slept for twenty hours, and when he awoke, Harding had been standing beside him with a whole throat and a fresh uniform, grinning and kidding him for running off and leaving a stunned friend behind. It was no ringer, but Harding himself, complete to the smallest personal memories and personality traits. The pressures of war probably saved Dane's sanity while he learned to face the facts. All men are mortal. Harding is not mortal. Therefore, Harding is not a man. Nor was Harding alone. Dane found enough evidence to know there were others. The Tribune morgue yielded even more data. A man had faced seven firing squads and walked away. Another survived over a dozen attacks by professional killers. Fingerprints turned up mysteriously copied from those of men long dead. Some of the aliens seemed to heal almost instantly. Others took days. Some operated completely alone. Some seemed to have joined with others but they were legion. 
Lack of a clearer pattern of attack made him consider the possibility of human mutation, but such tissue was too wildly different, and the invasion had begun long before atomics or X-rays. He gave up trying to understand their alien motivations. It was enough that they existed in secret, slowly growing in numbers while mankind was unaware of them. When his proof was complete and irrefutable, he took it to his editor, to be fired, politely but coldly. Other editors were less polite, but he went on doggedly trying and failing. What else could he do? Somehow he had to find the few people who could recognize facts and warn them. The aliens would get him, of course, when the story broke, but a warned humanity could cope with them. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Then he met Sylvia, by accident, after losing his fifth job, a girl who had inherited a fortune big enough to spread his message in paid ads across the country. They were married before he found she was hard-headed about her money. She demanded a full explanation for every cent beyond his allowance. In the end, she got the explanation. And while he was trying to cash the check she gave him, she visited Dr. Buell to come back with a squad of quiet, refined, strong-arm boys who made sure Dane reached Buell's rest home safely. Hydrotherapy. Buell as the kindly, firm father image. Analysis. Hypnosis that stripped every secret from him, including his worst childhood nightmare. His father had committed a violent, bloody suicide after one of the many quarrels with Dane's mother. Dane had found the body. Two nights after the funeral he had dreamed of his father's face, horror-filled, at the window. He knew now that it was a normal nightmare, caused by being forced to look at the face in the coffin. But the shock had lasted for years. It had bothered him again, after his discovery of the aliens, until a thorough check had proved without doubt that his father had been fully human with a human, if tempestuous, childhood behind him. Dr. Buell was delighted. You see, Dane, you know it was a nightmare, but you don't really believe it even now. Your father was an alien monster to you. No adult is quite human to a child. And that literal-minded self, your subconscious, saw him after he died. So there are alien monsters who return from death. Then you come, too, from a concussion. Harding is sprawled out, unconscious, covered with blood probably your blood, since you say he wasn't wounded later. But after seeing your father, you can't associate blood with yourself. You see it as a horrible wound on Harding. When he turns out to be alive, you're still in partial shock with your subconscious dominant. And that has the answer already. There are monsters who come back from the dead. An exaggerated reaction, but nothing really abnormal. We'll have you out of here in no time. No non-directive psychiatry for Buell. The man beamed paternally, chuckling, as he added what he must have considered the clincher. Anyhow, even zombies can't stand fire, Dane, so you can stop worrying about Harding. I checked up on him. He was burned to a crisp in a hotel fire two months ago. It was logical enough to shake Dane's faith, until he came across Milo Blanding's picture in a magazine article on Society in St. Louis. According to the item, Milo was a cousin of the Blandings whose father had vanished in Chile as a young man and who had just rejoined the family. The picture was of Harding. An alien could have gotten away by simply committing suicide and being carried from the rest home. But Dane had to do it the hard way, watching his chance and using commando tactics on a guard who had come to accept him as a harmless nut. In St. Louis he'd used the purloined letter technique to hide, going back to newspaper work and using almost his real name. It had seemed to work, too, but he'd been less lucky about Harding Blanding. The man had been in Europe on some kind of tour until his return only this last week. Dane had seen him just once then, but long enough to be sure it was Harding, before he died again. This time it was a drunken auto accident that seemed to be none of his fault, but left his body a mangled wreck. It was almost dark when Dane dismissed the taxi at the false address, a mile from the entrance to the cemetery. He watched it turn back down the road, then picked up the valise with his camera and folding shovel. He shivered as he moved reluctantly ahead. War had proven that he would never be a brave man, and the old fears of darkness and graveyards were still strong in him. But he had to know what the coffin contained now, if it wasn't already too late. 
It represented the missing link in his picture of the aliens. What happened to them during the period of regrowth? Did they revert to their natural form? Were they at all conscious while the body reshaped itself into wholeness? Dane had puzzled over it night after night with no answer. Nor could he figure how they could escape from the grave. Perhaps a man could force his way out of some of the coffins he had inspected. The soil would still be soft and loose in the grave, and a lot of the coffins in the boxes around them were strong in appearance only. A determined creature that could exist without much air for long enough might make it. But there were other caskets that couldn't be cracked, at least without the aid of outside help. What happened when a creature that could survive even the poison of embalming fluids and the draining of all the blood woke up in such a coffin? Dane's mind skittered from it, as always, and then came back to it, reluctantly. There were still accounts of corpses turned up with the nails and hair grown long in the grave. Could normal tissues stand the current tricks of the morticians to have life enough for such growth? The possibility was absurd. Those cases had to be aliens, ones who hadn't escaped. Even they must die eventually, in such a case, after weeks and months. It took time for hair to grow. And there were stories of corpses that had apparently fought and twisted in their coffins still. What was it like for an alien, then, going slowly mad while it waited for true death? How long did madness take? He shivered again, but went steadily on while the cemetery fence appeared in the distance. He'd seen Blanding's coffin, and the big solid metal casket around it that couldn't be cracked by any amount of effort and strength. He was sure the creature was still there, unless it had a confederate. But that wouldn't matter. An empty coffin would also be proof. Dane avoided the main gate, unsure about whether there would be a watchman or not. A hundred feet away there was a tree near the ornamental spikes of the iron fence. He threw his bag over and began shinnying up. It was difficult, but he made it finally, dropping onto the soft grass beyond. There was the trace of the moon at times through the clouds, but it hadn't betrayed him, and there had been no alarm wire along the top of the fence. He moved from shadow to shadow, his hair prickling along the base of his neck. Locating the right grave in the darkness was harder than he had expected, even with an occasional brief use of the small flashlight. But at last he found the marker that was serving until the regular monument could arrive. His hands were sweating so much that it was hard to use the small shovel, but the digging of foxholes had given him experience, and the ground was still soft from the gravedigger's work. He stopped once as the moon came out briefly. Again, a sound in the darkness above left him hovering and sick in the hole, but it must have been only some animal. He uncovered the top of the casket with hands already blistering. Then he cursed as he realized the catches were near the bottom, making his work even harder. He reached them at last, fumbling them open. The metal top of the casket seemed to be a dome of solid lead, and he had no room to maneuver, but it began swinging up reluctantly until he could feel the polished wood of the coffin. Dane reached for the lid with hands he could barely control. Fear was thick in his throat now. What could an alien do to a man who discovered it? Would it be Harding there, or some monstrous thing still changing? How long did it take a revived monster to go mad when it found no way to escape? He gripped the shovel in one hand, working at the lid with the other. Now, abruptly, his nerves steadied as they had done whenever he was in real battle. He swung the lid up and began groping for the camera. His hand went into the silk-lined interior and found nothing. He was too late. Either Harding had gotten out somehow before the final ceremony, or a confederate had already been there. The coffin was empty. There were no warning sounds this time, only hands that slipped under his arms and across his mouth, lifting him easily from the grave. A match flared briefly, and he was looking into the face of Buell's chief strong-arm man. Hello, Mr. Phillips. Promise to be quiet and we'll release you, okay? At Dane's sickened nod, he gestured to the others. Let him go. And Tom, better get that filled in. We don't want any trouble from this. Surprise came from the grave a moment later. Hey, Burke, there's no corpse here. Burke's words killed any hopes Dane had at once. So what? Ever hear of a cremation? Lots of people use a regular coffin for the ashes. He wasn't cremated, Dane told him. You can check up on that. 
but he knew it was useless. Sure, Mr. Phillips, we'll do that. The tone was one reserved for humoring madmen. Burke turned, gesturing. Better come along, Mr. Phillips. Your wife and Dr. Buell are waiting at the hotel. The gate was open now, but there was no sign of a watchman. If one worked here, Sylvia's money would have taken care of that, of course. Dane went along quietly, sitting in the rubble of his hopes while the big car purred through the morning and on down Lindell Boulevard toward the hotel. Once he shivered, and Burke dug out a hot brandied coffee. They had thought of everything, including a coat to cover his dirt-soiled clothes as they took him up the elevator to where Buell and Sylvia were waiting for him. She had been crying, obviously, but there were no tears or recriminations when she came over to kiss him. Funny. She must still love him, as he'd learned to his surprise he loved her, under different circumstances. So you found me, he asked needlessly of Buell. He was operating on purely automatic habits now, the reaction from the night and his failure numbing him emotionally. Jordan got in touch with you? Buell smiled back at him. We knew where you were all along, Dane, but as long as you acted normal we hoped it might be better than the home. Too bad we couldn't stop you before you got all mixed up in this. So I suppose I'm committed to your booby hatch again. Buell nodded, refusing to resent the term. I'm afraid so, Dane. For a while, anyhow. You'll find your clothes in that room. Why don't you clean up a little? Take a hot bath, maybe. You'll feel better. Dane went in, surprised when no guards followed him. But they had thought of everything. What looked like a screen on the window had been recently installed, and it was strong enough to prevent his escape. Blessed are the poor, for they shall be poorly guarded. He was turning on the shower when he heard the sound of voices coming through the door. He left the water running and came back to listen. Sylvia was speaking. Seems so logical, so completely rational. It makes him a dangerous person, Buell answered, and there was no false warmth in his voice now. Sylvia, you've got to admit it to yourself. All the reason and analysis in the world won't convince him he's wrong. This time we'll have to use shock treatment. Burn over those memories. Fade them out. It's the only possible course. There was a pause, and then a sigh. I suppose you're right. Dane didn't wait to hear more. He drew back while his mind fought to accept the hideous reality. Shock treatment. The works. If what he knew of psychiatry was correct. Enough of it to erase his memories, a part of himself. It wasn't therapy Buell was considering. It couldn't be. It was the answer of an alien that had a human in its hands. One who knew too much. He might have guessed. What better place for an alien than in the guise of a psychiatrist? Where else was there the chance for all the refined modern torture needed to burn out a man's mind? Dane had spent ten years in fear of being discovered by them, and now Buell had him. Sylvia? He couldn't be sure. Probably she was human. It wouldn't make any difference. There was nothing he could do through her. Either she was part of the game, or she really thought him mad. Dane tried the window again, but it was hopeless. There would be no escape this time. Buell couldn't risk it. The shock treatment, or whatever Buell would use under the name of shock treatment, would begin at once. It would be easy to slip, to use an overdose of something, to make sure Dane was killed. Or there were ways of making sure it didn't matter. They could leave him alive, but take his mind away. In alien hands, human psychiatry could do worse than all the medieval torture chambers. The sickness grew in his stomach as he considered the worst that could happen. Death he could accept if he had to. He could even face the chance of torture by itself, as he had accepted the danger while trying to have his facts published. But to have his mind taken from him a step at a time, to watch his personality, his ego rotted away under him, and to know that he would wind up as a drooling idiot. He made his decision almost as quickly as he had come to realize what Buell must be. There was a razor in the medicine chest. It was a safety razor, of course, but the blade was sharp, and it would be big enough. There was no time for careful planning. One of the guards might come in at any moment if they thought he was taking too long. Some fear came back as he leaned over the wash basin, staring at his throat, fingering the suddenly murderous blade. But the pain wouldn't last long, a lot less than there would be under shock treatment, and less pain. He'd read enough to feel sure of that. Twice he braced himself and failed at the last second. 
His mind flashed out in wild schemes, fighting against what it knew had to be done. The world still had to be warned. If he could escape somehow, if he could still find a way, he couldn't quit, no matter how impossible things looked. But he knew better. There was nothing one man could do against the aliens in this world they had taken over. He'd never had a chance. Man had been chained already by carefully developed ridicule against superstition, by carefully indoctrinated gobbledygook about insanity, persecution complexes, and all the rest. For a second, Dane even considered the possibility that he was insane, but he knew it was only a blind effort to cling to life. There had been no insanity in him when he groped for evidence in the coffin and found it empty. He leaned over the washbasin, his eyes focused on his throat, and his hand came down and around, carrying the razor blade through a lethal semicircle. Dane Phillips watched fear give place to sickness on his face as the pain lanced through him and the blood spurted. He watched horror creep up to replace the sickness, while the bleeding stopped and the gash began closing. By the time he recognized his expression as the same one he'd seen on his father's face at the window so long ago, the wound was completely healed. End of Dead Ringer by Lester Del Rey The Doorway by Evelyn E. Smith This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times A discerning critic once pointed out that Edgar Allan Poe possessed not so much a distinctive style as a distinctive manner. So startlingly original was his approach to the dark castles and haunted woodlands of his own somber creation that he transcended the literary by the sheer magic of his prose. Something of that same magic gleams in the darkly tapestried little fantasy presented here, beneath Evelyn Smith's eerily enchanted wand. A man may wish he'd married his first love, and not really mean it, but an insincere wish may turn ugly in dimensions unknown. It is my theory, Professor Falabala said, helping himself to a cookie, that no one ever really makes a decision. What really happens is that whenever alternative courses of actions are called for, the individuality splits up and continues on two or more divergent planes. Very much like the parthenogenesis of unicellular animal. Delicious cookies, these, Mrs. Hughes. Thank you, Professor. Gloria simpered. I made them myself. You must give us the recipe, said one of the ladies, and the others murmured agreement, glad to get their individualities on a plane they could understand. Since most decisions are hardly as momentous as the individual imagines, Professor Falabella continued, and since the imagination of the average individual is very limited, many of these different planes, or as they are colloquially known, space-time continuums, may exist in close, even tangential, relationship. Gloria rose unobtrusively and took the teapot to the kitchen for a refill. Her husband stood by the sink, moodily drinking whiskey out of the bottle, so as to avoid having to wash a glass afterward. "'Bill, you're not being polite to our guests. Why don't you go out and listen to Professor Falabella?' I can hear him perfectly well from here, Bill muttered, and indeed the professor's mellifluous tones pervaded every nook and cranny of the thin-walled house. Long-winded cultus! What is he a professor of? I'd like to know. Professor Falabella is not a cultist, affirmed Gloria angrily. He's a great philosopher. Bill Hughes said something unprintable. If I'd married Lucy Allison— he continued unkindly, she'd never have filled the house with long-haired cultists on my so-called day of rest. Gloria's soft chin trembled, and her blue eyes filled with tears. She was beginning to put on weight, he noticed. 
I've been hearing nothing but Lucy Allison, Lucy Allison, Lucy Allison, for the past year. Y you said yourself she looked like a horse. Horses, he observed, have sense. He was being brutal, but he couldn't help it, and didn't want to. Professor Falabella was only the most long-winded of a long series of mystics Gloria was forever dragging into the house. The trouble with the half-educated, he thought bitterly, is that they seek culture in the most peculiar places. I'll bet she would have let me have peace on Sunday, he said. It just goes to show what happens when you marry a woman solely for her looks. He drained the bottle, then hurled it into the garbage pail with a resounding crash. Gloria's shoulders shook as she filled the kettle. I wish I'd decided to be an old maid, she sobbed. A very unlikely possibility, he thought. Even now, shopworn as she was, Gloria could have a fairly wide range of suitors, should something happen to him. She looked sexy, but how deceiving appearances could be. Professor Falabella was still talking as Bill and Gloria emerged from the kitchen. I believe that it is possible for an individual who exists on a limited plane of imagination to transpose from one plane to an adjacent one without difficulty. Great heavens, what was that? Something had whisked past the archway leading into the foyer. Don't pay any attention, Gloria smiled nervously. The house is haunted. My dear, one of the ladies offered, I know of the most marvelous exterminator. The house, Gloria assured her coldly, really is haunted. We've been seeing things ever since we moved in. And she really believed it, Bill thought. Believed that the house was haunted, that is. Of course he had seen things, too, but... He was enlightened enough to know that ghosts don't exist, even if you do see them. Professor Falabella cleared his throat. As I was saying, it is possible to send the individual through another, well, dimension, as some popular writers would have it, to one of his other spatial existences on the same temporal plane. It is merely necessary for him to find the door. Nonsense! Bill interrupted. Holy unmitigated nonsense! Every head swiveled to look at him. Gloria restrained tears with an effort. Brute! someone muttered. But ridicule apparently only stimulated the professor. He beamed. You don't believe me. Your imagination cannot extend to the comprehension of multifariousness of space. Nonsense! Bill said again, but less confidently. I believe that I have discovered the doorway, Professor Falabella continued, and the way is open. However, most people fear to penetrate the unknown, even though it is to enter another phase of their own existence. I do admit that the shock of spatial transference, no matter how slight, combined with the concrete awareness of a previous spatial relationship, would be perhaps too much for the keenly sensitive individualism. Bill opened his mouth. I know what you're about to say, young man. You don't have to be a mind-reader to know that, Bill assured him. His consonants were already a little slurred, and he knew Gloria was ashamed of him. It served her right. He'd been ashamed of her for years. Professor Falabella smiled. His teeth were very sharp and white. Very well, Mr. Hughes. Since you are a skeptic, perhaps you will not object to being the subject of our experiment yourself. What kind of experiment? Bill asked suspiciously. Merely go through the door. Any door can become the doorway, if it is transposed into the proper spatial dimension. That door, for instance. Professor Falabella waved his hand toward the doorway of what Gloria liked to call Bill's study. You mean you just want me to open the door and go into that room? Bill said incredulously. That's all? That is all. Of course, you go with the awareness that it is the threshold of another plane, and that you step voluntarily from this existence to an adjacent one. Sure, Bill said. 
He had just remembered there was a nearly full bottle of Calvert in the bottom drawer of the desk. Sure, anything to oblige. Very well. Go to the door, and keep remembering that of your own free will you are passing from this plane to the next. Look out, everybody, Bill called raucously as he pulled open the door. I'm coming in on the next plane. No one laughed. He stepped over the threshold, shutting the door firmly behind him. A wonderful excuse to get away from those blasted women. He'd climb out of the window as soon as he'd collected the whiskey, and give them a nervous moment, thinking he'd really passed into another existence. It would serve Gloria right. For a moment, as he crossed, he had a queer sensation. Maybe there was something in what Professor Falabella said. But no, there he was in the study. All that mumbo-jumbo was getting him down. That was all. He was a nervous man. Only nobody appreciated the fact. Taking a cigarette out of the pack in his pocket, he reached for the lighter on his desk. It wasn't there. Time and time again he told Gloria not to touch his things, and always she disobeyed him. Company was coming, and she must tidy up. Cooking and cleaning, that was all she was good for. But this was carrying tidiness too far. She'd even removed the ash trays. And where did that glass block paperweight come from? He'd had a penguin in a snowstorm, and he'd been happy with it. This was too much. He told Gloria off, stealing a man's penguin. He opened the door into the living room and bumped into Lucy Allison. "'Don't you think you've been in there long enough, Bill?' she asked acridly. "'I'm sure your guests would appreciate catching a glimpse of you.' "'Why, hello, Lucy,' he said, surprised. "'I didn't know Gloria had invited you.' "'Gloria, Gloria, Gloria,' Lucy cut off his sentence. "'You've been talking about nothing but that dumb little blonde for months. "'Because of the people in the room beyond, her voice was pitched low, "'but her pale eyes glittered unpleasantly behind her spectacles. "'I wish you had married her. "'You'd have made a fine pair.' "'Gently, caressingly, the short hairs on the back of Bill's neck rose. "'Come back in here,' Lucy said, hauling him back into the living room, where a number of people, who had been enjoying the domestic fracas, suddenly broke into loud and animated chatter. Dr. Hildebrand was telling us all about nuclear fission. "'Can't find an ashtray,' Bill muttered, seizing on something tangible. "'Can't find an ashtray in the whole darn place.' "'We've been over this millions of times, Bill. You know,' she smiled at the guests, a smile that carefully excluded Bill. I'm allergic to smoke, but I never can get my husband to remember he isn't to smoke inside the house. Now, take the neutron, for example, Dr. Hildebrand said through a mouthful of pâté. What is the neutron? Is only... What was that? The wraith of Gloria crossed the foyer and disappeared. Bill took a step forward, then stood still. Lucy smiled self-consciously. "'That's nothing at all. The house is merely haunted.' Everyone laughed. "'Forgot something,' Bill muttered, and dashed back into the study. He yanked open the bottom drawer of the desk. Sure enough, there was a bottle of Shenley, nearly a third full. "'There are some advantages,' he thought as he tilted it to his lips, in having a limited imagination." End of The Doorway by Evelyn E. Smith The First One by Herbert D. Castell This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tabithat The First One by Herbert D. Castell there was the usual welcoming crowd for a celebrity, and the usual speeches by the usual politicians who met him at the airport, which had once been twenty miles outside of Croton, but which the growing city had since engulfed and placed well within its boundaries. But everything wasn't usual. The crowd was quiet, and the mayor didn't seem quite as at ease as he'd been on his last big welcoming, for Corporal Beringer, one of the crew of the spaceship Washington, first to set Americans upon Mars. His honour's handclasp was somewhat moist and cold. His honour's eyes held a trace of remoteness. 
Still, he was the honoured homecomer, the successful returnee, the hometown boy who had made good in a big way, and they took the triumphal tour up Main Street to the new square and the grandstand. There he sat between the mayor and a nervous young coed, chosen as homecoming queen, and looked out at the police and fire department bands, the National Guard, the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, the Elks and Masons. Several of the churches in town had shown indecision as to how to instruct their parishioners to treat him, but they had all come around. The tremendous national interest, the fact that he was the first one, had made them come around. It was obvious by now that they would have to adjust as they had adjusted to all the other firsts taking place in these, as the newspapers had dubbed the start of the twenty-first century, the Galloping Twenties. He was glad when the official greeting was over. He was a very tired man, and he had come further, travelled longer and over darker country, than any man who'd ever lived before. He wanted a meal at his own table, a kiss from his wife, a word from his son, and later to see some old friends and a relative or two. He didn't want to talk about the journey. He wanted to forget the immediacy, the urgency, the terror. Then perhaps he would talk. Or would he? For he had very little to tell. He had travelled, and he had returned, and his voyage was very much like the voyages of the great mariners from Columbus onward, long dull periods of time passing, passing, and then the arrival. The house had changed. He saw that as soon as the official car let him off at 45 Roosevelt Street. The change was, he knew, for the better. They'd put a porch in front, they had rehabilitated, spruced up, almost rebuilt the entire outside and grounds. But he was sorry, he'd wanted it to be as before. The head of the American Legion and the chief of police who had escorted him on this trip from the square didn't ask to go in with him. He was glad. He'd had enough of strangers. Not that he was through with strangers. There were dozens of them up and down the street, standing beside parked cars, looking at him. But when he looked back at them, their eyes dropped, they turned away, they began moving off. He was still too much the first one to have his gaze met. He walked up what had once been a concrete path, and was now an ornate flagstone path. He climbed the new porch, and raised the ornamental knocker on the new door, and heard the soft music sound within. He was surprised that he'd had to do this. He'd thought Edith would be watching at a window. And perhaps she had been watching, but she hadn't opened the door. The door opened. He looked at her. It hadn't been too long, and she hadn't changed at all. She was still the small, slender girl he'd loved in high school, the small, slender woman he'd married twelve years ago. Ralphie was with her. They held on to each other as if seeking mutual support, the thirty-three-year-old woman and ten-year-old boy. They looked at him, and then both moved forward, still together. He said, "'It's good to be home.' Edith nodded, and still holding to Ralphie with one hand, put the other arm around him. He kissed her, her neck, her cheek, and all the old jokes came to mind, the jokes of travel-weary, battle-weary men, the and-then-I'll-put-my-pack-aside jokes that spoke of terrible hunger. She was trembling, and even as her lips came up to touch his, he felt the difference, and because of this difference he turned with urgency to Ralphie and picked him up and hugged him and said, because he could think of nothing else to say, "'What a big fella! What a big fella!' Ralphie stood in his arms as if his feet were still planted on the floor, and he didn't look at his father, but somewhere beyond him. "'I didn't grow much while you were gone, Dad. Mum says I don't eat enough.' So he put him down, and told himself that it would all change, that everything would loosen up, just as his commanding officer, General Carlyle, had said it would early this morning before he left Washington. "'Give it some time,' Carlyle had said. "'You need the time. They need the time.' and for the love of heaven don't be sensitive edith was leading him into the living-room her hand lying still in his a cool dead bird lying still in his he sat down on the couch she sat down beside him but she had hesitated he wasn't being sensitive she had hesitated his wife had hesitated before sitting down beside him Carlyle had said his position was analogous to Columbus, to Vasco de Gama's, to Preshoff's when the Russian returned from the moon, but more so. Carlyle had said lots of things, but even Carlyle, who had worked with him all the way, who had engineered the entire fantastic journey, 
Even Carlyle, the Nobel Prize winner, the multi-degreed genius in uniform, had not actually spoken to him as one man to another. The eyes, it always showed in their eyes. He looked across the room at Ralphie, standing in the doorway, a boy already tall, already widening in the shoulders, already large of feature. It was like looking into the mirror and seeing himself twenty-five years ago. But Ralphie's face was drawn, was worried in a way that few ten-year-old faces are. "'How's it going in school?' he asked. "'Gee, Dad, it's the second month of summer vacation.' "'Well, then, before summer vacation.' "'Pretty good,' Edith said. "'He made top forum the six-month period before vacation, and he made top forum the six-month period you went away, Hank.' He nodded, remembering that, remembering everything, remembering the warmth of her farewell, the warmth of Ralphie's farewell, their tears as he left the experimental flight station in the Aleutians. They had feared for him, having read of the many launchings gone wrong, even in continent-to-continent experimental flight. They had been right to worry, he'd suffered much after that blow-up, but now they should be rejoicing because he'd survived and made the long journey. Ralphie suddenly said— "'I gotta go, Dad. I promised Walt and the others I'd pitch. It's into town Little League, you know. It's Harmon, you know. I gotta keep my word.' Without waiting for an answer, he waved his hand. It shook. A ten-year-old boy's hand that shook, and ran from the room and from the house. He and Edith sat beside each other, and he wanted badly to take her in his arms, and yet he didn't want to oppress her. He stood up. "'I'm very tired. I'd like to lie down for a while.' which wasn't true, because he'd been lying down all the months of the way back. She said, "'Of course, how stupid of me, expecting you to sit around and make small talk and pick up just where you left off.' He nodded, but that was exactly what he wanted to do, make small talk and pick up just where he'd left off. But they didn't expect it of him, they wouldn't let him, they felt he'd changed too much.' She led him upstairs and along the foyer past Ralphie's room and past the small guest-room to their bedroom. This, too, had changed. It was newly painted, and it had new furniture. He saw twin beds separated by an ornate little table with an ornate little lamp, and this looked more ominous a barrier to him than the twelve-foot concrete and barbed wire fence around the experimental station. "'Which one is mine?' he asked, and tried to smile. She also tried to smile. "'The one near the window. You always liked the fresh air, the sunshine in the morning. You always said it helped you to get up on time when you were stationed at the base outside of town. You always said it reminded you, being able to see the sky, that you were going to go up in it, and that you were going to come down from it to this bed again.' "'Not this bed,' he murmured, and was a little sorry afterward. "'No, not this bed,' she said quickly. "'Your lodge donated the bedroom set, and I really didn't know—' She waved her hand, her face white. He was sure, then, that she had known, and that the beds and the barrier between them were her own choice, if only an unconscious choice. He went to the bed near the window, stripped off his Air Force blue jacket, began to take off his shirt, but then remembered that some arm scars still showed. He waited for her to leave the room. She said, "'Well, then, rest up, dear,' and went out. He took off his shirt and saw himself in the mirror on the opposite wall, and then took off his undershirt. The body scars were faint, the scars running in long lines, one dissecting his chest, the other slicing diagonally across his upper abdomen, to disappear under his trousers. There were several more on his back, and one on his right thigh. They'd been treated properly, and would soon disappear, but she had never seen them. Perhaps she never would. Perhaps pyjamas and robes and dark rooms would keep them from her until they were gone. Which was not what he'd considered at all important on leaving Walter Reed Hospital early this morning, which was something he found distasteful, something he felt beneath them both. And at the same time he began to understand that there would be many things previously beneath them both which would have to be considered. She had changed. Ralphie had changed. All the people he knew had probably changed— because they thought he had changed. He was tired of thinking. He lay down and closed his eyes. He let himself taste bitterness, unhappiness, a loneliness he'd never known before. But some time later, as he was dozing off, a sense of reassurance began filtering into his mind. 
After all, he was still Henry Devers, the same man who had left home eleven months ago, with a love for family and friends which was, if anything, stronger than before. Once he could communicate this, the strangeness would disappear, and the first one would again become good old Hank. It was little enough to ask for, a return to old values, old relationships, the normalcies of the backwash instead of the freneticisms of the limelight. It would certainly be granted to him. He slept. Dinner was at 7 p.m. His mother came, his Uncle Joe and Aunt Lucille came. Together with Edith, Ralphie and himself, they made six, and ate in the dining-room at the big table. Before he'd become the first one, it would have been a noisy affair. His family had never been noted for a lack of ebullience, a lack of talkativeness, and Ralphie had always chosen meal-times, especially with company present, to describe everything and anything that had happened to him during the day. And Edith herself had always chatted, especially with his mother, although they didn't agree about much. Still, it had been good-natured, the general tone of their lives had been good-natured. This wasn't good-natured. Exactly what it was, he wasn't sure. Stiff was perhaps the word. They began with grapefruit, Edith and Mother serving quickly, efficiently from the kitchen, then sitting down at the table. He looked at Mother as he raised his first spoonful of chilled fruit, and said, "'Younger than ever.' It was nothing new, he'd said it many times before, but his mother had always reacted with a bright smile and a quip, something like, "'Young for the Golden Age Centre, you mean?' This time she burst into tears. It shocked him. But what shocked him even more was the fact that no one looked up, commented, made any attempt to comfort her, no one indicated in any way that a woman was sobbing at the table. He was sitting directly across from Mother, and reached out and touched her left hand, which lay limply beside the silverware. She didn't move it. She hadn't touched him once beyond that first quick, strangely cool embrace at the door. Then a few seconds later she withdrew it and let it drop out of sight. So there he was, Henry Devers, at home with the family. So there he was, the hero returned, waiting to be treated as a human being. The grapefruit shells were cleaned away, and the soup served. Uncle Joe began to talk. "'The greatest little development of circular uniform houses you ever did see,' he boomed in his powerful salesman's voice. "'Still going like sixty. We'll sell out before—' At that point he looked at Hank, and Hank nodded encouragement, desperately interested in this normalcy, and Joe's voice died away. He looked down at his plate, mumbled, "'Soup's getting cold,' and began to eat— his hand shook a little. His ruddy face was not quite as ruddy as Hank remembered it. Aunt Lucille made a few quavering statements about the ladies' Tuesday garden club, and Hank looked across the table to where she sat between Joe and Mother. His wife and son bracketed him, and yet he felt alone, and said, "'I've missed fooling around with the lawn and the rose-bushes. Here it is August, and I haven't had my hand or mower or trowel.' Aunt Lucille smiled, if you could call it that, a pitiful twitching of the lips, and nodded. She threw her eyes in his direction, and passed him, and then down to her plate. Mother, who was still sniffling, said, "'I have a dismal headache. I'm going to lie down in the guest-room a while.' She touched his shoulder in passing, his affectionate, effusive mother, who would kiss stray dogs and strange children, who had often irritated him with an excess of physical and verbal caresses. She barely touched his shoulder and fled. So now five of them sat at the table. The meat was served, thin, rare slices of beef, the pink blood juice oozing warmly from the centre. He cut into it and raised a forkful to his mouth, then glanced at Ralphie and said, "'Looks fresh enough to have been killed in the back yard.' Ralphie said, "'Yeah, Dad.' Aunt Lucille put down her knife and fork and murmured something to her husband. Joe cleared his throat, and said Lucille was rapidly becoming a vegetarian, and he guessed she was going into the living-room for a while. "'She'll be back for dessert, of course,' he said, his laugh sounding forced. Hank looked at Edith. Edith was busy with her plate. Hank looked at Ralphie. Ralphie was busy with his plate. Hank looked at Joe. Joe was chewing, gazing out over their heads to the kitchen. Hank looked at Lucille. She was disappearing into the living-room. He brought his fist down on the table. The settings jumped, a glass overturned spilling water. He brought it down again and again. They were all standing now. 
He sat there and pounded the table with his big right fist. Henry Devers, who would never have thought of making such a scene before, but who was now so sick and tired of being treated as the first one, of being stood back from, looked at in awe of, felt in fear of, that he could have smashed more than a table. Edith said, "'Hank,' he said, voice hoarse, "'shut up. Go away. Let me eat alone. I'm sick of the lot of you.' Mother and Joe returned a few minutes later, where he sat forcing food down his throat. Mother said, "'Henry, dear.' He didn't answer. She began to cry, and he was glad she left the house then. He had never said anything really bad to his mother. He was afraid this would have been the time. Joe merely cleared his throat and mumbled something about getting together again soon and drop out and see the new development. And he, too, was gone. Lucille never did manage to speak to him. He finished his beef and waited. Soon Edith came in with the special dessert she'd been preparing half the day, a magnificent English trifle. She served him and spooned out a portion for herself and Ralphie. She hesitated near his chair, and when he made no comment she called the boy. Then the three of them were sitting, facing the empty side of the table. They ate the trifle. Ralphie finished first and got up and said, "'Hey, I promised!' "'You promised the boys you'd play baseball or football or handball or something, anything to get away from your father.' Ralphie's head dropped, and he muttered, "'Oh, no, Dad.' Edith said, "'He'll stay home, Hank. We'll spend an evening together, talking, watching TV, playing Monopoly.' Ralphie said, "'Gee, sure, Dad, if you want to.' Hank stood up. "'The question is not whether I want to. You both know I want to. The question is whether you want to.' They answered together that of course they wanted to, but their eyes, his wife's and son's eyes, could not meet his, and so he said he was going to his room because he was, after all, very tired, and would, in all probability, continue to be very tired for a long, long time, and that they shouldn't count on him for normal social life. He fell asleep quickly, lying there in his clothes. But he didn't sleep long. Edith shook him, and he opened his eyes to a lighted room. "'Phil and Rona are here.' He blinked at her. She smiled, and it seemed her old smile. "'They're so anxious to see you, Hank. I could barely keep Phil from coming up and waking you himself. They want to go out and do the town. Please, Hank, say you will.' He sat up. "'Phil,' he muttered. "'Phil and Rona.' They'd had wonderful times together from grammar school on. Phil and Rona, their oldest and closest friends. Perhaps this would begin his real homecoming." do the town, they'd paint it and then tear it down. It didn't turn out that way. He was disappointed, but then again he'd also expected it. This entire first day at home had conditioned him to expect nothing good. They went to the bowling alleys, and Phil sounded very much the way he always had, soft-spoken and full of laughter and full of jokes. He patted Edith on the head the way he always had, and clapped Hank on the shoulder, but not the way he always had— so much more gently, almost remotely, and insisted they all drink more than was good for them, as he always had. And for once Hank was ready to go along on the drinking, for once he matched Phil shot for shot, beer for beer. They didn't bowl very long. At ten o'clock they crossed the road to Manfred's Tavern, where Phil and the girls ordered sandwiches and coffee, and Hank went right on drinking. Edith said something to him, but he merely smiled and waved his hand, and gulped another ounce of nirvana. There was dancing to a jukebox in Manfred's tavern. He'd been there many times before, and he was sure several of the couples recognised him. But except for a few abortive glances in his direction, it was as if he were a stranger in a city halfway around the world. At midnight he was still drinking. The others wanted to leave, but he said, "'I haven't danced with my girl Rona.' His tongue was thick, his mind was blurred, and yet he could read the strange expression on her face. Pretty Rona, who'd always flirted with him, who'd made a ritual of flirting with him. Pretty Rona, who now looked as if she were going to be sick. "'Oh, let's rock,' he said, and stood up. They were on the dance floor. He held her close, and hummed and chattered, and through the alcoholic haze saw she was a stiff-smiled, stiff-bodied, mechanical dancing doll. The number finished. They walked back to the booth. Phil said, "'Betty by time.' Hank said, First one dance with my loving wife.' He and Edith danced. He didn't hold her close as he had Rona. 
He waited for her to come close on her own, and she did, and yet she didn't, because while she put herself against him there was something in her face, no, in her eyes, it always showed in the eyes, that made him know she was trying to be the old Edith and not succeeding. This time, when the music ended, he was ready to go home. They rode back to town along Route 9, he and Edith in the rear of Phil's car, Rona driving because Phil had drunk just a little too much, Phil singing and telling an occasional bad joke, and somehow not his old self. No one was his old self. No one would ever be his old self with the first one. They turned left to take the short cut along Hallowed Hill Road, and Phil finished a story about a Martian and a Hollywood sex queen, and looked at his wife, and then passed her at the long cast-iron fence paralleling the road. "'Hey,' he said, pointing, "'do you know why that's the most popular place on earth?' Rona glanced to the left, and so did Hank and Edith. Rona made a little sound, and Edith seemed to stop breathing. But Phil went on a while longer, not yet aware of his supposed faux pas. "'You know why?' he repeated, turning to the back seat, the laughter rumbling up from his chest. "'You know why, folks?' Rona said, "'Did you notice Carl Bracken and his wife at—' Hank said, "'No, Phil. Why is it the most popular place on earth?' Phil said, "'Because people are—' and then he caught himself and waved his hand and muttered, "'I forgot the punchline.' "'Because people are dying to get in,' Hank said, and looked through the window, past the iron fence, into the large cemetery at the fleeting tombstones. The car was filled with horrified silence when there should have been nothing but laughter or irritation at a too old joke. "'Maybe you should let me out right here,' Hank said. "'I'm home, or well, that's what everyone seems to think.' Maybe I should lie down in an open grave. Maybe that would satisfy people. Maybe that's the only way to act, like Dracula or another monster from the movies. Edith said, Oh, Hank, don't, don't. The car raced along the road, crossed a macadam highway, went four blocks and pulled to a stop. He didn't bother saying good night. He didn't wait for Edith. He just got out, walked up the flagstone path, and entered the house. Hank. Edith whispered from the guest-room doorway. "'I'm so sorry.' "'There's nothing to be sorry about. It's just a matter of time. It'll all work out in time.' "'Yes,' she said quickly. "'That's it. I need a little time. We all need a little time. Because it's so strange, Hank. Because it's so frightening. I should have told you the moment you walked in. I think I've hurt you terribly. We've all hurt you terribly by trying to hide that we're frightened.' "'I'm going to stay in the guest-room,' he said, "'for as long as necessary, for good, if need be.' "'How could it be for good? How, Hank?' That question was perhaps the first firm basis for hope he'd had since returning. And there was something else, what Carlyle had told him, even as Carlyle himself had reacted as all men did. "'There are others coming, Edith, eight that I know of in the tanks right now.' My superior, Captain Davidson, who died at the same moment I did, seven months ago next Wednesday, he's going to be next. He was smashed up worse than I was, so it took a little longer, but he's almost ready. And there'll be many more, Edith. The government is going to save all they possibly can from now on. Every time a young and healthy man loses his life by accident, by violence, and his body can be recovered, he'll go into the tanks and they'll start the regenerative brain and organ process— the process that made it all possible. So people have to get used to us. And the old stories, the old terrors, the ugly old superstitions have to die, because in time each place will have some of us, because in time it'll be an ordinary thing. Edith said, Yes, and I'm so grateful that you're here, Hank. Please believe that. Please be patient with me and Ralphie and— She paused. There's one question— he knew what the question was. It had been the first asked him by everyone from the President of the United States on down. "'I saw nothing,' he said. "'It was as if I slept those six and a half months. Slept without dreaming.' She came to him and touched his face with her lips, and he was satisfied. Later, half asleep, he heard a dog howling, and remembered stories of how they announced death and the presence of monsters. He shivered and pulled the covers closer to him— and luxuriated in being safe in his own home. End of The First One by Herbert D. Castell
Grove of the Unborn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tabithat. Grove of the Unborn by Lynn Venable. Tyndall heard the rockets begin to roar, and it seemed as though the very blood in his veins pulsated with the surging of those mighty jets. Going? They couldn't be going. Not yet, not without him. And he heard the roaring rise to a mighty crescendo, and he felt the trembling of the ground beneath the room in which he lay, and then the great sound grew less and grew dim, and finally dissipated in a thin hum that dwindled finally into silence. They were gone. Tyndall threw himself face down on his couch, the feel of the slick, strange fabric cold and unfriendly against his face. He lay there for a long time, not moving. Tyndall's thoughts during those hours were of very fundamental things, that beneath him, beneath the structure of the building in which he was confined, lay a world that was not earth, circling a sun that was not Sol, and that the ship had gone and would never come back. He was alone, abandoned. He thought of the ship, a silver streak now in the implacable blackness of space, threading its way homeward through the stars to Sol, to Earth. The utter desolation which swept over him at the impact of his aloneness was more than he could endure, and he forced himself to think of something else. Why was he here, then? John Tyndall, third engineer of the starship Polaris. It had been such a routine trip ferrying a group of zoologists and biologists around the galaxy, looking for unclassified life-supporting planets. They had found such a world circling an obscure sun halfway across the galaxy, an ideal world for a search expedition teeming with life. The scientists were delighted. In a few short months they discovered and catalogued over a thousand varieties of flora and fauna peculiar to this planet, called Arrow, after the native name which sounded something like Ahaharo. Yes, there were natives, humanoid, civilized, and gracious. They had seemed to welcome the strangers. As a matter of fact, they had seemed to expect them. The Arillians had learned English easily, its basic sounds not being too alien to their own tongue. They had quite a city there on the edge of the jungle, although in circling the planet before landing the expedition had noted that this was the only city. On a world only a little smaller than Earth, one city, surrounded completely by the tropical jungle which covered the rest of the world. A city without power, without machinery of any kind, and yet a city that was self-sufficient. Well-tilled fields stretched to the very edge of the jungle, where high walls kept out the voracious growth. The fields fed the city well and clothed it well, and there were mines to yield up fine metal and precious gems. The earthmen had marvelled and yet it had seemed strange. On all this planet just one city, with perhaps half a million people within its walls. But this was not a problem for the expedition. The crew of the Polaris and the members of the expedition had spent many an enjoyable evening in the dining hall of the palace-like home of the Rahal, who was something more than a mayor and something less than a king. Actually, Aral seemed to get along with a minimum of government— all in all, the Earthmen had summed up the Arillians as being a naive, mild, and courteous people. They probably still thought so. All of them, that is, except Tyndall. Of course, now that he looked back upon it, there had been a few things. That business about the bugs, as the Earthmen had dubbed the odd, ugly creatures who seemed to occupy something of the position of a sacred cow in the Arillian scheme of things. The bugs came in all sizes— that is, all sizes from a foot or so in length up to the size of a full human. The bugs were not permitted to roam the streets and marketplaces like the sacred cows of the earthly Hindus. The bugs were kept in huge pens, which none but a few high-ranking priests were permitted to enter. And although the earthmen were not prevented from standing outside the pens and watching the ugly beasts munching grass or basking in the sun, the Arillians always seemed nervous when the strangers were about the pens. The earthmen had shrugged, and reflected that religion was a complexity difficult enough at home, needless to probe too deeply into the Arillian. But the time had been something else again, bringing with it the first sign of real Arillian fanaticism, and the first hint of violence. Tyndall and four companions were strolling in a downtown section of the city, when all at once a hoarse cry in Arillian shattered the quiet hum of street activity. "'What did he say?' asked one of Tyndall's companions, who had not learned much Arillian. "'I think—a time, a time. What could—' He never finished the sentence. 
All about the Marillions had prostrated themselves in the rather dirty street, covering their faces with their hands, lying face down. The earthmen hesitated a moment, and a priest of Aral appeared as though from nowhere, a wicked scimitar-like weapon in his hand, and a face tense with anger. "'Dare you!' he hissed in Arillion. "'Dare you not hide your eyes at a time!' He pushed one of the earthmen with surprising strength, and the latter stumbled to his knees. All five men hastened to ape the position of the prostrate Arillians. They knew better than to risk committing sacrilege on a strange planet. As Tyndall sank to the ground and covered his eyes, he heard that priest mutter another sentence, in which his own name was included. He thought it was, "'You, Tyndall, even you!' A few moments later a bell sounded from somewhere, and the buzzing of conversation began around them, along with the shuffling, scraping sound of many people getting to their feet at once. A hand touched Tyndall's shoulder, and an Arillian voice, laughing now, purred, "'Up, stranger, up! The time is past!' The earthmen got to their feet. Everything about them was the same, as though nothing had happened, people strolling along the street, going in and out of shops, stopping to chat. "'I guess that was the all-clear,' commented one wryly. The others laughed nervously, but Tyndall was strangely troubled. He was thinking of the strange words of the priest. "'You, Tyndall, even you!' Why should he have known, and not the others? He tried to forget it. Arillian was a complex tongue with confusing syntax. Perhaps the priest had said something else. But Tyndall knew one thing for certain. The mention of his name had been unmistakable.' The mood hung on, and quite suddenly Tyndall had asked, "'I wonder about the children. Why do you suppose it is?' One of the men laughed. "'Maybe they feed them to the bugs.' At no time during their stay on Arrol had they seen a single child, or young person under the age of about twenty-one. The crew had speculated upon this at great length, coming to the conclusion that the youngsters were kept secluded for some reason known only to the Aurelians, probably some part of their religion.' One of them had made so bold as to ask one of the scientists, who politely told him that since his group was not composed of ethnologists or theologists, but of biologists and zoologists, they were interested neither in the Aurelians, their offspring, nor their religion, but merely in the flora and fauna of the planet, both of which seemed to be rather deadly. The expedition had had several close calls in the jungle, and some of the plants seemed as violently carnivorous as the animals. It was just a few days after the incident that the Aurelians kidnapped Tyndall. It had been a simple, old-fashioned sort of job, pulled off with efficiency and dispatch as he wandered a few hundred feet away from the ship. It was late, and he had been unable to sleep, so he had strolled out for a smoke. The night watch must have been somewhere about on patrol, probably only a few hundred feet away on the other side of the ship. It happened suddenly and silently. The hand clapped over his mouth, the forearm constricting his windpipe, his legs jerked out from under him, and a rag smelling sickly sweet shoved under his nose, bringing oblivion. When he came to consciousness he found himself in this room, and he knew that since then many days and nights had passed. His wants were meticulously attended to, his bath prepared, his food brought to him regularly delicious and steaming, with the generous supply of full-bodied Arillian wine to wash it down. Fresh clothes were brought to him daily, the loose-flowing, highly ornamented robe of the Aurelian noble. Tyndall knew he was no ordinary prisoner, and somehow this fact made him doubly uneasy. And then, to-night, the ship had blasted off without him. Tyndall could easily reconstruct what had happened when his crewmates had inquired about him at the palace and in town. Tyndall? Then a sorrowful expression, a shrugging of the shoulders, a pointing towards the death-infested jungle, and a mournful shaking of the head, sign language which in any tongue meant, Tyndall wanders too far from your ship, he becomes lost, alas, he does not know our jungle and its perils. Those who spoke a little English would make some expression of sympathy. Maybe the crew was a little suspicious, maybe they thought there was something fishy about the thing and then they thought of the unhappy results of what was commonly referred to as an interplanetary incident. Ever since the people of the second planet of Alpha Centauri, in the early days of extraterrestrial exploration, had massacred an entire expedition because the captain had mortally insulted a tribal leader by refusing a sacred fruit, such incidents had been avoided at all costs. And so they dared not offend the Aurelians by questioning the veracity of their statements— 
and the jungle was deadly, so they looked a little longer and asked a few more questions. After a little while the scientists had completed their work and were anxious to get home, and so the ship blasted off without him. All this had passed kaleidoscopically in Tyndall's mind as he lay on the couch in his luxurious prison, too numb to weep or even curse. His reverie was broken by the clicking of the lock, and he raised up to see the door opening. An Aurelian servant stood there, his silver hair done up in the complicated style which denoted male house servants. He was unarmed. The houseman smiled, roared in imitation of a rocket, made a swooping gesture with one hand to indicate the departing ship, then pointed at Tyndall and at the open door. The servant bowed and departed, leaving the door slightly ajar. Now that the ship was gone, he was free to leave his room. Tyndall stepped cautiously out of the room and found himself in a long hall, with many doors opening from it on either side, much like a hotel corridor. One end of the hall seemed to open out onto a garden, and he started in that direction. The doorway opened out into a patio which overlooked a vast and perfectly tended garden. The verdant perfection of the scene was marred only by one of the bugs, sunning itself and gnawing on the stem of a flower. Tyndall was impressed again with the repulsive ugliness of the thing. This one was the size of a small adult human, and even vaguely human in outline, although the brownish armoured body was still more suggestive of a big bug than anything else known to him. There were even rudimentary wings furled close to the curving back, and the underside was a dirty striped grey. Tyndall shuddered, wondering why the Aurelians, who so loved to surround themselves with beauty, should choose so horrendous a creature as the object of their worship or protection. He heard running footsteps behind him, and turned to see the Aurelian houseman, breathless, with an expression of greatest concern on his face. The servant bowed respectfully before Tyndall, then gestured at the garden, shook his head vigorously from side to side, and tugged at the earthman's sleeve. "'Forbidden territory, eh? Okay, old fellow, what now?' The servant motioned for Tyndall to follow him, and ushered him down the hall from whence he had just come, and into another of the rooms opening off from it. The very old man, reclining upon the low, Roman-like couch, Tyndall recognised as once as his host, the Raal of Aril. The Raal touched the fingertips of both hands to his forehead in the Aurelian gesture of greeting, and Tyndall did the same. He noticed several male Aurelians standing near the back of the room, though the servant had bowed and retired. "'Well, Tyndall, how do you enjoy the hospitality of Aharil?' He, of course, gave the native pronunciation to the name, which was almost Teutonic in sound and unpronounceable for Tyndall, because of the sound given to the double aspirate, for which he knew no equivalent. "'Your English, Debral, has improved greatly since our last meeting,' commented Tyndall guardedly, using the Aurelian prefix of extreme respect. The old man smiled. "'Your friends were kind enough to lend me books, and also the little grooved discs that make voice.' He gestured towards an old-fashioned wind-up type phonograph, which Tyndall recognised at once as being standard aboard interstellar vessels, and for just such a purpose. The Raal continued— for teaching English very fine. How are you enjoying our hospitality, I ask again? Tyndall was stuck on Arrol, and he knew it. There was no need to cook his own goose by being deliberately offensive. I appreciate the hospitality of Arrol. I express my thanks for the consideration of my hosts, but if I may ask a question? Yes. What, in the wisdom of the Debral, is the reason for my, er, uh, detainment? To answer that, Tyndall, I must tell you something of the past of Aharil, and of her destiny. At these words the other Aurelians in the room drew closer, and the Raal motioned them to a couch at his feet, and nodded toward Tyndall, requesting that he join them. Tyndall noticed that the others were gazing up into the old man's face with an expression of raptness, even of reverence. He knew that the Raal did not possess an especially exalted position politically, even though he was head of the city. He guessed, therefore, that the Raal must be the religious leader of Aral as well. The Raal began, intoning the words as though he were reciting a ritual. There was a time, many thousands of Khrilas ago, when the kingdom of Aharil was not one small city as you see it now, but a mighty empire, girdling the world in her vastness. 
but the people of Ahareel had become evil in their ways, and her cities were black with sin. It was then that Sheev himself left his kingdom in paradise, and appeared to the people of Ahareel, and he told them that he was displeased, and that bad times would fall upon Ahareel, and that her people would dwindle in number, and become exceedingly few, and the jungle would reclaim her emptied cities. One city, and only one, would survive and prosper, and the people of that city would be given the chance to redeem Ahareel, and remove the heavy hand of Sheev's terrible punishment. All this came to pass, and in the dark reelers that followed, all of Ahreel vanished except this city. Now, for many thousands of reelers, the people in this city have striven to redeem Ahreel by obeying the sacred laws of Sheev. Sheev had promised that when the punishment was ended he would send a sign, and his sign would be that a great silver shell should fall from the heavens, and within should be Sheev's own emissary, who must wed the ranking priestess of Sheev, establishing again the rapport between the kingdom of Paradise and the world of Ahareel. When the Raal had finished, the other Aurelians in the room fastened the same look of reverence upon Tyndall, which they had formerly reserved for the Raal. Tyndall chose his words carefully. "'But there were many aboard my vessel. Why did you, Deb Raal, select me as the emissary of Sheev?' "'Sheev selected you. I recognised you, as of all your companions. You and you alone have the sun-coloured hair, which is the sacred colour of Sheev.' Tyndall was able to question the Raal almost coolly. The trap was already sprung, the ship was gone. Now he only wanted to know the how and the why an accident of pigmentation, only that had brought him to this sun-coloured hair. "'But, Deb Rahl, did my friends and I not often tell you of ourselves, of the place from which we came? A world, a world like your own.' The old man smiled. "'Do not think me naive, Tyndall. I am quite aware that you are but a man, a man from another world, although quite an incredible world it must be.' I know also that you were, until this hour, unaware of your destiny. I knew that when my priest reported that you ignored the ritual of the time, until literally forced to obey. That is why we had to use devious means to make certain that your companions would not prevent the fulfilment of the prophecy. Now, of course, you understand. I do not think the priestess Lyharisa will make you unhappy, Tyndall. This was not earth, and these people were not earthmen. The thought now did not bring the bitter pain it had at first, right after the ship left. Earth already was becoming hazy in Tyndall's mind, a lovely globe of green somewhere, somewhere far, and home once, a long time ago. No, the Aurelians were not Earthmen, but they were human, and an attractive, gracious race. Life would not be bad among the Aurelians, especially as the espoused of the ranking priestess of Aral. Tyndall fingered the rich material of his Aurelian robe. He thought of the food, the wine, the servants. No, he decided, not bad at all. One thing, though, this priestess, I Harissa. I have, then, but one request to make. Deb Raal, I would like to see the priestess, I Harissa. The old man almost chuckled. That is understandable, Tyndall, but it is not yet the time. Tyndall, revelling in the strength of his position, grew bolder. I would like very much, Deb Rahl, to see her now. The Rahl's face darkened. Very well, Tyndall, but I warn you, do not enter the grove. There is death there, death that even I am powerless to prevent. The guardians will not harm her, but any stranger will not live many minutes in the grove. I will not enter, Deb Rahl. Tyndall, the time is very soon, possibly this very hour. Will you not wait? I prefer not to wait, Deb Rahl. The Rahl gestured to a young Arillian. Bahil, show Tyndall to the grove of the Princess Lyharisa. The younger man protested. But Deb Rahl, so near the time, what if— Do as I command, snapped the Rahl. Bahil turned silently, motioning for Tyndall to follow. The young Arillian led Tyndall the length of the corridor back to the patio he had stepped onto by mistake earlier in the day. Behil stepped respectfully aside. Tyndall looked out into the garden. The sun was beginning to set, the long shadows stretched across the dim recesses of tropic greenery. 
The huge insect-like thing was still there, stretched out in a narrow strip of sunlight, catching the last failing waves of warmth from the sinking sun. Tyndall turned to the Arillian. Oh, "'Where might I find the Princess Lyharisa?' he asked. "'There, Deb Tyndall. "'I see no one. Where do you say?' Bahil pointed. "'There, Deb Tyndall, where I point. You see the Priestess Lyharisa taking the late afternoon sun. Unless your eyesight is exceedingly bad. Deb Tyndall, you cannot fail to see.' Tyndall's eyesight was exceedingly good. He followed that pointing finger, past the pillar that supported the roof of the patio, past the first row of alien green plants, past the second and third rows, to the clearing, to the little patch of sunlight, to the thing lying there, that monstrous misshapen bug, the bug, the priestess Lyharisa. Tyndall felt a pounding, skull-shattering madness closing in on him. It was a joke, of course. No, not a joke. A dream, then. No, not that, either. In only a few split seconds it happened. Tyndall had leapt the rail around the patio and was streaking through the grove, heading for the outer boundary. The city! If he could get out of the grove, there would be places to hide in the city. Narrow streets, empty cellars, dim, dim alleys. They'd never find him there. Run now, run, before he was overtaken. But he was not being pursued. Bahil stood still on the patio, transfixed with horror. He heard the Arillian terrified cry, Deb, Tyndall! and then a rope shot out and grabbed him by the ankles. Not a rope, really, a green something, and there were others around his arms, his chest, his hips, wrapping him in their sticky green embrace. The guardians. He tried to cry out, but one of the verdant fronds enveloped his throat so tightly he couldn't utter a sound. The innocent green things of the grove were vigilant guardians indeed. They seemed to be merely holding him immobile, but Tyndall realised with sick horror that their pressure was increasing, so little at a time, but so steadily. And something was happening out there in the sunlight, too. The creature had convulsively grasped the branch of a bush and was clinging weakly to it, great tremors racking its body. It seemed to be struggling, suffering, dying, even as he was. In his agony, Tyndall laughed. "'A time! A time!' the voice came from the patio. Tyndall saw Bahil throw himself face down on the floor, covering his eyes with his hands. He heard the cry echoed within the palace, and then, like a mighty roar, outside in the city. And then there was silence, silence broken only by the sound of his own breathing, as he dragged his tortured lungs across his shattered ribs. He saw the bug give a great heave, and then it seemed to split open, the entire skin splitting in a dozen places, and a hand— a hand reached from within that dying hulk and grasped the bush to which it clung, a white slender hand on a fragile wrist, and then the arm was free, a woman's arm, a beautiful arm. Tyndall began dimly, and too late to understand. A leg kicked free, the slender ankle, the amply fleshed thigh. Tyndall clung to consciousness doggedly. The guardian was crushing the last dregs of life out of him now, and even the pain seemed to recede. His mind was very, very clear. So that was it. A word once heard in a long-forgotten classroom, and then the scientists of the expedition. Metamorphosis. He had meant to ask them what. But he remembered now what it meant. A passing from one form into another. Had he failed a biology test once because he didn't know what metamorphosis meant? Dimly, dimly, he saw— the last thing Tyndall ever saw was the priestess Lyharisa, as she stepped out of the empty hulk, kicking it away with a disdainful toe. Breathless from her ordeal, she sank to the grass, her breasts heaving with exhaustion. She sat there for a few minutes in the sunlight, then she tossed her head and spread her long raven hair out on her shoulders, the better to dry it in the waning sun. End of Grove of the Unborn by Lynn Venable The Hour of Battle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Megan Argo. The Hour of Battle by Robert Sheckley. As one of the Guardian ships protecting Earth, the crew had a problem to solve. Just how do you protect a race from an enemy who can take over a man's mind, without seeming effort or warning? "'That hand didn't move, did it?' Edwardson asked, standing at the port, 
looking at the stars. No, Moore said. He had been staring fixedly at the Addison detector for over an hour. Now he blinked three times rapidly and looked again. Not a millimeter. I don't think it moved either, Castle added from behind the gunfire panel, and that was that. The slender black hand of the indicator rested unwaveringly on zero. The ship's guns were ready, their black mouths open to the stars. A steady hum filled the room. It came from the Atterson detector, and the sound was reassuring. It reinforced the fact that the detector was attached to all the other detectors, forming a giant network around Earth. "'Why in hell don't they come?' Edwardson asked, still looking at the stars. "'Why don't they hit?' "'Ah, shut up,' Morse said. He had a tired, glum look. High on his right temple was an old radiation burn, a sunburst of pink scar tissue. From a distance it looked like a decoration. "'I just wish they'd come,' Edwardson said. He returned from the port to his chair, bending to clear the low metal ceiling. "'Don't you wish they'd come?' Edwardson had the narrow, timid face of a mouse, but a highly intelligent mouse, one that cats did well to avoid. "'Don't you?' he repeated. The other men didn't answer. They had settled back to their dreams, staring hypnotically at the detector face. "'They've had enough time,' Edwardson said, half to himself. Castle yawned and licked his lips. "'Anyone want to play some gin?' he asked, stroking his beard. The beard was a memento of his undergraduate days. Castle maintained he could store almost fifteen minutes' worth of oxygen in its follicles, although he had never stepped into space unhelmeted to prove it. Morse looked away, and Edwardson automatically watched the indicator. This routine had been drilled into them, branded into their subconscious. They would as soon have cut their throats as leave the indicator unguarded. "'Do you think they'll come soon?' Edwardson asked, his brown rodent's eyes on the indicator. The men didn't answer him. After two months together in space, their conversational powers were exhausted. They weren't interested in Castle's undergraduate days, or in Morse's conquests. They were bored to death even with their own thoughts and dreams, bored with the attack they expected momentarily. "'Just one thing I'd like to know,' Edwardson said slipping with ease into an old conversational gambit. How far can they do it? They had talked for weeks about the enemy's telepathic range, but they always returned to it. As professional soldiers, they couldn't help but speculate on the enemy and his weapons. It was their shop talk. Well, Morse said wearily, our detector network covers the system out beyond Mars's orbit. Where we sit, Castle said watching the indicators now that the others were talking. "'They might not even know we have a detection unit working,' Morse said, as he had said a thousand times. "'Oh, stop,' Edwardson said, his thin face twisted in scorn. "'They're telepathic. They must have read every bit of stuff in Everset's mind.' "'Everset didn't know we had a detection unit,' Morse said, his eyes returning to the dial. "'He was captured before we had it.' "'Look!' Edwardson said. They ask him, Boy, what would you do if you knew a telepathic race was coming to take over the Earth? How would you guard the planet? Idle speculation, Castle said. Maybe Everset didn't think of this. He thinks like a man, doesn't he? Everyone agreed on this defence. Everset would too. Syllogistic, Castle murmured, very shaky. I sure wish he hadn't been captured, Edwardson said. It could have been worse. Morse put in, his face sadder than ever. What if they captured both of them? I wish they'd come, Edwardson said. Richard Everset and C. R. Jones had gone on the first interstellar flight. They had found an inhabited planet in the region of Vega. The rest was standard procedure. A flip of the coin had decided it. Everset went down in the scouter, maintaining radio contact with Jones in the ship. The recording of that contact was preserved for all Earth to hear. "'Just met the natives,' Everset said. "'Funny-looking bunch. Give you the physical description later.' "'Are they trying to talk to you?' Jones asked, guiding the ship in a slow spiral over the planet. 
No. Hold it. Well, I'm damned. They're telepathic. How do you like that? Great, Jones said. Go on. Hold it. Say, Jonesy, I don't know as I like these boys. They haven't got nice minds. Brother! What is it? Jones asked, lifting the ship a little higher. Minds! These bastards are power crazy. Seems they've hit all the systems round here, looking for someone to... Yeah. I've got that a bit wrong, Everset said, pleasantly. They're not so bad. Jones had a quick mind, a suspicious nature, and good reflexes. He set the accelerator for all the G's he could take, lay down on the floor, and said, Tell me more. Come on down, Everset said, in violation of every law of spaceflight. These guys are all right. As a matter of fact, they're the most marvellous... That was where the recording ended, because Jones was pinned to the floor by twenty G's of acceleration as he boosted the ship to the level needed for the sea jump. He broke three ribs getting home, but he got there. A telepathic species was on the march. What was Earth going to do about it? A lot of speculation necessarily clothed the bare bones of Jones's information. Evidently the species could take over a mind with ease— with Everset, it seemed that they had insinuated their thoughts into his, delicately altering his previous convictions. They had possessed him with remarkable ease. How about Jones? Why hadn't they taken him? Was distance a factor? Or hadn't they been prepared for the suddenness of his departure? One thing was certain. Everything Everset knew, the enemy knew. That meant that they knew where Earth was, and how defenceless the planet was to their form of attack. It could be expected that they were on their way. Something was needed to nullify their tremendous advantage. But what sort of something? What armour is there against thought? How do you dodge a wavelength? Pouch-eyed scientists gravely consulted their periodic tables. And how do you know when a man has been possessed? Although the enemy was clumsy with Everset, would they continue to be clumsy? Wouldn't they learn? Psychologists tore their hair and bewailed the absence of an absolute scale for humanity. Of course, something had to be done at once. The answer, from a technological planet, was a technological one. Build a space fleet and equip it with some sort of detection network. This was done in record time. The Atterson detector was developed, a cross between radar and the electroencephalograph. Any alteration from the typical human brainwave pattern of the occupants of a detector-equipped ship would boost the indicator around the dial. Even a bad dream or a case of indigestion would jar it. It seemed probable that any attempt to take over a human mind would disturb something. There had to be a point of interaction somewhere. That was what the Atterson detector was supposed to detect. Maybe it would. The spaceships, three men to a ship, dotted space between Earth and Mars, forming a gigantic sphere with Earth in the centre. Tens of thousands of men crouched behind gunfire panels, watching the dials on the Atterson detector. The unmoving dials. "'Do you think I could fire a couple of bursts?' Edwardson asked, his fingers on the gunfire button. "'Just to limber the guns.' "'Those guns don't need limbering,' Castle said, stroking his beard. Besides, you'd throw the whole fleet into a panic. Castle, Morse said very quietly, get your hand off your beard. Why should I? Castle asked. Because, Morse answered almost in a whisper, I am about to ram it right down your fat throat. Castle grinned and tightened his fists. Pleasure, he said. I'm tired of looking at that scar of yours. He stood up. "'Cut it,' Edwardson said wearily. "'Watch the birdie.' "'No reason to, really,' Morse said, leaning back. "'There's an alarm bell attached.' But he still looked at the dial. "'What if the bell doesn't work?' Edwardson asked. "'What if the dial is jammed? How would you like something cold slithering into your mind?' "'The dial will work,' Castle said. His eyes shifted from Edwardson's face to the motionless indicator. "'Oh, I think I'll sack in,' Edwardson said. "'Stick around,' Castle said. 
play you some gin. All right. Edwardson found and shuffled the greasy cards, while Morse took a turn glaring at the dial. I sure wish they'd come, he said. Cut, Edwardson said, handing the pack to Castle. I wonder what our friends look like, Morse said, watching the dial. Probably remarkably like us, Edwardson said, dealing the cards. Castle picked them up, one by one, slowly, as if he hoped something interesting would be under them. They should have given us another man, Castle said. We could play bridge. I don't play bridge, Edwardson said. You could learn. Why didn't we send a task force? Morse asked. Why didn't we bomb their planet? Don't be dumb, Edwardson said. We'd lose any ship we sent. Probably get them back at us, possessed and firing. Knock with nine, Castle said. I don't give a good damn if you're not with a thousand, Edwardson said gaily. How much do I owe you now? Three million five hundred eight thousand and ten dollars. I sure wish they'd come, Morse said. Want me to write a check? Take your time. Take until next week. Someone should reason with the bastards, Morse said, looking out the port. Castle immediately looked at the dial. I just thought of something, Edwardson said. Yeah? I bet it feels horrible to have your mind grabbed, Edwardson said. I bet it's awful. You'll know when it happens, Castle said. Did ever set? Probably. He just couldn't do anything about it. My mind feels fine, Castle said. But the first one of you guys starts acting queer. Watch out. They all laughed. Well, Edwardson said, I'd sure like a chance to reason with them. This is stupid. Why not? Castle asked. What, you mean go out and meet them? Sure, Castle said. We're doing no good sitting here. I should think we could do something, Edwardson said slowly. After all, they're not invincible. They're reasoning beings. Morse punched a course on the ship's tape, then looked up. You think we should contact the command, tell them what we're doing? No, Castle said, and Edwardson nodded in agreement. Red tape. We'll just go out and see what we can do. If they won't talk, we'll blast them out of space. Look! Out of the port they could see the red flare of a reaction engine, the next ship in their sector speeding forward. They must have got the same idea, Edwardson said. Let's get there first. Castle said. Morse shoved the accelerator in, and they were thrown back in their seats. That dial hasn't moved yet, has it? Edwardson asked, over the clamour of the detector alarm bell. Not to move out of it, Castle said, looking at the dial with its indicator slammed all the way over to the highest notch. End of the Hour of Battle by Robert Sheckley Read by Megan Argo The Man from Time by Frank Biltknap Long. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Norman Ilfer. The Man from Time by Frank Biltknap Long. Daring Moonson, he was called. It was a proud name, a brave name. But what good was a name that rang out like a summons to battle if the man who bore it could not repeat it aloud without fear? Moonson had tried telling himself that a man could conquer fear if he could but once summon the courage to laugh at all the sins that ever were, and do as he damned well pleased. An ancient phrase that, damned well, it went clear back to the Elizabethan age, and Moonson had tried picturing himself as an Elizabethan man with a ruffle at his throat and a rapier in his clasp, brawling lustily in a tavern. In the Elizabethan age, men had thrown caution to the winds and lived with their whole bodies, not just with their minds alone. Perhaps that was why, even in the year 3689, defiant names still cropped up. Names like Independence Forest and Man Live Forever. 
It was not easy for a man to live up to a name like Man Live Forever, but Moonson was ready to believe that it could be done. There was something in human nature that made a man abandon caution and try to live up to the claims made for him by his parents at birth. It must be bad, Moonson thought. It must be bad if I can't control the trembling of my hands, the pounding of the blood in my temples. I am like a child shut up alone in the dark, hearing rats scurrying in a closet thick with cobwebs, and the tapping of a blind man's cane on a deserted street at midnight. Tap, 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 nearer and nearer through the darkness. How soon would the rats be swarming out, blood-fanged and wholly vicious? How soon would the cane strike? He looked up quickly, his eyes searching the shadows. For almost a month now, the gleaming intricacies of the machine had given him a complete sense of security. As a scholar traveling in time, he had been accepted by his fellow travelers as a man of great courage and firm determination. For twenty-seven days, a smooth surface of shining metal had walled him in, enabling him to grapple with reality on a completely adult level. For twenty-seven days, he had gone pridefully back through time, taking creative delight in watching the heritage of the human race unroll before him like a cinemascope under glass. Watching a green land in the dying golden sunlight of an age lost to human memory could restore a man's strength of purpose by its serenity alone, and even an age of war and pestilence could be observed without torment from behind the protective shields of the time machine. Danger, accidents, catastrophe could not touch him personally. To watch death and destruction as a spectator in a traveling time observatory was like watching a cobra poised to strike from behind a pane of crystal bright glass in a zoological garden. You got a tremendous thrill just thinking about it. How dreadful if the glass should not be there. How lucky I am to be alive with a thing so deadly and monstrous within striking distance of me. For twenty-seven days now he had traveled without fear. Sometimes the time observatory would pinpoint an age and hover over it while his companions took painstaking historical notes. Sometimes it would retrace its course and circle back. A new age would come under scrutiny and more notes would be taken. But a horrible thing had happened to him, had awakened in him a lonely nightmare of restlessness, childhood fears he had thought buried forever had returned to plague him, and he had developed a sudden, terrible dread of the fogginess outside the moving viewpane, the way the machine itself wheeled and dipped when an ancient ruin came sweeping toward him. He had developed a fear of time. There was no escape from that time fear. The instant it came upon him, he lost all interest in historical research. 1069, 732, 2407, 1928. Every date terrified him. The Black Plague in London, the Great Fire, the Spanish Armada in flames off the coast of a bleak little island that would soon mold the destiny of half the world. How meaningless it all seemed in the shadow of his fear. Had the human race really advanced so much? Time had been conquered, but no man was yet wise enough to heal himself if a stark, unreasoning fear took possession of his mind and heart, giving him no peace. Moonsun lowered his eyes, saw that Rutella was watching him in the manner of a shy woman, not wishing to break in too abruptly on the thoughts of a stranger. Deep within him, he knew that he had become a stranger to his own wife, and the realization sharply increased his torment. He stared down at her head against his knee, at her beautiful back and sleek dark hair. Violet eyes she had, not black as they seemed at first glance, but a deep lustrous violet. He remembered suddenly that he was still a young man, with a young man's ardor surging strong in him. He bent swiftly, kissed her lips and eyes. As he did so, her arms tightened about him, until he found himself wondering what he could have done to deserve such a woman. She had never seemed more precious to him, and for an instant he could feel his fear lessening a little. But it came back and it was worse than before. It was like an old pain, returning at an unexpected moment to chill a man with a sickening reminder that all joy must end. His decision to act was made quickly. The first step was the most difficult, but with a deliberate effort of will he accomplished it to his satisfaction. His secret thoughts he buried beneath a conscious mental preoccupation with the vain and the trivial. 
it was important to the success of his plan that his companions should suspect nothing. The second step was less difficult. The mental block remained firm, and he succeeded in carrying on actual preparations for his departure in complete secrecy. The third step was the final, and it took him from a large compartment to a small one, from a high arcing surface of metal to the maze of intricate control mechanisms in a space so narrow that he had to crouch to work with accuracy. Swiftly and competently, his fingers moved over instruments of science which only a completely sane man would have known how to manipulate. It was an acid test of his sanity, and he knew as he worked that his reasoning faculties, at least, had suffered no impairment. Beneath his hands, the time observatory's controls were solid shafts of metal, but suddenly, as he worked, he found himself thinking of them as fluid abstractions, each a milestone in man's long progress from the jungle to the stars, time and space, mass and velocity. How incredible that he had taken centuries of patient technological research to master, in a practical way, the tremendous implications of Einstein's original postulate. Warp space with a rapidly moving object, move away from the observer with the speed of light, and the whole of human history assumed the firm contours of a landscape in space. Space and time merged and became one, and a man in an intricately equipped time observatory could revisit the past as easily as he could travel across the great curve of the universe to the farthest planet of the farthest star. The controls were suddenly firm in his hands. He knew precisely what adjustments to make. The iris of the human eye dilates and contracts with every shift of illumination. The time observatory had an iris too. That iris could be opened without endangering his companions in the least, if he took care to widen it just enough to accommodate only one sturdily built man of medium height. Sweat came out in great beads on his forehead as he worked. The light that came through the machine's iris was faint at first, the barest glimmer of white in deep darkness. But as he adjusted controls, the light grew brighter and brighter, beating in upon him until he was kneeling in a circle of radiance that dazzled his eyes and set his heart to pounding. I've lived too long with fear, he thought. I've lived like a man imprisoned, shut away from the sunlight. Now, when freedom beckons, I must act quickly, or I shall be powerless to act at all. He stood erect, took a slow step forward, his eyes squeezed shut. Another step, another. And suddenly he knew he was at the gateway to time's sure knowledge, in actual contact with the past, for his ears were now assailed by the high confusion of ancient sounds and voices. He left the time machine in a flying leap, one arm before his face. He tried to keep his eyes covered as the ground seemed to rise to meet him. But he lurched in an agony of unbalance and opened his eyes to see the green surface beneath him flashing like a suddenly uncovered jewel. He remained on his feet just long enough to see his time observatory dim and vanish. Then his knees gave way and he collapsed with a despairing cry as the fear enveloped him. There were daisies in the field where he lay, his shoulders and naked chest pressed to the earth. A gentle wind stirred the grass, and the flute-like warble of a songbird was repeated close to his ear, over and over, with a tireless persistence. Abruptly he sat up and stared about him. Running parallel to the field was a winding country road, and down it came a yellow and silver vehicle on wheels. Its entire upper section encased in glass, which mirrored the autumnal landscape with a startling clearness. The vehicle halted directly in front of him and a man with ruddy cheeks and snow-white hair leaned out to wave at him. "'Good morning, mister,' the man shouted. "'Can I give you a lift into town?' Moonson rose unsteadily, alarm and suspicion in his stare. Very cautiously he lowered the mental barrier, and the man's thoughts impinged on his mind in bewildering confusion. "'He's not a farmer, that's sure. Must have been swimming in the creek. But those bathing trunks he's wearing are out of this world. Huh.' I wouldn't have the nerve to parade around in trunks like that, even on a public beach. Probably an exhibitionist. But why should he wear them out here in the woods? No blondes or redheads to knock silly out here. Huh. He might have the courtesy to answer me. Well, if he doesn't want to lift into town, that's no concern of mine. Moonson stood watching the vehicle sweep away out of sight. Obviously, he had angered the man by his silence. But he could answer only by shaking his head. He began to walk pausing an instant in the middle of the bridge 
to stare down at a stream of water that rippled in the sunlight over moss-covered rocks. Tiny silver fish darted to and fro beneath a tumbling waterfall, and he felt calmed and reassured by the sight. Shoulders erect now, he walked on. It was high noon when he reached the tavern. He went inside, saw men and women dancing in a dim light, and there was a huge rainbow-colored musical instrument by the door, which startled him by its resonance. The music was wild, weird, a little terrifying. He sat down at a table near the door and searched the minds of the dancers for a clue to the meaning of what he saw. The thoughts which came to him were startlingly primitive, direct, and sometimes meaningless to him. Go easy, baby. Swing it. Sure, we're in the groove now. But you never can tell. I'll buy you an orchid, honey. Not roses. Just one orchid. Black like your hair. Ever see a black orchid, hon? They're rare and they're expensive. Oh, Darl, Darl, hold me closer. The music goes round and round. It will always be like this with us, honey. Don't ever be a square. That's all I ask. Don't ever be a square. Cuddle up to me. Let yourself go. When you're dancing with one girl, you should never look at another. Don't you know that, Johnny? Sure, I know it, Darl. But did I ever claim I wasn't human? Darl, Darl. Doll, baby, look all you want to, but if you ever dare. Moonsun found himself relaxing a little. Dancing at all ages was closely allied to lovemaking. But it was pursued here with a careless rapture, which he found creatively stimulating. The people came here not only to dance, but to eat, and the thoughts of the dancers implied that there was nothing stylized about a tavern. The ritual was a completely natural one. In Egyptian bas reliefs, you saw the opposite in dancing. Every movement rigidly prescribed, arms held rigid and sharply bent at the elbows. Slow movements rather than lively ones. A bowing and a scraping with bowls of fruit extended in gift offerings at every turn. There was obviously no enthroned authority here, no bejeweled king to pacify when emotions ran wild but complete freedom to embrace joy with corybantic abandon. A tall man, in ill-fitting black clothes, approached Moonsun's table, interrupting his reflections with thoughts that seemed designed to disturb and distract him out of sheer perversity. So even here there were flies in every ointment, and no dream of perfection could remain unchallenged. He sat unmoving, absorbing the man's thoughts. What does he think this is, a bathhouse? Mike says it's okay to serve them if they come in from the beach just as they are. But just one quick beer, no more. This late in the season, you'd think they'd have the decency to get dressed. The sepulchrally dressed man gave the table a brush with a cloth he carried, then thrust his head forward like an ill-tempered scavenger bird. Can't serve you anything here but beer. Boss's orders, okay? Moonsun nodded and the man went away. Then he turned on watching the girl. She was frightened. She sat all alone, plucking nervously at the red and white checkered tablecloth. She sat with her back to the light, bunching the cloth up into little folds, then smoothing it out again. She'd ground out lipstick-smudged cigarettes until the ashtray was spilling over. Moonsun began to watch the fear in her mind. Her fear grew when she thought that Mike wasn't gone for good. The phone call wouldn't take long, and he'd be coming back any minute now and Mike wouldn't be satisfied until she was broken into little bits. Yes, Mike wanted to see her on her knees, begging him to kill her. Kill me, but don't hurt Joe. It wasn't his fault. He's just a kid. He's not 20 yet, Mike. That would be a lie, but Mike had no way of knowing that Joe would be 22 on his next birthday, although he looked 18 at most. There is no pity in Mike. But would his pride let him hot-rod an 18-year-old? Mike won't care. Mike won't care. Mike will kill him anyway. Joe couldn't help falling in love with me, but Mike won't care what Joe could help. Mike was never young himself, never a sweet kid like Joe. Mike killed a man when he was 14 years old. He spent seven years in a reformatory, and the kids there were never young. Joe will be just one of those kids to Mike. Her fear kept growing. You couldn't fight men like Mike. Mike was strong in too many different ways. 
when you ran a tavern with an upstairs room for special customers, you had to be tough, strong. You sat in an office, and when people came to you begging for favors, you just laughed. Ten grand isn't hay, buddy. My wheels aren't rigged. If you think they are, get out. It's your funeral. It's your funeral, Mike would say, laughing until tears came into his eyes. You couldn't fight that kind of strength. Mike could push his knuckles hard into the faces of people who owed him money, and he'd never even be arrested. Mike could take money, crisp and new, out of his wallet, spread it out like a fan, say to any girl crazy enough to give him a second glance, I'm interested in you, honey. Get rid of him and come over to my table. He could say worse things to girls too decent and self-respecting to look at him at all. You could be so cold and hard nothing could ever hurt you. You could be Mike... Gallant. How could she have ever loved such a man? And dragged Joe into it, a good kid who had made only one really bad mistake in his life, the mistake of asking her to marry him. She shivered with a chill of his self-loathing and turned her eyes hesitantly toward the man in bathing trunks who sat alone by the door. For a moment she met the big man's eyes and her fears seemed to fade away. She stared at him, sunburned, almost black, Muscles like a lifeguard, all alone and not on the make. When he returned her stare, his eyes sparkled with friendly interest, but no suggestive, flirtatious intent. He was too rugged to be really handsome, she thought, but he wouldn't have to start digging in his wallet to get a girl to change tables, either. Guiltily, she remembered Joe. Now it could only be Joe. Then she saw Joe enter the room. He was deathly pale, and he was coming straight toward her between the tables. Without pausing to weigh his chances of staying alive, he passed a man and woman who relished Mike's company enough to make them eager to act ugly for a daily handout. They would not look up at Joe as he passed, but the man's lips curled in a sneer, and the woman whispered something that appeared to fan the flames of her companion's malice. Mike had friends. Friends who would never rat on him while their police records remained in Mike's safe, and they could count on him for protection. She started to rise, to go to Joe and warn him that Mike would be coming back, but despair flooded her, and the impulse died. The way Joe felt about her was a thing too big to stop. Joe saw her slim against the light, and his thoughts were like the sea surge, wild, unruly. Maybe Mike will get me. Maybe I'll be dead by this time tomorrow. Maybe I'm crazy to love her the way I do. Her hair against the light, a tumbled mass of spun gold. Always a woman bothering me for as long as I can remember. Molly, Ann, Janice. Some were good for me and some were bad. You see a woman on the street walking ahead of you, hips swaying, and you think, I don't even know her name, but I'd like to crush her in my arms. I guess every guy feels like that about every pretty woman he sees. Even about some that aren't so pretty. But then you get to know and like a woman, and you don't feel that way so much. You respect her, and you don't let yourself feel that way. Then something happens. You love her so much it's like the first time again, but with a whole lot added. You love her so much you'd die to make her happy. Joe was shaking when he slipped into the chair left vacant by Mike, and reached out for both her hands. I'm taking you away tonight, he said. You're coming with me. Joe was scared, she knew, but he didn't want her to know. His hands were like ice, and his fear blended with her own fear as their hands met. He'll kill you, Joe. You've got to forget me, she sobbed. I'm not afraid of him. I'm stronger than you think. He won't dare come at me with a gun. Not here before all these people. If he comes at me with his fists, I'll hook a solid left to his jaw that will stretch him out cold. She knew he wasn't deceiving himself. Joe didn't want to die any more than she did. The man from time had an impulse to get up, walk over to the two frightened children, and comfort them with a reassuring smile. He sat watching, feeling their fear beating in tumultuous waves into his brain. Fear in the minds of a boy and girl because they desperately wanted one another. He looked steadily at them, and his eyes spoke to them. Life is greater than you know. If you could travel in time and see how great is man's courage, if you could see all of his triumphs over despair and grief and pain, you would know that there is nothing to fear, nothing at all. Joe rose from the table, suddenly calm, quiet. 
Come on, he said quietly. We're getting out of here right now. My car is outside, and if Mike tries to stop us, I'll fix him. The boy and the girl walked toward the door together. A young and extremely pretty girl and a boy suddenly grown to the full stature of a man. Rather regretfully, Moonson watched them go. As they reached the door, the girl turned and smiled, and the boy paused too, and they both smiled suddenly at the man in the bathing trunks. Then they were gone. Moonson got up as they disappeared, left the tavern. It was dark when he reached the cabin. He was dog-tired, and when he saw the seated man through the lighted windows, a great longing for companionship came upon him. He forgot that he couldn't talk to the man, forgot the language difficulty completely. But before this insurmountable element occurred to him, he was inside the cabin. Once there, he saw the problem solved itself. The man was a writer, and he had been drinking steadily for hours. So the man did all the talking, not wanting or waiting for an answer. A youngish, handsome man he was, with graying temples and keenly observant eyes. The instant he saw Moonsun, he started to talk. Welcome, stranger, he said. Been taking a dip in the ocean, eh? Can't say I'd enjoy it this late in the season. Moonsun was afraid at first that his silence might discourage the writer, but he didn't know writers. It's good to have someone to talk to, the writer went on. I've been sitting here all day trying to write. I'll tell you something you may not know. You can go to the finest hotels and you can open case after case of the finest wine and you still can't get started sometimes. The writer's face seemed suddenly to age. Fear came into his eyes and he raised the bottle to his lips, faced away from his guest as he drank, as if ashamed of what he must do to escape despair every time he faced his fear. He was trying to write himself back into fame. His greatest moment had come years before, when his golden pen had glorified a generation of madcaps. For one deathless moment his genius had carried him to the heights, and in a white blaze of publicity had given him a halo of glory. Later had come lean and bitter years, until finally his reputation dwindled like a gutted candle in a wintry room at midnight. He could still write, but now fear and remorse walked with him and would give him no peace. He was cruelly afraid most of the time. Moonsun listened to the writer's thoughts in heart-stricken silence. Thoughts so tragic they seemed out of keeping with the natural and beautiful rhythms of his speech. He had never imagined that a sensitive and imaginative man, an artist, could be so completely abandoned by the society his genius had helped to enrich. Back and forth the writer paced, bearing his innermost thoughts. His wife was desperately ill, and the future looked completely black. How could he summon the strength of will to go on, let alone to write? He said fiercely, It's all right for you to talk. He stopped, seeming to realize for the first time that the big man sitting in an easy chair by the window had made no attempt to speak. It seemed incredible, but the big man had listened in complete silence, and with such quiet assurance that his silence had taken on an eloquence that inspired absolute trust. He had always known there were few people like that in the world, people whose sympathy and understanding you could take for granted. There was a fearlessness in such people, which made them stand out from the crowd, stone markers in a desert waste to lend assurance to a tired wayfarer by its sturdy permanence, its sun-mirroring strength. There were a few people like that in the world, but you sometimes went a lifetime without meeting one. The big man sat there smiling at him, calmly exuding the serenity of one who had seen life from its tangled, inaccessible roots outward, and testifies from experience that the entire growth is sound. The writer stopped pacing suddenly and drew himself erect. As he stared into the big man's eyes, his fears seemed to fade away. Confidence returned to him like the surge of the sea in great shining waves of creativeness. He knew suddenly that he could lose himself in his work again, could tap the bright resonant bell of his genius until its golden voice rang out through eternity. He had another great book in him, and it would get written now. It would get written. You've helped me, he almost shouted. You've helped me more than you know. I can't tell you how grateful I am to you. You don't know what it means to be so paralyzed with fright that you can't write at all. The man from time was silent, but his eyes shone curiously. The writer turned to a bookcase and removed a volume in a faded cover that had once been bright with rainbow colors. He sat down and wrote an inscription in the flyleaf. 
Then he rose and handed the book to his visitor with a slight bow. He was smiling now. This was my firstborn, he said. The man from time looked at the title first. This side of paradise. Then he opened the book and read what the author had written on the flyleaf. With warm gratefulness for a courage which brought back the sun. F. Scott Fitzgerald. Moonson bowed his thanks, turned, and left the cabin. Morning found him walking across fresh meadows, with the dew glistening on his bare head and broad straight shoulders. They'd never find him, he told himself hopelessly. They'd never find him because time was too vast to pinpoint one man in such a vast waste of years. The towering crests of each age might be visible, but there could be no returning to one tiny insignificant spot in the mighty ocean of time. As he walked, his eyes searched for the field and the winding road he'd followed into town. Only yesterday this road seemed to beckon, and he had followed, eager to explore an age so primitive that mental communication from mind to mind had not yet replaced human speech. Now he knew that the speech faculty, which man had long outgrown, would never cease to act as a barrier between him and the men and women of this era of the past. Without it, he could not hope to find complete understanding and sympathy here. He was still alone, and soon winter would come, and the sky grow cold and empty. The time machine materialized so suddenly before him that for an instant his mind refused to accept it as more than a torturing illusion conjured by the turbulence of his thoughts. All at once it towered in his path, bright and shining, and he moved forward over the dew-drenched grass until he was brought up short by a joy so overwhelming that it seemed to him that his heart must burst. Rutella emerged from the machine with a gay little laugh, as if his stunned expression was the most amusing in the world. Hold still and let me kiss you, darling, her mind said to his. She stood in the dew-bright grass on tiptoe, her sleek dark hair falling to her shoulders, an extraordinarily pretty girl to be the wife of a man so tormented. You found me, his thoughts exalted. You came back alone and searched until you found me. She nodded, her eyes shining. So time wasn't too vast to pinpoint after all, not when two people were so securely wedded in mind and heart that their thoughts could build a bridge across time. The Bureau of Emotional Adjustment analyzed everything I told them. Your psychograph ran to 57 pages, but it was your desperate loneliness that guided me to you. She raised his hand to her lips and kissed it. You see, darling, a compulsive fear isn't easy to conquer. No man or woman can conquer it alone. Historians tell us, when the first passenger rocket started for Mars, space fear took men by surprise in the same way your fear gripped you. The loneliness, the utter desolation of space, was too much for a human mind to endure. She smiled her love. We're going back. We'll face it together and we'll conquer it together. You won't be alone now. Darling, don't you see? It's because you aren't a clod, because you're sensitive and imaginative that you experience fear. It's not anything to be ashamed of. You were simply the first man on earth to develop a new and completely different kind of fear. Time fear. Moonson put out his hand and gently touched his wife's hair. Ascending into the time observatory, a thought came unbidden to his mind. Others he saved, himself he could not save. But that wasn't true at all now. He could help himself now. He would never be alone again. When guided by the sure hand of love and complete trust, self-knowledge could be a shining weapon. The trip back might be difficult, but holding tight to his wife's hand, he felt no misgivings, no fear. End of The Man from Time by Frank Belknap Long The Meteor Girl by Jack Williamson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Greg Marguerite. The Meteor Girl by Jack Williamson. What's the good in Einstein, anyhow? I shot the question at lean young Charlie King. In a moment he looked up at me. 
I thought there was pain in the back of his clear brown eyes, lips closed in a thin white line across his wind-tanned face. Nervously he tapped his pipe on the metal cowling of the Golden Gull's cockpit. I know that space-time is curved, and that there's really no space or time, but only space-time, that electricity and gravitation and magnetism are all the same. But how is that going to pay my grocery bill? Or yours? That's what Virginia wants to know. Virginia Randall? I was astonished. Why, I thought— I know. We've been engaged a year. But she's called it off. Charlie looked into my eyes for a long minute, his lips still compressed. We were leaning on the freshly painted streamlined fuselage of the Golden Gull, as neat a little amphibian monoplane as ever made three hundred miles an hour. She stood on the glittering white sands of our private landing field on the eastern Florida coast. Below us the green Atlantic was running in white foam on the rocks. In the year that Charlie King and I had been out of the Institute of Technology, we had built the nucleus of a commercial airplane business. We had designed and built here in our own shops several very successful seaplanes and amphibians. Charlie's brilliant mathematical mind was of the greatest aid, except when he was too far lost in his abstruse speculations to descend to things commercial. Mathematics is painful enough to me when it is used in calculating the camber of an airplane wing, and pure mathematics, such as the theories of relativity and equivalence, I simply abhor. I was amazed. Virginia Randall was a girl, trim and beautiful as our shining golden gull. I had thought them devotedly in love, and had been looking forward to the wedding. But it isn't two weeks since Virginia was out here. You took her up in our western gull four. Nervously Charlie lit his pipe, drew quickly on it. His face lean and drawn beneath the flying goggles pushed up on his forehead sought mine anxiously. I know. I drove her back to the station. That was when, when we quarreled. But why? About Einstein? That's silly. She wanted me to give it up here and go in with her father in his Wall Street brokerage business. The old gent is willing to take me and make a businessman of me. Why, I couldn't run the business without you, Charlie. We talked about that, Hammond. I don't really do much of the work. Just play around with the mathematics and leave the models and blueprints to you. Ah, uh, Charlie, that's not quite— It's the truth, right enough, he said bitterly. You design aircraft and I play with Einstein. And, as you say, a fellow can't eat equations. I'd hate to see you go. And I'd hate to give you up, and our business, and the math. Really, no need of it. My tastes are simple enough. And old ironclad Randall has made all one family needs. Virginia's not exactly a pauper herself. Two or three millions, I think. And where did Virginia go? She took the Valhalla yesterday at San Francisco, going to join her father at Panama. He cruises about the world in his steam yacht, you know, and runs Wall Street by radio. I was to telegraph her if I'd changed my mind. I decided to stick to you, Hammond. I telegraphed a corsage of orchids and sent her the message, Einstein forever. If I know Virginia, those were not very politic words. Well, a man— his words were cut short by a very unusual incident. A thin, high scream came suddenly from above our neat stuccoed hangars at the edge of the white field. I looked up quickly to catch a glimpse of a bright object hurtling through the air above our heads. The bellowing scream ended abruptly in a thunderous crash. I felt a tremor of the ground underfoot. What? I ejaculated. Look! cried Charlie. He pointed. I looked over the gleaming metal wing of the Golden Gull to see a huge cloud of white sand rising like a fountain at the farther side of the level field. Deliberately the column of debris rose, spread, rained down, leaving a gaping crater in the earth. Something fell? It sounded like a shell from a big gun, except that it didn't explode. Let's get over and see. We ran to where the thing had struck, three hundred yards across the field. We found a great funnel-shaped pit torn in the naked earth. It was a dozen yards across, fifteen feet deep, and surrounded with a powdery ring of white sand and pulverized rock. Something like a shell hole, I observed. I've got it, Charlie cried. It was a meteor. A meteor? So big? Yes. 
Luckily for us it was no bigger. If it had been like the one that fell in Siberia a few years ago, or the one that made the Winslow Crater in Arizona, we wouldn't have been talking about it. Probably we have a chunk of nickel-iron alloy here. I'll get some of the men out here with digging tools and we'll see what we can find." Our mechanics were already hurrying across the field. I shouted at them to bring picks and shovels. In a few minutes five of us were at work throwing sand and shattered rock out of the pit. Suddenly I noticed a curious thing. A pale bluish mist hung in the bottom of the pit. It was easily transparent, no denser than tobacco smoke. Passing my spade through it did not seem to disturb it in the least. I rubbed my eyes doubtfully, said to Charlie, Do you see a sort of blue haze in the pit? He peered. No. No. W yes, yes, I do. Funny thing. Uh, kind of a blue fog, and the tools cut right through it without moving it. Queer. Must have something to do with the meteor. He was very excited. We dug more eagerly. An hour later we had opened the hole to a depth of twenty feet. Our shovels were clanging on the gray iron of the rock from space. The mist had grown thicker as the excavation deepened. We looked at the stone through a screen of motionless blue fog. We had found the meteor. There were several queer things about it. The first man who touched it, a big Swede mechanic named Olsen, was knocked cold as if by a nasty jolt of electricity. It took half an hour to bring him to consciousness. As fast as the rugged iron side of the meteorite was uncovered, a white crust of frost formed over it. It was as cold as outer space, nearly at the absolute zero, Charlie explained, and it was heated only superficially during its quick passage through the air. But how it comes to be charged with electricity, I, I can't say. He hurried up to his laboratory behind the hangars, where he had equipment ranging from an astronomical telescope to a delicate seismograph. He brought back as much electrical equipment as he could carry. He had me touch an insulated wire to the frost-covered stone from space, while he put the other end to one post of a galvanometer. I think he got a current that wrecked the instrument. At any rate, he grew very much excited. "'Something queer about that stone!' he cried. This is the chance of a lifetime. I don't know that a meteor has ever been scientifically examined so soon after falling." He hurried us all across to the laboratory. We came back with a truckload of coils and tubes and batteries and potentiometers and other assorted equipment. He had men with heavy rubber gloves lift the frost-covered stone to a packing box on a bench. The thing was irregular in shape, about a foot long. It must have weighed two hundred pounds. He sent a man racing on a motorcycle to the drugstore to get dry ice, solidified carbon dioxide, to keep the iron stone at its low temperature. In a few hours he had a complete laboratory set up around the meteorite. He worked feverishly in the hot sunshine, reading the various instruments he had set up and arranging more. He contrived to keep the stone cold by packing it in a box of dry ice. The mechanics stopped for dinner, and I tried to get him to take time to eat. No, Hammond he said. This is something big. We were talking about Einstein. This rock seems energized with a new kind of force. All meteors are probably the same way when they first plunge out of space. I think this will be to relativity what the falling apple is to gravity. This is a big thing." He looked up at me, brown eyes flashing. This is my chance to make a name, Hammond. If I do something big enough, Virginia might reconsider her option. Charlie worked steadily through the long, hot afternoon. I spent most of the time helping him, or gazing in fascination at the curious haze of luminous blue mist that hung like a sphere of azure fog about the meteoric stone. I did not completely understand what he did. The reader who wants the details may consult the monograph he is preparing for the scientific press. He had the men string up a line from our direct current generator in the shops to supply power for his electrical instruments. He mounted a powerful electromagnet just below the meteorite and set up an X-ray tube to bombard it with rays. Night came, and the fire of the white sun faded from the sky. In the darkness the curious haze about the stone became luminescent, distinct, a dim, motionless sphere of blue light. I fancied that I saw grotesque shapes flashing through it. A ball of blue fire, shimmering and ghost-like, shrouded the instruments. Charlie's induction coil buzzed wickedly, with purple fire playing about the terminals. The X-ray tube flickered with a greenish glow. 
He manipulated the rheostat that controlled the current through the electromagnet and continued to read his instruments. Look at that! he cried. The bluish haze about the stone grew brighter. It became a ball of sapphire flame, five feet thick, bright and motionless. A great sphere of shimmering azure fire. Wisps of pale, sparkling bluish mist ringed it. The stone in its box, the X-ray bulb, and other apparatus were hidden. The end of the table stuck oddly from the ball of light. I heard Charlie move a switch. The hum of the coils changed a note. The ball of blue fire vanished abruptly. It became a hole, a window in space. Through it we saw another world. The darkness of the night hung about us. Where the ball had been was a circle of misty blue flame five feet across. Through that circle I could see a vast expanse of blue ocean running in high white-capped rollers beneath a sky overcast with low gray clouds. It was no flat picture like a movie screen. The scene had vast depth. I knew that we were really looking over an infinite expanse of stormy ocean. It was all perfectly clear, distinct, real. Astounded, I turned to find Charlie standing back and looking into the ring of blue fire with a curious mixture of surprise and delighted satisfaction. What? What? I gasped. It's amazing! Wonderful! More than I had dared hope for, the complete vindication of my theory. If Virginia cares for scientific reputation... But what is it? It's hard to explain without mathematical language. You might say that we are looking through a hole in space. The new force in the meteorite, amplified by the X-rays and the magnetic field, is causing a distortion of space-time coordinates. You know that a gravitational field bends light. The light of a star is deflected in passing the sun. The field of this meteorite bends light through space-time, through the four-dimensional continuum. That scrap of ocean we can see may be on the other side of the Earth. I walked around the circle of luminous smoke with the marvelous picture in the center. It seemed that the window swung with me. I surveyed the whole angry surface of that slate-gray storm-beaten sea to the misty horizon. Nowhere was it broken by land or ship. Charlie fell to adjusting his rheostat and switches. It seemed that the gray ocean moved swiftly beyond that window. Vast stretches of it raced below our eyes. Faint black stains of steamer smoke appeared against the blue-gray horizon and swept past. Then land appeared, a long green-gray line. We had a flash of a long coast that unreeled in endless panorama before us. It was such a view as one might get from a swift airplane, a plane flying thousands of miles per hour. The Golden Gate flashed before us, with the familiar skyline of San Francisco rising on the hills behind it. San Francisco! Charlie cried. This is the Pacific we've been seeing. Let's find the Valhalla. We might be able to see Virginia. The coastline vanished as he manipulated his instruments. Staring into the circle of shining blue mist, I saw the endless ocean racing below us again. We picked up a pleasure yacht running under bare poles. I didn't know there was such a storm on, Charlie murmured. Other vessels swam past below us, laboring against heavy seas. Then we looked upon an ocean whipped into mighty white-crowned waves. Rain beat down in sheets from low, dense clouds. Vivid violet lightnings flashed before us. It seemed very strange to see such lightning and hear not the faintest whisper of thunder, but no sound came from anything we saw through the blue-rimmed window in space. "'I hope the Valhalla isn't in weather like this,' cried Charlie. In a few minutes a dark form loomed through the wind-riven mist. Swiftly it swam nearer, became a black ship. Only a tramp, Charlie said, breathing a sigh of relief. It was a dingy tramp steamer, her superstructure wrecked, her fires seemed dead. She lay across the wind, rolling sluggishly, threatening to sink with every monstrous wave. We saw no living person aboard her. She seemed a sinking derelict. We made out the name Roma on her side. Charlie moved his dials again. In a few minutes the slender prow of another great steamer came through the sheets of rain. It was evidently a passenger vessel. She seemed limping along, half-wrecked, with mighty waves breaking over her rail. Charlie grew white with alarm. The Valhalla! he gasped. And she's headed straight for that wreck! 
In a moment, as he brought the liner closer below our blue-rimmed window, I too made out the name. The wet, glistening decks were almost deserted. Here and there a man struggled futilely against the force of the storm. In a few minutes the drifting wreck of the Roma came into our view, dead ahead of the limping liner. Through the mist and falling rain the derelict could not have been in sight of the lookout of the passenger vessel until she was almost upon it. We saw the white burst of steam as the siren was blown. We watched the desperate effort of the liner to check her way, to come about, but it was too much for the already crippled ship. Charlie cried out as a mighty wave drove the Valhalla down upon the sluggishly drifting wreck. All the mad scene that ensued was strangely silent. We heard no crash when the collision occurred, heard no screams or shouts while the mob of desperate white-faced passengers were fighting their way to the deck. The vain struggle to launch the boats was like a silent movie. One boat was splintered while being lowered. Another, already filled with passengers, was lifted by a great wear and crushed against the side of the ship. Only shivered wood and red foam were left. The ship listed so rapidly that the boats on the lee side were useless. It was impossible to launch the others in that terrible lashing sea. "'Virginia can swim,' Charlie said, hopefully. "'You know, she tried the channel last year and nearly made it, too.' He stopped to watch that terrible scene in white-faced, anxious silence. The tramp went down before the steamer, drawing fragments of wrecked boats after it. The liner was evidently sinking rapidly. We saw dozens of hopeless, panic-stricken passengers diving off the lee side, trying to swim off far enough to avoid the tremendous suction. Then with a curious deliberation the bow of the Valhalla dipped under the green water. Her stern rose in the air until the ship stood almost perpendicular. She slipped quickly down, out of sight. Only a few swimming humans and the wrecks of a few boats were left on the rough gray sea. Charlie fumbled nervously with the dials, trying to get the scene near enough so that he could see the identity of the struggling swimmers. A long boat, which must have been swept below by the suction of the ship, came plunging above the surface upside down. It drifted swiftly among the swimmers who struggled to reach it. I saw one person, evidently a girl, grasp it and drag herself upon it. It swept on past the few others still struggling. The wrecked boat with the girl upon it seemed coming swiftly toward our blue-rimmed window. In a few minutes I saw something familiar about her. "'It's Virginia!' Charlie cried. "'God! We've got to save her somehow!' The long rollers drove the overturned boat swiftly along. Virginia Randall clung desperately to it, deluged in foam, whipped with flying spray, the wild wind tearing at her. About us the clear, still night was deepening. The air was warm and still, the hot stars shone steadily. Quiet, lighted houses were in sight above the beach. It was very strange to look through the fire-rimmed circle to see a girl struggling for life, clinging to a wrecked boat in a stormy sea. Charlie watched in an apathy of grief and horror, trembling and speechless, doing nothing except moving the controls to keep the floating girl in our sight. Hours went by as we watched. Then Charlie cried out in sudden hope. There's a chance. I, I might do it. I, I might be able to save her. Might do what? We are able to see what we do because the field of the meteor bends light through the four-dimensional continuum. The world line of a ray of light is a geodesic in the continuum. The field I have built distorts the continuum, so we see rays that originated at a distant point. Is that clear? Clear as mud. Well. Anyhow, if the field were strong enough, we could bring physical objects through space-time instead of mere visual images. We could pick Virginia up and bring her right here to the crater, I'm sure of it. You mean you could move a girl through some four or five thousand miles of space? You don't understand. She wouldn't come through space at all, but through space-time, through the continuum, which is a very different thing. She is four thousand miles away in our three-dimensional space, but in space-time, as you see, she is only a few yards away. She's only a few yards from us in the fourth dimension. If I can increase the field a little, she'll be drawn right through. You're a wizard if you can do it. I've got to do it. She's a fine swimmer. That's the only reason she's still alive, but she'll never live to reach the shore, not in a sea like that. Charlie fell to work at once. 
mounting another electromagnet beside the one he had set up, and rigging up two more X-ray bulbs beside the packing box which held the meteor. The motion of the boat in the fire-rimmed window kept drawing it swiftly away from us, and Charlie showed me how to move the dial of his rheostat to keep the girl in view. Before he had completed his arrangement, a patch of white foam came into view just ahead of the drifting boat. In a moment I made out a cruel black rock, with the angry sea breaking into fleecy spray upon it. The boat was almost upon it, driving straight for it. Charlie saw it and cried out in horror. The long black hull of the splintered boat, floating keel upward, was only a few yards away. A great white-capped breaker lifted it and hurled it forward, with the girl clinging to it. She drew herself up and stared in terror at the black rock, while another long surging roller picked up the boat and swept it forward again. I stood paralyzed in horror while the shattered boat was driven full upon the great rock. I could imagine the crash of it, but it was all as still as a silent picture. The boat riding high on a crest of white foam smashed against the rock and was shivered to splinters. Virginia was hurled forward against the slick, wet stone. Desperately she scrambled to reach the top of the boulder. Her hands slipped on the polished rock. The wild sea dragged at her. At last she got out of reach of the angry gray water, though spume still deluged her. I breathed a sigh of relief, though her position was still far from enviable. "'Virginia, Virginia, why did I let you go?' Charlie cried. Desperately he fell to work again, mounting the magnet and tubes. Another hour went by while I watched the shivering girl on the rock. Bobbed hair, wet and glistening, was plastered close against her head, and her clothing was torn half off. She looked utterly exhausted. It seemed to take all of her ebbing energy to cling to the rock against the force of the wind and the waves that dashed against her. She looked cold, blue, and trembling. The water stood higher. "'The tide is rising!' Charlie exclaimed. "'It will cover the rock pretty soon. If I don't get her off in time, she's lost!' He finished twisting his wires together. I've got it all ready, he said. Now I've got to find out exactly where she is, to know how to set it. Even then it's fearfully uncertain. I hate to try it, but it's the only chance. You can find out? Yes, from the spectral shifts and other factors. I'll have to get some other apparatus. He ran up to the laboratory, across the level field that lay black beneath the stars. He came back, panting with spectrometer, terrestrial globe, and other articles. The tide is higher, he cried, as he looked through the blue-rimmed circle at the girl on the rock. She'll be swept off before long. He mounted the spectrometer and fell to work with a will, taking observations through the telescope, adjusting prisms and diffraction gratings, reading electrometers and other apparatus, and stopping to make intricate calculations. I helped him when I could, or stared through the ring of shining blue mist where I could see the waves breaking higher about the exhausted girl who clung to the rock. Clouds of wind-whipped spray often hid her from sight. I knew that she would not have the strength to hold on much longer against the force of the rising sea. Although driven almost to distraction by the horror of her predicament, he worked with a cool, swift efficiency. Only the pale, anxiety-drawn expression on his face showed how great was the strain. He finished the last spectrometer observation, snatched out a pad, and fell to figuring furiously. Something queer here he said presently, frowning. A shift of the spectrum that I can't explain by distortion through three-dimensional space alone. I, I don't understand it. We stared at the chilled and trembling girl on the rock. I'm, I'm almost afraid to try it. What if something went wrong? He turned to the terrestrial globe he had brought down and traced a line over it. He made a quick calculation on his pad, then made a fine dot on the globe with a pencil point. Here she is on a rock some miles off Point Eugenia on the coast of the Mexican state of Lower California. Most lonely spot in the world. No chance for a rescue. We must. My God! he screamed in sudden horror. Look! I looked through the blue-ringed window and saw the girl. Green water was surging about her waist. It seemed that each wave almost tore her off. Then I saw that she was struggling with something. A great coiling tentacle, black and leathery and glistening, was thrust up out of the green water. It wavered deliberately through the air and grasped at the girl. She seemed to scream, though we could hear nothing. She beat at the monster, weakly, vainly. She's gone, cried Charlie. An octopus, I said, a, a giant cuttlefish. Virginia made a sudden fierce effort. 
With a strength that I had not thought her chilled limbs possessed, she tore away from the dreadful creature and clambered higher on the rock. But still a hideous black tentacle clung about her ankle, tugging at her, drawing her back despite her desperate struggle to break free. "'I've got to try it,' Charlie said, determination flashing in his eyes. "'It's a chance.' He closed a switch. His new coils sung out above the old one. X-ray tubes flickered beside the blue fire that ringed the window. He adjusted his rheostats and closed the circuit through the new magnet. A curtain of blue flame was drawn quickly between us and the round fire-rimmed window. A huge ball of blue fire hung about the meteorite and the instruments. For minutes it hung there, while Charlie, perspiring, worked desperately with the apparatus. Then it expanded, became huge. It exploded noiselessly in a great flash of sapphire flame, then vanished completely. Meteor, bench, and apparatus were gone. In the light of the stars we could make out the huge crater the meteorite had torn with a few odds and ends of equipment scattered about it. But all the apparatus Charlie had set up, connected with the meteoric stone, had disappeared. He was dumbfounded, staggered with disappointment. Virginia? Virginia! he called out in a hopeless voice. No, she isn't here. It didn't draw her through. I've failed and we can't even see her any more." Desperately I searched for consolation for him. "'Maybe the octopus won't hurt her,' I offered. They say that most of the stories of their ferocity are somewhat exaggerated." "'If the monster doesn't get her, the tide will,' he said bitterly. I made a miserable failure of it, and I don't know why. I, I can't understand it." Apathetically he picked up his pad and held it in the light of his electric lantern. Something funny about this equation. The shift of the spectrum lines can't be accounted for by distortion through space alone. With wrinkled brow he stared for many minutes at the bit of paper he held in the white circle of light. Suddenly he seized a pencil and figured rapidly. I have it! The light was bent through time! I should have recognized these space-time coordinates! He calculated again. Yes. The scene we saw in that circle of light was distant from us not only in space, but in time. The Valhalla probably hasn't sunk yet at all. We were looking into the future. But how can that be, seeing things before they happen? I have the profoundest respect for Charlie King's mathematical genius, but when he said that I was frankly incredulous. Space and time are only relative terms. Our material universe is merely the intersection of tangled world lines of geodesics in a four-dimensional continuum. Space and time have no meaning independently of each other. Jean says a terrestrial astronomer may reckon that the outburst on Nova Persei occurred a century before the Great Fire of London, but an astronomer on the Nova may reckon with equal accuracy that the Great Fire occurred a century before the outburst on the Nova. The field of this meteorite deflected light waves so that we saw them earlier, according to our conventional ideas of time, than they originated. We saw several hours into the future. And the amplified field of the magnet, though strong enough to move Virginia through space, was not sufficiently powerful to draw her back to us across time. Yet she must have felt the pull. Some dreadful thing may have happened. The problem is rather complicated." He lifted his pencil again. In the glow of the little electric lantern I saw his lean young face tense with the fierce effort of his thought. His pencil raced across the little pad, setting down symbols that I could make nothing of. My own thoughts were racing. Seeing into the future was a rather revolutionary idea to me. My mind is conservative. I have always been skeptical of the more fantastic ideas suggested by science. But Charlie seemed to know what he was talking about. In view of the marvelous things he had done that night, it seemed hardly fair to doubt him now. I decided to accept his astounding statement at face value and to follow the adventure through. He lifted his pencil and consulted the luminous dial of his wristwatch. We saw that last scene some twelve hours and forty minutes before it happened, to put it in conventional language. The distortion of the time coordinates amounted to that. In the light of dawn, for we had been all night at the meteor pit, and silver was coming in the east. He looked at me with fierce resolve in his eyes. Hammond, that gives us over twelve hours to get to Virginia. You, you mean to go? But just twelve hours? That's better than the transcontinental record, to say nothing of the time it would take to find a little rock in the Pacific. We have the Golden Gull. 
She's as fast as any ship we've ever flown. But we, we can't take the gull. Those alterations haven't been made. And, and that new engine. A bearcat for power, but it may go dead any second. The gull can fly, but she isn't safe. Safety be damned. I've got to get to Virginia and get there in the next twelve hours. The gull will fly, but... All right. Please help me get off. Help you off? It's a fool thing to do, but if you go, I do. Thanks, Hammond. Awfully. He gripped my hand. We've got to make it. With a last glance into the gaping pit from which we had dug the marvelous stone, we turned and ran across to the hangars. As we ran, the sun came above the sea in the east. Its first rays struck us like a fiery lance. The mechanics had not yet appeared. Charlie pushed the doors back, and we ran out the trim little golden gull, beautiful in her slender wing and her graceful tapering lines. I seized the starting crank, and Charlie sprang into the cockpit. I cranked until the mechanism was droning dismally and pulled the lever that engaged it with the engine. I had been in too much haste to get up the proper speed, and the powerful new engine failed to fire. Charlie almost cried with vexation while I was cranking again. This time the motor coughed and fell into a steady, vibrant roar. With the wind from the propeller screaming about me, I disengaged the crank and stood waiting while the motor warmed. Charlie gave it scant time to do so before he motioned me to kick out the blocks. I tumbled into the enclosed cockpit beside him. He gave the ship the gun, and we roared across the field. In five minutes we were flying west at a speed just under three hundred miles per hour. Charlie was crouched over the stick, scanning the instrument board, and flying the gull almost at her top speed. Again and again his eyes went to the little clock on the panel. Twelve hours and forty minutes, he said, and an hour gone already. We've got to be there by five minutes after six. We were flying over Louisiana when the oil line clogged. The engine heated dangerously. Reluctantly, Charlie cut off the ignition and fell in a swift spiral to an open field. We've got to fix it, he said. Another hour gone, and we need every minute. This new engine, it's powerful enough, but we should have had time to overhaul it and make those changes. Charlie landed with his usual skill, and we fell to work in desperate haste. A grizzled farmer, a wad of tobacco in his cheek, and three ragged urchins at his heels stopped to watch us. He had just been to his mailbox and had a morning paper in his hand. Charlie questioned him about the storm. Storm Center nears the American coast, he read in a nasal drawl. Greatest storm of year drives shipping upon west coast. Six vessels reported lost. S.S. Valhalla disabled. Sends S.O.S. A thousand lives are the estimated toll tonight of the most terrific storm of the year, which is sweeping toward the Pacific coast, driving all shipping before it. Radiograms from the Valhalla at 5 p.m. report that she is disabled and in danger. It is doubtful that rescue vessels can reach her through the storm. We got the engine repaired and took off again. Charlie looked at the little clock. Five minutes to ten. Eight hours and ten minutes left, and we've got a darn long ways to go. We had to stop at San Antonio, Texas to replenish gasoline and oil. Ten minutes lost, Charlie complained as we took off. And that monster, waiting in the future to drag Virginia to a hideous death. Two hours later, the plane developed trouble in the ignition system. The motor was new, with several radical changes that we had introduced to increase power and lessened weight. As I had objected to Charlie, we had not done enough experimental work on it to perfect it. We limped into the field at El Paso and spent another priceless half-hour at work. I got some sandwiches at a luncheon counter beside the field and listened a moment to a radio loudspeaker there. "'Many thousands are dead,' came the crisp, metallic voice of the announcer. As a result of the storm now raging on the Pacific coast, the worst in several years. The storm center is spending its force on the coastal regions today. Millions of dollars in damage are reported in cities from San Francisco to Manzanillo, Mexico. The greatest disaster of the storm is the loss of the passenger liner Valhalla of the Red Star Line. It is believed to have collided with the abandoned hulk of an Italian-owned tramp freighter, the Roma, which was left by its crew yesterday in a sinking condition. Radiograms from the liner ceased three hours ago when she was said to be sinking. 
the officers doubted that her boats could be launched in such a sea. I waited to hear no more. Charlie checked our route while we were stopped, and we took off. We crossed the Rio Grande and flew across the rocky, brush-scattered hills of Mexico in a direct line for the rock in the sea. If anything happens so we have to land again, well, it's just too bad, Charlie said grimly. But we've got to go this way. It's something over six hundred miles in a straight line. Fifteen minutes to four now. We have to average nearly three hundred miles an hour to get there. He was silent and intent over his maps and instruments as we flew on over the lofty Sierra Madre range, and over a long slope down to the Gulf of California. Headwinds beset us as we were over the stretch of blue water, and we flew on into a storm. We had hardly time to make it without the wind against us, Charlie said. If it holds us back many miles, well, it just mustn't. Purple lightning flickered ominously in the mass of blue storm clouds that hung above the mountainous peninsula of Lower California. I had a qualm about flying into it in our untested machine, but Charlie leaned tensely forward and sent the golden gull on at the limit of her speed. Gray vapor swirled about us, rent with livid streaks of lightning. Thunder crashed and rumbled above the roar of our racing engine. Wild winds screeched in the struts, rain and hail beat against us. The plane rose and fell. She was swirled about like a falling leaf. The stick struggled in Charlie's hands like a living thing. With lips tightened to a thin line, he fought silently, fiercely, desperately. Suddenly we were sucked down until I had an uneasy feeling at the pit of my stomach. I saw the grim outline of a bare mountain peak dangerously close below us, shrouded in wind-whipped mist. In sudden alarm I shouted, We'd better get out of this, Charlie. We can't live in it long. In the roar of the storm he did not hear me, and I shouted again. He turned to face me after a glance at the clock. We've less than an hour, Hammond. We've got to go on. I sank back in my seat. The plane rolled and tossed until I thanked my lucky stars for the safety strap. In nervous anxiety I watched Charlie bring the ship up again and fight his way on through the storm. For an eternity, it seemed, we battled through a chaos of wind-driven mist, bright with purple lightning and shaken with crashing thunder. Charlie struggled with the controls until he was dripping with perspiration. He must have been utterly worn out after thirty-six hours of exhausting effort. A dozen times I despaired of life. The compass had gone to spinning crazily. We dived through the rain until we could pick up landmarks below. Three times a great bare peak loomed suddenly up ahead of us, and Charlie averted collision only by zooming suddenly upward. Then slate-gray water was beneath us, running in white-crested mountains. I knew that we were at last out over the Pacific. We've passed Point Eugenia, Charlie said. It can't be far now. But we have only fifteen minutes left, fifteen minutes to get to her, before the attraction of the meteor jerks her away, perhaps to a horrible fate. We flew low and fast over the racing waves. Charlie looked over his charts and made a swift calculation. He changed our course a bit, and we flew on at top speed. We scanned the vast mad expanse of sea below the blue-gray clouds. Here and there were lines of white breakers, but nowhere did we see a rock with a girl upon it. Presently the green outline of an island appeared out of the wild water on our right. "'That's Del Tiburon,' Charlie said. "'We missed the rock!' He swung the plane about, and we flew south over the hastening waves. I looked at the little clock. It showed two minutes to six. I turned to Charlie. Seven minutes, he whispered grimly. On and on we flew in a wide circle. The motor roared loud. An endless expanse of racing waves unreeled below us. The little hand crawled around the dial. One minute past six. Only four minutes to go. We saw a speck of white foam on the mad gray water. It was miles away, almost on the horizon. We plunged toward it, motor bellowing loud. Five miles a minute we flew. The white fleck became a black rock smothered in snowy foam. On we swept and over the rock with bullet-like speed. As we plunged by I saw Virginia's slender form, tattered, brine-soaked, straggling in the hideous tentacles of the monster octopus. It was the same terrible scene that we had viewed through the amazing phenomenon of distortion of light through space-time four thousand miles away and twelve hours before. 
In a few minutes the time would come when Charlie had ended our view of the scene by his attempt to draw the girl through the fourth dimension to our apparatus in Florida. What terrible thing might happen then? Charlie brought the ship about so quickly that we were flung against the sides. Down we came toward the mad waves in a swift glide. In sudden apprehension I dropped my hand on his shoulder. Man, you, you can't land in a sea like that. It's suicide. Without a word he shook off my hand and continued our steep glide toward the rock. I drew my breath in apprehension of a crash. I do not blame Charlie for what happened. He is as skillful a pilot as I know. It was a mad freak of the sea that did the thing. The gray waste of mountainous white crest waves rose swiftly up to meet us, with the rock with the girl clinging to it just to our right. The golden gull struck the crest of a wave, buried herself in the foam, and plunged down the long slope to the trough. We rose safely to the crest of the oncoming roller, and I saw the black outline of the rock not a dozen yards away. Charlie had landed with all his skill. It was not his fault that the blustering wind caught the ship as she reached the crest of the wave and flung her sideways toward the rock. It was no fault of his that the white-capped mountain of racing green water completed what the wind had begun and hurled the frail plane crashing on the rock. I have a confused memory of the wild plunge at the mercy of the wave of my despair as I realized that we were being wrecked. I must have been knocked unconscious when we struck. The next thing I remember I was opening my eyes to find myself on the rock, Charlie's strong arm on my shoulder. I was soaked with icy brine and my head was aching from a heavy blow. Virginia, shivering and blue, was perched beside us. I could see no sign of the plain. The mighty sea had swept away what was left of it. Clinging to the lee side of the rock I saw the black tentacles of the giant octopus, waiting for a wave to dash us to its mercy. All right, Hammond? Charlie inquired anxiously. I'm afraid you got a pretty nasty bump on the head, about all I could do to fish you out before the gull was swept away. He helped me to a better position to withstand the force of the great roller that came plunging down upon us like a moving mountain. Virginia was in his arms, too exhausted to do more than cling to him. What can we do? I sputtered, shaking water from my head. Not a thing. We're in a pretty bad fix, I imagine. In a few seconds we will feel the attraction of the meteor's field, the force with which I tried to draw Virginia to the crater through the fourth dimension. I don't know what will happen. We may be jerked out of space altogether, and if that doesn't get us, the tide and the octopus will." His voice was drowned in the roar of the coming wave. A mountain of water deluged us. Half drowned, I clung to the rock against the mad water. Then blinding blue light flashed about me. A sharp crash rang in my ears like splintering glass. I reeled and felt myself falling headlong. I brought up on soft sand. I sat up dumbfounded and opened my eyes. I was sitting in the steep sandy tide of a conical pit. Charlie and Virginia were sprawled beside me, looking as astonished as I felt. Charlie got to his knees and lifted the limp form of the girl in his arms. Something snapped in my brain. The sand-walled pit was suddenly familiar. I got to my feet and clambered out of it. I saw that we were on our own landing field. Astonishingly, we were back in the meteor crater. Charlie's vanished apparatus was scattered about us. I saw the gray side of the rough iron meteorite itself, half buried in the sand at the bottom of the pit. What, what happened? I demanded of Charlie. Don't you see? Simple enough. I should have thought of it before. The field of the meteorite brought Virginia and us through to this point in space, but it could not bring us back through time. Instead, the apparatus itself was jerked forward through time. That is why it vanished. We got here just twelve hours and forty minutes after I closed the switch, since we had been looking that far into the future. The mathematical explanation? That's enough for me, I said hastily. We better see about a warm, dry bed for Virginia and some hot soup or something. Now the rough gray meteorite in a neat glass case rests above the mantel in the library of a beautiful home where I am a frequent guest. I was there one evening a few days ago when Charlie King fell silent in one of his fits of mathematical speculation. Einstein again? I chaffingly inquired. He raised his brown eyes and looked at me. Hammond, since relativity enabled us to find the meteor girl, you ought to be convinced. 
Virginia, whom her husband calls the Meteor Girl, came laughingly to the rescue. Yes, Mr. Hammond, what do you think of Einstein now? End of The Meteor Girl by Jack Williamson Push Button War by Joseph P. Martino. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by FNH. Push Button War by Joseph P. Martino. In one place, a descendant of the Vikings rode a ship such as Leif never dreamed of. From another, one of the descendants of Caesar's and here an Apache rode a steed such as never roamed the plains. But they were warriors all. The hatch swung open, admitting a blast of arctic air, and a man clad in a heavy fur-lined parker. He quickly closed the hatch, and turned to the man in the pilot's couch. "'Okay, Harry, I'll take over now. Anything to report?' "'The heading gyro in the autopilot is still drifting. Did you write it up for maintenance?' "'Yeah.' They said that to replace it, they'd have to put the whole ship in the hangar, and it's full now, with ships going through periodic inspection. I guess we'll have to wait. They can't just give us another ship, either, with the hangar so full. We must be pretty close to the absolute minimum for ships on the line and ready to fly. OK, let me check out with the tower, and she'll be all yours. He thumbed the intercom button, and spoke into the mic. RI-276 to tower. Major Lightfoot, going off watch. When the tower acknowledged, he began to disconnect himself from the ship. With smooth, experienced motions, he disconnected the mic cable, the oxygen hose, air pressure hose, cooling air hose, electrical heating cable, and dehumidifier hose, which connected his flying suit to the ship. He donned the parker and gloves his relief had worn, and stepped through the hatch into the gantry crane elevator. Even through the heavy parker the cold air had a bite to it. As the elevator descended, he glanced to the south, knowing as he did so that there would be nothing to see. The sun had set on November the 17th, and was not due up for three more weeks. At noon there would be a faint glow on the horizon, as the sun gave a reminder of its existence, but now at four in the morning there was nothing. As he stepped off the elevator, the ground crew prepared to roll the gantry crane away from the ship. He opened the door of the waiting personnel carrier and swung aboard. The inevitable cry of, Close that door! greeted him as he entered. He brushed the parker hood back from his head and sank into the first empty seat, the heater struggled valiantly with the arctic cold to keep the interior of the personnel carrier at a tolerable temperature, but it never seemed to be able to do much with the floor. He propped his feet on the footrest of the seat ahead of him, spoke to the other occupant of the seat. Hi, Mike. Hi, Harry. Say, what's your watch schedule now? I've got four hours off, back on for four, then sixteen off. Why? Well, a few of us are getting up a friendly little game before we go back on watch. I thought you might want to join us. Well, I... Come on now, what's your excuse this time for not playing cards? To start with, I'm scheduled for a half hour in the simulator and another half hour in the procedural trainer. Then if I finish the exam in my correspondence course, I can get it on this week's mail plane. If I don't get it in the mail now, I'll have to wait until next week. All right, I'll let you off this time. How's the course coming? This is the final exam. If I pass, I'll have forty-two more credits to go before I have my degree in animal husbandry. On earth do you want a degree like that? I keep telling you, when I retire I'm going back to Oklahoma and raise horses. If I got into all the card games you try to organise, I'll retire with neither the knowledge to run a horse ranch nor the money to start one. But why raise horses? Cabbages, I can see. Tomatoes, yes. But why horses? Partly that's because there's always a market for them, so I'll have a fair amount of business to keep me eating regularly. But mostly because I like horses. I practically grew up in the saddle. By the time I was old enough to do much riding, Dad had his own ranch, and I helped earn my keep by working for him. Under those circumstances, I just naturally learned to like horses. Guess I never thought of it like that. I was a city boy myself. The only horses I ever saw were the ones the cops rode. I didn't get much chance to become familiar with the beasts. Well, you don't know what you've missed. It's just impossible to describe what it's like to use a high-spirited and well-trained horse in your daily work. The horse almost gets to sense what you want him to do next. You don't have to direct his every move. 
Just a word or two and a touch with your heel or a pressure of a knee against his side, and he's got the idea. A well-trained horse is perfectly capable of cutting a particular cow out of a herd without any instruction beyond showing him which one you want. Too bad the army did away with the cavalry. Sounds like you belong there, not in the Air Force. No, because if there's anything I like better than riding a good horse, it's flying a fast and responsive airplane. I've been flying fighters for almost seventeen years now, and I'll be quite happy to keep flying them as long as they'll let me. When I can't fly fighters any more, then I'll go back to horses. And as much as I like horses, I hope that's going to be a long time yet. You must hate this assignment, then. How come I never hear you complain about it? The only reason I don't complain about this assignment is that I volunteered for it, and I've been kicking myself ever since. When I heard about the rocket interceptors, I was really excited. Imagine a plane fast enough to catch up with an invading ballistic missile and shoot it down. I decided this was for me and jumped at the assignment. They sounded like the hot fighter planes to end all hot fighter planes. And what do I find? They're so expensive to fly that we don't get any training missions. I've been up in one just once, and that was my familiarization flight when I got into this assignment last year. And then it was only a ride in the second seat of that two-seater version they use for checking out new pilots. I just lay there through the whole flight. As far as I could see, the pilot didn't do much more. He just watched things while the autopilot did all the work. Well, don't take it too hard. You might get some flights. That's true. They do mistake a meteor for a missile now and then. But that only happens two or three times a year. That's not enough. I want some regular flying. I haven't got any flying time in me for more than a year. The nearest I come to flying is my time in the procedural trainer to teach me what buttons to push, and in the simulator to give me the feel of what happens when I push the buttons. That's okay. They still give you flying pay. I know. But that's not what I'm after. I fly because I love flying. I use the flying pay just to keep up the extra premiums the insurance companies keep on sisting so long as I indulge my passion for fighter planes. I guess about the only way you could get any regular flying on this job would be for a war to come along. That's about it. We'd fly just as often as they could recover our ships and send us back up here for another launch. And that would go on until the economy on both sides broke down so far they couldn't afford to send any more missiles for us to chase, or boosters to send us up after them. No, thanks. I don't want to fly that badly. I like civilization. In the meantime, then, you ought to enjoy it here. Where else can you spend most of your working hours lying flat on your back on the most comfortable couch science can devise? That's the trouble. Just lying there where you can't read, write, talk, or listen. Might be okay for a hermit, but I'd rather fly fighter planes. Here's the trainer building. I've got to get out. Seven o'clock. Harry Lightfoot licked the flap of the envelope, sealed it shut, stuck some stamps on the front, and scrawled air mail under the stamps. He dropped the letter into the stateside slot. The exam hadn't been so bad. What did they think he was, anyway, a city slicker who'd never seen a live cow in his life? He ambled into the off-duty pilot's lounge. He had an hour to kill before going on watch, and this was as good a place as any to kill it. The lounge was almost empty. Most of the pilots must have been asleep. They couldn't all be in Mike's game. He leaned over a low table in the centre of the room and started sorting through the stack of magazines. Looking for anything in particular, Harry? He turned to face the speaker. No, just going through these fugitives from a dentist's office to see if there's anything I haven't read yet. I can't figure out where all the new magazines go. The ones in here always seem to be exactly two months old. Here's this month's Western stories. I just finished it. It had some pretty good stories in it. No, thanks. The wrong side always wins in that one. The wrong... Oh, I forgot. I guess they don't write stories where your side wins. It's not really a question of my side. My tribe gave up the practice of tribal life and tribal customs over fifty years ago. I had the same education in a public school as any other American child. I read the same newspapers, watched the same TV shows as anyone else. My Apache ancestry means as little to me as the nationality of his immigrant ancestors means to the average American. I certainly don't consider myself to be part of a nation still at war with the pale faces. Then what's wrong with the Western stories where the United States cavalry wins? That's a different thing entirely. Some of the earliest memories I have are of listening to my grandfather tell me about how he and his friends fought against the horse soldiers when he was a young man. I imagine he put more romance than historical accuracy into his stories. After all, he was telling an eager kid about the adventures he'd had over fifty years before. But at any rate, he definitely fixed my emotions on the side of the Indians and against the United States cavalry, 
and the fact that culturally I'm descended from the cavalry rather than from the Apache Indians doesn't change my emotions any. I imagine that would have a strong effect on you. These stories are really cheering at the death of some of your grandfather's friends. Oh, it's worse than that. In a lot of hack-ridden stories, the Indians are just convenient targets for the hero to shoot at, while the author gets on with the story. These stories are bad enough, but the worst are the ones where the Indians are depicted as brutal savages with no redeeming virtues. My grandfather had an elaborate code of honour which governed his conduct in battle. It was different from the code of people he fought, but it was at least as rigid and deviations from it were punished severely. He never read Clausewitz. To him, war wasn't an instrument of national policy. It was a chance for the individual warrior to demonstrate his skill and bravery. His code put a high premium on individual courage in combat, and the weakling or coward was crushed contemptuously. I don't even attempt to justify the Indian treatment of captured civilians and non-combatants, but nevertheless I absorbed quite a few of my grandfather's ideals and views about war, and it's downright disgusting to see him so falsely represented by authors of the run-of-the-mill western story or movie. Well, those writers have to eat too, and maybe they can't hold an honest job. Besides, you don't still look at war the way your grandfather did, do you? Civilization requires plenty of other virtues besides courage in combat. We have plenty of better ways to display those virtues. And the real goal of the fighting man is to be alive after the war, so he can go home to enjoy the things he was fighting for. No, I hadn't been in Korea long before I lost any notions I might have had of war as a glorious adventure my grandfather described it to be. It's nothing but a bloody business and should be resorted to only if everything else fails. But I still think the individual fighter could do a lot worse than follow the code that my grandfather believed in. That's so, especially since the coward usually gets shot anyway, if not by the enemy, then by his own side. Hey, it's getting late. I've got some things to do before going on watch. Be seeing you. OK. I'll try to find something else here I haven't read yet. Eight o'clock. Still no sign of the sun. The stars didn't have the sky to themselves, however. Two or three times a minute a meteor would be visible, most of them appearing to come from a point about halfway between the pole star and the eastern horizon. Harry Lightfoot stopped the elevator, opened the hatch, and stepped in. "'She's all yours, Harry. I've checked out with the tower.' "'Okay. That gyro any worse?' "'No, it seems to have said it a bit. Nothing else gone wrong, either. "'Looks like we're in luck for a change. "'Let me have the parker, and I'll clear out. "'I'll think of you up here while I'm relaxing. "'Just imagine, a whole twenty-four hours off, and not even a training scheduled. "'Someone slipped up, I'll bet.' By the way, be sure to look at the fireworks when you go out. They're better now than I've seen them at any time since they started. The meteor shower, you mean? Thanks. I'll take a look. I'll bet they're really cluttering up the radar screens. The launch control officer must be going quietly nuts. The launch control officer wasn't going nuts. Anyone who went nuts under stress simply didn't pass the psychological tests required of the prospective launch control officers. However, he was decidedly unhappy. He sat in a dimly lighted room, facing three oscilloscope screens. On each of them, a pie wedge section was illuminated by a white line which swept back and forth like a windshield wiper. Unlike a windshield wiper, however, it put little white blobs on the screen instead of removing them. Each blob represented something which had returned a radar echo. The centre screen was his own radar. The outer two were televised images of the radar screens at the stations a hundred miles on either side of him part of a chain of stations extending from Alaska to Greenland. In the room behind him, and facing sets of screens similar to his, sat his assistants. They located the incoming objects on the screen and set automatic computers to determine the velocity, trajectory, and probable impact point. This information appeared as coded symbols beside the tracks on the center screen of the launch control officer, as well as all duplicate screens. The launch control officer, and he alone, had the responsibility to determine whether the parameters for a given track were compatible with an invading intercontinental ballistic missile, or whether the track represented something harmless. If he failed to launch an interceptor at a track that turned out to be hostile, it meant the death of an American city. However, if he made a habit of launching interceptors at false targets, he would soon run out of interceptors, and only under the pressure of actual war could the incredible cost of shipping in more interceptors during the winter be paid without a second thought. Normally, no more could be shipped until spring. That would mean a gap in the chain that could not be covered adequately by interceptors from the adjacent stations. His screens were never completely clear, and to complicate things, 
the quadrantids, which start every New Year's Day and last four days, were giving him additional trouble. Each track had to be analysed, and the presence of the meteor shower greatly increased the number of tracks he had to worry about. However, the worst was past. One more day, and they would be over. The clutter on his screens would drop back to normal. Even under the best of circumstances, his problem was bad. He was hemmed in on one side by physics, and on the other by arithmetic. The most probable direction for an attack was from over the pole. His radar beam bent only slightly to follow the curve of the Earth. At great range, the lower edge of the beam was too far above the Earth's surface to detect anything of military significance. On a minimum altitude trajectory, an ICBM aimed at North America would not be visible until it reached 83 degrees north latitude on the other side of the pole. One of his interceptors took 385 seconds to match trajectories with such a missile, and the match occurred only two degrees of latitude south of the station. The invading missile travelled one degree of latitude in 14 seconds. Thus he had to launch the interceptor when the missile was 27 degrees from intercept. This turned out to be 85 degrees north latitude on the other side of the pole. This left him at most 30 seconds to decide whether or not to intercept a track crossing the pole. And if several tracks were present, he had to split that time among them. If too many tracks appeared, he would have to turn over portions of the sky to his assistants and let them make decisions about launching. This would happen only if he felt an attack was in progress, however. Low-altitude satellites presented him with a serious problem, since there is not a whole lot of difference between the orbit of such a satellite and the trajectory of an ICBM. Fortunately, most satellite orbits were catalogued and available for comparison with incoming tracks. However, once in a while an unannounced satellite was launched, and these could cause trouble. Only the previous week, at a station down the line, an interceptor had been launched at an unannounced satellite. Had the pilot not realised what he was chasing and held his fire, the international complications could have been serious. It was hard to imagine World War III being started by an erroneous interceptor launching, but the State Department would be hard put to soothe the feelings of some intensely nationalistic country whose expensive new satellite had been shot down. Such mistakes were bound to occur, but the launch control officer preferred that they were made when someone else, not he, was on watch. For this reason, he attempted to anticipate all known satellites, so they would be recognised as soon as they appeared. According to the notes he had made before coming on watch, one of the UN's weather satellites was due over shortly. A blip appeared on the screen just beyond the 83 degree latitude line, across the pole. He checked the time with the satellite ephemeris. If this were the satellite, it was 90 seconds early. That was too much error in the predicted orbit of a well-known satellite. Symbols sprang into existence beside the track. It was not quite high enough for the satellite, and the velocity was too low, and the white line swept back across the screen again. More symbols appeared beside the track. Probable impact point was about 40 degrees latitude. It certainly wasn't the satellite. Two more blips appeared on the screen at velocities and altitudes similar to the first. Each swipe of the white line left more new tracks on the screen, and the screens of the adjacent stations were showing similar behaviour. These couldn't be meteors. The launch control officer slapped his hand down on a red push button set into the arm of his chair and spoke into his mic. Red alert! Attack is in progress! Then, switching to another channel, he spoke to his assistants. Take your pre-assigned sectors. Launch one interceptor at each track identified as hostile. He hadn't enough interceptors to double up on an attack of this size, and a quick glance at the screens for the adjacent stations showed he could expect no help from them. They would have their hands full. In theory, one interceptor could handle a missile all by itself, but the theory had never been tried in combat. That lack was about to be supplied. Harry Lightfoot heard the alarm over the intercom. He vaguely understood what would happen before his launch order came. As each track was identified as hostile, a computer would be assigned to it. It would compute the correct time of launch, select an interceptor, and order it off the ground at the correct time. During the climb to intercept, the computer would radio steering signals to the interceptor to assure that the intercept took place in the most efficient fashion. He knew RI-276 had been selected when a green light on the instrument panel flashed on, and a clock dial started indicating the seconds until launch. Just as the clock reached zero, a relay closed behind the instrument panel. The solid fuel booster ignited with a roar. He was squashed back into his couch under 4 G's acceleration. Gyroscopes and acceleration measuring instruments determine the actual trajectory of the ship. 
the navigation computer compared the actual trajectory with the trajectory set in before takeoff. When a deviation from the preset trajectory occurred, the autopilot steered the ship back to the proper trajectory. As the computer on the ground obtained better velocity and position information about the missile from the ground radar, it sent course corrections to the ship, which were accepted in the computer as changes to the preset trajectory. The navigation computer hummed and buzzed. Lights flickered on and off on the instrument panel. Relays clicked behind the panel. The ship steered itself towards the correct intercept point. All this automatic operation was required because no merely human pilot had reflexes fast enough to carry out the intercept at 26,000 feet per second. And even had his reflexes been fast enough, he could not have done the precise piloting required while being pummeled by this acceleration. As it was, Major Harry Lightfoot, fighter pilot, lay motionless in his acceleration couch. His face was distorted by the acceleration. His breathing was laboured. Compressed air bladders in the legs of his G-suit alternately expanded and contracted, squeezing him like the obscene embrace of some giant snake as the G-suit tried to keep his blood from pooling in his legs. Without the G-suit, he would have blacked out, and eventually his brain would have been permanently damaged from the lack of blood to carry oxygen to it. A red light on the instrument panel blinked balefully at him as it measured out the oxygen he required. Other instruments on the panel informed him about the amount of cooling air flowing through his suit to keep his temperature within tolerable range, and the amount of moisture the dehumidifier had to carry away from him so that his suit didn't become a steam bath. He was surrounded by hundreds of pounds of equipment, which added nothing to the performance of the ship, which couldn't be counted as payload, which cut down on the speed and altitude the ship might have reached without them. Their sole purpose was to keep this magnificent, high-performance, self-steering machine from killing its load of fragile human flesh. At 128 seconds after launch, the acceleration suddenly dropped to zero. He breathed deeply again, and swallowed repeatedly to get the salty taste out of his throat. His stomach was uneasy, but he wasn't space-sick. Had he been prone to space-sickness, he would never have been accepted as a rocket interceptor pilot. Rocket interceptor pilots had to be capable of taking all the punishment their ships could dish out. He knew there would be fifty seconds of freefall before the rockets fired again. One solid fuel stage had imparted to the ship a velocity which would carry it to the altitude of the missile it was to intercept. A second solid fuel stage would match trajectories with the missile. Final corrections would be made with the liquid fuel rockets in the third stage. The third stage would then become a glider, which eventually would carry him back to Earth. Before the second stage was fired, however, the ship had to be orientated properly. The autopilot consulted its gyros, took some star sights, and asked the navigation computer some questions. The answers came back in seconds, an interval which was several hours shorter than a human pilot would have required. Using the answers, the autopilot started to swing the ship about, using small compressed gas jets for the purpose. Finally satisfied with the ship's orientation, the autopilot rested. It patiently awaited the moment, precisely calculated by the computer on the ground, when it would fire the second stage. Major Harry Lightfoot, fighter pilot, waited idly for the next move of his ship. He could only fume inwardly. This was no way for an Apache warrior to ride into battle. What would his grandfather think of a steed which directed itself into battle, and which could kill its rider, not by accident, but by its normal operation? He should be actively hunting for that missile, instead of lying here strapped into his couch so he wouldn't hurt himself while the ship did all the work. As for the missile, it was far to the north and slightly above the ship. Without purpose of its own, but obedient to the laws of Mr. Newton and the wishes of its makers, it came on inexorably. It was a sleek aluminium cylinder, glinting in the sunlight it had just recently entered. On one end was a rocket motor, now silent but still warm with the memory of flaming gas that had poured forth from it only minutes ago. On the other end was a sleek aerodynamic shape, the product of thousands of hours of design work. It was designed to enter the atmosphere at meteoric speed, but without burning up. It was intended to survive the passage through the air and convey its contents intact to the ground. The contents might have been virulent bacteria or toxic gas, according to the intention of its makers. Among its brothers elsewhere in the sky this morning, there were such noxious loads. This one, however, was carrying the complex mechanism of a hydrogen bomb. Its destination was an American city, its object to replace that city with an expanding cloud of star-hot gas. Suddenly, the sleek cylinder disappeared in a puff of smoke, 
which quickly dissipated in the surrounding vacuum. What had been a precisely built rocket had been reduced by carefully placed charges of explosive to a collection of chunks of metal. Some were plates from the skin and fuel tanks. Others were large lumps from the computer banks, gyro platform, fuel pumps, and other more massive components. This was not wanton destruction, however. It was more careful planning by the same brains which had devised the missile itself. To a radar set on the ground near the target, each fragment was indistinguishable from the nose cone carrying the warhead. In fact, since the fragments were separating only very slowly, they would never appear as distinct objects. By the time the cloud of decoys entered the atmosphere, its more than two dozen members would appear to the finest radar available on the ground as a single echo twenty-five miles across. It would be a giant haystack in the sky, concealing the most deadly needle of all time. No ground-controlled intercept scheme had any hope of selecting the warhead from among that deceptive cloud and destroying it. The cloud of fragments possessed the same trajectory as the missile originally had. At the rate it was overtaking RI-276, it would soon pass the ship by. The autopilot of RI-276 had no intention of letting this happen, of course. At the correct instant, Stage 2 thundered into life, and Harry Lightfoot was again smashed back into his acceleration couch. Almost absent-mindedly, the ship continued to minister to his needs. Its attention was focused on its mission. After a while, the ground computer sent some instructions to the ship. The navigation computer converted these into a direction, and pointed a radar antenna in that direction. The antenna sent forth a stream of questing pulses, which quickly returned, confirming the direction and distance to the oncoming cloud of missile fragments. A little while later, fuel pumps began to whine somewhere in the tail of the ship. Then the acceleration dropped to zero as the second stage thrust was terminated. There was a series of thumps as explosive bolts released the second stage. The whine of the pumps dropped in pitch as fuel gushed through them, and acceleration returned in a rush. The acceleration lasted for a few seconds, tapered off quickly, and ended. A light winked on in the instrument panel as the ship announced its mission was accomplished. Major Harry Lightfoot, fighter pilot, felt a glow of satisfaction as he saw the light come on. He might not have the reflexes fast enough to pilot the ship up here. He might not be able to survive the climb to intercept without the help of a lot of fancy equipment. But he was still necessary. He was still one step ahead of this complex robot which had carried him up here. It was his human judgment and his ability to react correctly in an unpredictable situation which was needed to locate the warhead from among the cluster of decoys and destroy it. This was a job no merely logical machine could do. When all was said and done, the only purpose for the existence of this magnificent machine was to put him where he was now, in the same trajectory as the missile, and slightly behind it. Harry Lightfoot reached for a red-handled toggle switch at the top of the instrument panel, clicked it from auto to manual, and changed his status from passenger to pilot. He had little enough time to work. He could not follow the missile down into the atmosphere. His ship would burn up. He must begin his pull-out at no less than 200 miles altitude. That left him 183 seconds in which to locate and destroy the warhead. The screen in the center of his instrument panel could show a composite image of the space in front of his ship, based on data from a number of sensing elements and detectors. He switched on an infrared scanner. A collection of spots appeared on the screen, each spot indicating by its color the temperature of the object it represented. The infrared detector gave him no range information, of course, but if the autopilot had done its job well, the nearest fragment would be about ten miles away. Thus, even if he set off the enemy warhead, he would be safe. At that range, the ship would not suffer any structural damage from the heat, and he could be down on the ground in a hospital before any radiation effects could become serious. He reflected quickly on the possible temperature range of the missile components. The missile had been launched from Central Asia at night in January. There was no reason to suppose that the warhead had been temperature controlled during the pre-launch countdown. Thus it probably was at ambient temperature of the launch site. If it had been fired in the open, that might be as low as minus 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Had it been fired from a shelter, that might be as high as 70 degrees Fahrenheit. To leave a safety margin, he decided to reject only those objects outside the range of plus or minus 100 degrees Fahrenheit. There were two fragments at 500 degrees. He rejected these as probable fragments of the engine. Six more exhibited a temperature of nearly minus 320 degrees Fahrenheit. These probably came from the liquid oxygen tanks. They could be rejected. That eliminated eight of the objects on the screen, 
He had nineteen to go. It would be a lot slower for the rest, too. He switched on a radar transmitter. The screen blanked out almost completely. The missile had included a microwave transmitter to act as a jammer. It must have been triggered on by his approach. It obviously hadn't been operating while the ship was maneuvering into position. Had it been transmitting then, the autopilot would simply have homed on it. He switched the radar to a different frequency. That didn't work. The screen was still blank, indicating that the jammer was sweeping in frequency. He next tried to synchronize the radar pulses with the jammer in order to be looking when it was quiet. The enemy, anticipating him, had given the jammer a variable pulse repetition rate. He switched off the transmitter and scanned the radar antenna manually. He slowly swung it back and forth, attempting to fix the direction of the jammer by finding the direction of maximum signal strength. He found that the enemy had anticipated him again, and the jammer's signal strength varied. However, he finally stopped the antenna, satisfied that he had pointed it at the jammer. The infrared detector confirmed that there was something in the direction the antenna was pointed, but it appeared to be too small to be the warhead. He then activated the manual piloting controls. He started the fuel pumps winding up, and swung the ship to point normal, to the line of sight to the jammer. A quick blast from the rocket sent the image of the jammer moving sideways across the screen. But of greater importance, two other objects moved across the screen faster than the jammer, indicating they were nearer to the ship than was the jammer. He picked the one which appeared the nearest to him, and with a series of maneuvers and blasts from the rocket, placed the object between himself and the jammer. He switched the radar on again. Some of the jammer signal was still leaking through, but the object, whatever it was, made an effective shield. The radar images were quite sharp and clear. He glanced at the clock. Nullifying the jammer had cost him seventy-five seconds. He'd have to hurry in order to make up for that time. The infrared detector showed two targets which the radar insisted weren't there. He shifted radar frequency. They still weren't there. He decided they were small fragments which didn't reflect much radar energy and rejected them. He set the radar to a linear polarized mode. Eight of the targets showed a definite amplitude modulation on the echo. That meant they were rotating slowly. He switched to circular polarization to see if they presented a constant area to the radar beam. He compared the echoes for both modes of polarization. Five of the targets were skin fragments, spinning about an axis skewed with respect to the radar beam. These he rejected. Two more were structural spars. They couldn't conceal a warhead. He rejected them. After careful examination of the fine structure of the echo from the last object, he was able to classify it as a large irregular mass, probably a section of computer waving some cables about. Its irregularity weighed against its containing the warhead. Even if it didn't burn up in the atmosphere, its trajectory would be too unpredictable. He turned to the rest of the targets. Time was getting short. He extracted every conceivable bit of information out of what his detectors told him. He checked each fragment for resonant frequencies, getting an idea of the size and shape of each. He checked the radiated infrared spectrum. He checked the decrement of the reflected radar pulse. Each scrap of information was an indication about the identity of the fragments. With frequent glances at the clock, constantly reminding him of how rapidly his time was running out, he checked and cross-checked the data coming into him. Fighting to keep his mind calm and his thoughts clear, he deduced, inferred, and decided. One fragment after another he sorted, discarded, rejected, eliminated, excluded, until the screen was empty. Now what? Had the enemy camouflaged the warhead so that it looked like a section of the missile's skin? Not likely. Had he made a mistake in his identification of the fragments? Possibly, but there wasn't time to recheck every fragment. He decided that the most likely event was that the warhead was hidden by one of the other fragments. He swung the ship headed it straight for the object shielding him from the jammer, which had turned out to be a section from the fuel tank. A short blast from the rockets sent him drifting towards the object. One image on the screen broadened, split in two. A hidden fragment emerged from behind one of the ones he had examined. He rejected it immediately. Its temperature was too low. He was almost upon the fragment shielding him from the jammer. If he turned to avoid it, the jammer would blank out his radar again. He thought back to his first look at the cloud of fragments, there had been nothing between his shield and the jammer. The only remaining possibility, then, was that the warhead was being hidden from him by the jammer itself. He would have to look on the other side of the jammer, using the ship itself as a shield. He swung out from behind the shielding fragment and saw his radar images blotted out. He switched off the radar and aimed the ship slightly to one side of the infrared image of the jammer. 
Another blast from the rocket sent him towards the jammer. Without range information from the radar, he would have to guess its distance by noting the rate at which it swept across the screen. The image of the jammer started to expand as he approached it. Then it became dumbbell-shaped and split in two. As he passed by the jammer, he switched the radar back on. That second image was something which had been hidden by the jammer. He looked around. No other new objects appeared on the screen. This had to be the warhead. Checked it anyway. Temperature was minus forty degrees Fahrenheit. A smile flickered on his lips as he caught the significance of the temperature. He hoped the launching crew had gotten their fingers frozen off while they were going through the countdown. The object showed no anomalous radar behavior. Beyond doubt, it was the warhead. Then he noted the range. A mere thirteen hundred yards. His own missile carried a small atomic warhead. At that range, it would present no danger to him. But what if it triggered the enemy warhead? He and the ship would be converted into vapor within milliseconds. Even a partial low-efficiency explosion might leave the ship so weakened that it could not stand the stresses of return through the atmosphere. Firing on the enemy warhead at this range was not much different from playing Russian roulette with a fully loaded revolver. Could he move out of range of the explosion and then fire? No. There were only twelve seconds left before he had to start the pull-out. It would take him longer than that to get to a safe range, get into position, and then fire. He'd be dead anyway, as the ship plunged into the atmosphere and burned up. And to pull out without firing would be saving his own life at the cost of the lives he was under oath to defend. That would be sheer cowardice. He hesitated briefly, shrugged his shoulders as well as he could inside his flying suit, and snapped a switch on the instrument panel. A set of crosshairs sprang into existence on the screen. He gripped a small lever which projected up from his right armrest, curled his thumb over the firing button on top of it. Moving the lever, he caused the crosshairs to center on the warhead. He flicked the firing button to tell the fire control system that this was the target. A red light blinked on, informing him that the missile guidance system was tracking the indicated target. He hesitated again. His body tautened against the straps holding it in the acceleration couch. His right arm became rigid, his fingers petrified. Then, with a convulsive twitch of his thumb, he closed the firing circuit. He stared at the screen, unable to tear his eyes from the streak of light that leapt away from his ship and towards the target. The missile reached the target, and there was a small flare of light. His radiation counter burped briefly. The target vanished from the radar. But the infrared detector insisted there was a nebulous fog of hot gas, shot through with a rain of molten droplets where the target had been. That was all. He had destroyed the enemy warhead without setting it off. He stabbed the mission accomplished button and flicked the red-handled toggle switch resigning his status as pilot. Then he collapsed nerveless into the couch. The autopilot returned to control. It signaled the air defense network that this hostile track was no longer dangerous. It received instructions about a safe corridor to return to the ground where it would not be shot at. As soon as the air was thick enough for the control surfaces to bite, the autopilot steered into the safe corridor. It began the slow, tedious process of landing safely. The ground was still a long way down. The kinetic and potential energy of the ship, if instantly transformed into heat, was enough to flash the entire ship into vapor. This tremendous store of energy had to be dissipated without harm to the ship and its occupant. Major Harry Lightfoot, fighter pilot, lay collapsed in his couch exhibiting somewhat less ambition than a sack of meal. He relaxed to the gentle massage of his G-suit. The oxygen control winked reassuringly at him as it maintained a steady flow. The cabin temperature soared, but he was aware of it only from a glance at the thermometer. The air conditioning in his suit automatically stepped up its pace to keep him comfortable. He reflected that this might not be so bad after all. Certainly none of his ancestors had ever had this comfortable a ride home from battle. After a while the ship had reduced its speed and altitude to reasonable values. The autopilot requested and received clearance to land at its pre-assigned base. It lined itself up with the runway, precisely followed the correct glide path, and flared out just over the end of the runway. The smoothness of the touchdown was broken only by the jerk of the drag parachute popping open. The ship came to a halt near the other end of the runway. Harry Lightfoot disconnected himself from the ship and opened the hatch. Carefully avoiding contact with the still hot metal of the skin of the ship, he jumped the short distance to the ground. The low purr of a motor behind him announced the arrival of a tractor to tow the ship off the runway. "'You'll have to ride the tractor with me, sir. We're a bit short of transportation now.' "'Okay, Sergeant. Be careful hooking up. She's still hot.' 
How was the flight, sir? No sweat. She flies herself most of the time. The End of Push Button War by Joseph P. Martino Satellite System this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times. Satellite System by Horace Brown Fife. Fife's quite right. There's nothing like a satellite system for a cold storage arrangement. Keeps things handy, but out of the way. Having released the netting of his bunk, George Tremont floated himself out. He ran his tongue around his mouth and grimaced. "'Wonder how long I slept. Feels like too long,' he muttered. "'Well, they would have called me.' The cabin was a ninety-degree wedge of a cylinder, hardly eight feet high. From one end of its outer arc across to the other was just over ten feet, so that it had been necessary to bevel two corners of the hinged three-by-seven hunk to clear the sides of the wedge. Lockers flattened the arc behind the bunk. Tremont maneuvered himself into a vertical position in the eighteen inches between the bunk and a flat surface that cut off the point of the wedge. He stretched out an arm to remove towel and razor from one of the lockers, then carefully folded the bunk upward and hooked it securely in place. With room to turn now, he swung around and slid open a double door in the flat surface, revealing a shaft three feet square, whose center was also the theoretical intersection of his cabin walls. Tremont pulled himself into the shaft. From up forward, light leaked through a partly open hatch, and he could hear a murmur of voices as he jackknifed in the opposite direction. "'At least two of them are up there,' he grunted. He wondered which of the other three cabins was occupied, meanwhile pulling himself along by the ladder rungs welded to one corner of the shaft. He reached a slightly wider section aft, which boasted entrances to two airlocks, a spacesuit locker, a galley, and a head. He entered the last, noting the murmur of air-conditioning machinery on the other side of the bulkhead. Tremont hooked a foot under a toll hold to maintain his position facing a mirror. He plugged in his razor, turned on the exhauster in the slot below the mirror to keep the clippings out of his eyes, and began to shave. As the beard disappeared, he considered the deals he had come to Centauri to put through. A funny business, he told his image. Dealing in ideas. Can you really sell a man's thoughts? Beginning to work around his chin, he decided that it actually was practical. Ideas, in fact, were almost the only kind of import worth bringing from Seoul to Alpha Centauri. Large-scale shipments of necessities were handled by the Federated Governments. To carry even precious or power metals to Earth, or to return with any type of manufactured luxury, was simply too expensive in money, fuel, effort, and time. On the other hand, traveling back every five years to buy up plans and licenses for the latest inventions or processes, that was profitable enough to provide a good living for many a man in Tremont's business. All he needed were a number of reliable contacts and a good knowledge of the needs of the three planets and four satellites colonized in the Centaurian system. Only three days earlier, Tremont had returned from his most recent trip to the old star, landing from the great interstellar ship on the outer moon of Centauri Seven, There he leased the small rocket, the Annabelle, registered more officially as the AC-7-4-525 for his local traveling. It would be another five days before he reached the inhabited moons of Centauri Six. He stopped next in the galley for a quick breakfast out of tubes, regretting the greater convenience of the starship then returned the towel and razor to his cabin. He decided that his slightly rumpled shirt and slacks of utilitarian gray would do for another day. About thirty-eight, an inch or two less than six feet, and muscularly slim, Tremont 
had an air of habitual neatness. His dark hair, thinning at the temples, was clipped short and brushed straight back. There were smile wrinkles at the corners of his blue eyes and grooving his lean cheeks. He closed the cabin doors and pulled himself forward to enter the control room through the partly open hatch. The forward bulkhead offered no more headroom than did his own cabin, but there seemed to be more breathing space because the chamber was not quartered. Deck space, however, was at such a premium because of the controls, acceleration couches, and astrogating equipment that the hatch was the largest clear area. Two men and a girl startled eyes upon Tremont as he rose into their view. One of the men, about forty-five, but sporting a youngish manner to match his blond crew-cut and tanned features, glanced quickly at his wrist-watch. "'Am I too early?' demanded Tremont, with sudden coldness. "'What are you doing with my case there?' The girl, in her early twenties, and carefully pretty, with her long black hair neatly netted for space, snatched back a small hand from the steel strong-box that was shaped to fit into an attaché case. The second man, under thirty, but thick-waisted in a grey t-shirt, said in the next breath, "'Take him!' Too late, Tremont saw that the speaker had already braced a foot against the far bulkhead. Then the broad face with its crooked blob of a nose above a ridiculous little moustache shot across the chamber at him. Desperately, Tremont groped for a hold that would help him either to avoid the charge or to pull himself back into the shaft, but he was caught half in and half out. He met the rush with a fist, but the tangle of bodies immediately became confusing beyond belief as the other pair joined in. Something cracked across the back of his head, much too hard to have been accidental. When Tremont began to function again, it took him only a few seconds to realize that life had been going on without him for some little time. For one thing, the heavy man's nosebleed had stopped, and he was tenderly combing blood from his moustache with the fingertip. For another, they had managed to stuff Tremont into a spacesuit and haul him down the shaft to the airlock. Someone had noosed the thumbs of the gauntlets together and tied the cord to the harness supporting the air tanks. Tremont twisted his head around to eye the three of them without speaking. He was trying to decide where he had made his mistake. Bill Bra, the elderly youth with the crew cut, Ralph Peters, the pilot who had come with the ship, Dorothy Stauber, the trim brunette who had made the trip from Earth on the same starship as Tremont. He could not make up his mind without more to go on. Then he remembered with a sinking sensation that all of them had been clustered about his case of papers and microfilms when he had interrupted them. "'I trust you aren't thinking of making us any trouble, Tremont,' drawled Bra. "'Give up the idea. You've been no trouble at all.' "'Where do you think this is getting you?' demanded Tremont. Bra chuckled. "'Wherever it would have gotten you,' he said, "'only at less expense.' "'Ask him for the combination,' growled Peters. Bra scrutinized Tremont's expression. "'It would probably take us a while, Ralph,' he decided regretfully. "'It's simpler to put him outside now and be free to use tools on the box.' Tremont opened his mouth to protest, but Bra clapped the helmet over his head and screwed it fast. "'You'll never read the code,' yelled Tremont, struggling to break free. "'Those papers are no good to you without me.' Someone slammed him against the bulkhead and held him there with his face to it. He could do nothing with his hands, joined as they were, and very little with his feet. It dawned upon him that they could not hear a word, and he fell silent. Twisting his head to peer out the side curve of his vision band, he caught a glimpse of Peters suiting up. A few minutes later they opened the inner hatch of the airlock and shoved Tremont inside. Peters followed gripping him firmly about the knees from behind. "'Here we go,' grunted Peters, and Tremont realized that he could communicate again over their suit radios. "'You won't get far trying to read the code I have those papers written in,' he warned. "'You better talk this over before you make a mistake.' "'Ain't no mistake about it,' said Peters, pressing toward the outer hatch. So you chartered the rocket. You felt you ought to go out to see about a heavy dust particle hitting the hull. 
You fell off, and we never found you. How will you explain not going yourself, or not finding me by instruments? Peters clubbed Tremont's foot from the tank rack he had hooked with the toe. How could I go? Leave the ship without a pilot? And the screens are for picking up meteorites far enough out to mean something at the speeds they travel. So you were too close to register, leastways till it was way too late. You must have suffocated when your air ran out. Tremont scrabbled about with his feet for some kind of hold. The outer hatch began to open. He could see stars out there. Wait! shouted Tremont. It was too late. He felt himself shoot forward, as if Peters had thrust a foot into the small of his back and shoved. Tremont tried to grab at the edge of the airlock, but it was gone. A puff of air frosted about him, its human bullet. The stars spun slowly before his eyes. After a moment, the gleaming hull of the Annabelle swam into his field of view. It was already thirty feet away, and the airlock was closing. He caught a glimpse of a space-suited figure with the light behind it. Then he was looking at the stars again. The small, distant brilliance of Alpha Centauri made him squint in the split second before the suit's photoelectric cells caused filters to flip down before his eyes. Then it was stars again, and the filters retracted. "'They can't do this,' said Tremont. "'Peters, do you hear me? You can't get away with this.' There was no answer. The rocket came into view again, farther away. He had to get back somehow. Forgetting the bound position of his hands, he attempted to check his belt equipment. Holding his arms as far as possible from his body was not enough to let him get a look at the harness from within his helmet. He tugged violently at the cord holding the thumbs of his gauntlets, and thought it gave slightly. Maybe it just tightened, he thought. To free his hands, he drew his arms in through the wide armpits of the suit sleeves, built that way to enable the wearer to feed himself, wipe his brow, or adjust clothing or heating units within the suit. He felt more comfortable, but that got him nowhere except for the chance to consult his wristwatch. Set at the lunar time of Centauri 7-4, it told him that when he had gone out of the airlock five minutes before, the time had been 1736. It did not strike Tremont as being a very promising bit of data, warning him merely that when he began to feel the want of air, it would be about 2130. He longed for a penknife. "'There's one thing I'm going to ask about on my next trip to Seoul, if I make one,' he muttered. "'Has anyone developed a reliable small-suit airlock, so you could pass things out from your pockets?' He thrust his hands once more into the arms of the suit, and felt as far along his belt as he could. He did manage to reach the usual position of the standard rocket pistol. The hook was empty. "'Well, that's that.' he groaned. They didn't forget. I have nothing to maneuver with. He pondered wearily. Perhaps the air, if he dared to waste any, it would make a small jet. Slow, but he had all the rest of his life. He settled down to picking at the cord about his thumbs with the tips of the other fingers in his gauntlets. It seemed possible that he might in time chew it up to the point where it could be snapped. The stars streamed slowly past his line of vision as he spun through the emptiness. Two or three little bits of the cord chipped off and drifted away. Tremont realized that it was frozen and brittle. He redoubled his efforts. After a few minutes of clumsy clicking of fingertips against thumbs, he strained to pull his hands apart. The cord parted, and his arms jerked out to their full spread with such suddenness that he felt his backbone creak. For a moment he hung motionless inside his suit, wondering if he had hurt himself. Recovering, he groped about, checking for his equipment. He discovered that nothing had been left, no knife, no rocket pistol, no line with magnet for securing oneself to a hull. "'Well, at least I can reach the valves of the air tanks,' he reassured himself. He watched for the ship, so as to judge his direction. Several minutes passed before he allowed himself to recognize the truth of his situation. He could no longer see the gleam of Alpha Centauri on the hull. He was already too far out to dare to waste air. He might give away his last four hours of life just to send himself in the wrong direction. 
How did I get myself into this? he groaned. He set himself to thinking back to his meetings with the others. Dorothy Stauber had landed from the same starship after passage from Seoul, but he had not become acquainted with her during the trip except to pass the time of day. He seemed to remember that she had turned up in the customs dome to ask his advice on travel. Yeah, he growled to himself, after I phoned to lease a rocket. She must have known. But how? Someone in the shipping office? Well, why not Peters, the pilot? And then Bra had come along, pretending to have been on his way back to Centauri Six, and hoping to buy a fast passage on a small vessel for business reasons. He had been free and ready with his money, leading Tremont to consider cutting his own expenses on the charter. It seemed, on the face of it, that the three of them had never met until the Annabelle lifted. But they had, all right, Tremont told himself. That was no chance. Anywhere along the line, I've been very neatly hijacked. The girl must have trailed him to make sure they picked up the right man. Bra had never ex explained exactly what he was doing on the satellite. He could have arranged for the assignment of the rocket, or perhaps of the pilot, when Tremont called. Then they had gathered around to hitch rides, and had been in control ever since. Tremont looked at the slowly progressing constellations, and cursed himself. He began to have the feeling that there would be no way out of this. They would regret pitching him into space in such an offhand manner he reminded himself, when they opened his case. It would be too late, as far as he was concerned. Come to think of it, he considered, that Bra looks pretty smart under that idiot kid pose. He might just break my code, given time, and the parts made up of model photos or drawings he can sell almost as is. When he came to think of it, Tremont was surprised that no one had tried the same racket before. He had laid out a fortune for what the three thieves were stealing from him. He drew in his left arm again, and raised the wrist to the neck of his helmet. But looking down his nose, he discovered to his surprise that he had been out nearly an hour. He had wasted more time than he had thought in reviewing his earlier encounters with Dorothy aboard the starship and the others at the spaceport. He raised the water tube to his mouth and sucked in a mouthful. The taste was stale. I could do with a beer if this is the way I'm going out, he thought. They can joke all they want about dying in bed after traveling to the stars, but you could order a beer even if it killed you. It gradually dawned upon him that the hazy light he had accepted as being a nebula must be something closer. He watched for it, and discovered after a few moments that it was growing brighter. It continued to do so for half an hour. It might be another ship, he breathed. Then he began to shout, Mayday! Mayday! over his radio. He kept it up for nearly a quarter of an hour, even after the outline was definitely recognizable as a rocket. He found himself drifting across its course near the bow. It was hard to estimate the distance, but he guessed it to be something like a hundred yards. Drift in? he asked himself. It should be going past me like a shooting star, unless they took exactly the same curve from Centauri Seven. Then he could read the numbers he feared to see. AC-7-4-525, his own ship. He had gone out of the airlock, mainly on a puff of air, with some fumbling help from Peters. That had been enough to send him out of sight of the ship. In space, not necessarily very far. And now he was back, after two hours. A long, flat orbit in relation to the ship he told himself, remembering in time to avoid speaking aloud that Bra might be at the ship's radio, but actually weaving back and forth across the rocket's course, just nipping it at this end. He edged a hand inside the suit again, and turned off his radio. If he found an answer, it would be fatal to be overheard mumbling about it. The ship now seemed to be rushing at him, and Tremont deduced that his orbital speed had increased as he approached the focus represented by the Annabelle. He would doubtless pass near the airlock at about his expulsion speed. "'Here's a chance,' he exulted. "'A little air let out to slow down, or oh, even just to veer close enough to lay hands on something. You launched me, Peters, but you didn't lose me.' "'Getting through the airlock should be easy enough,' 
he might be well up the shaft before the others emerged from the control room. In fact, unless Peters were on watch, the airlock operating signal might flash unnoticed on the board. "'And I'll be cracking skulls before they know what's up,' he growled. It struck him with a flash of ironic amusement that he had not felt half so much hate when believing himself doomed. After two hours of sweating out his helplessness, he had discovered a lively resentment of the vicious callousness with which he had been jettisoned. He was only about twenty-five yards away now, seemingly circling the ship. Peering closer, he saw that actually he was sweeping in toward it. "'Now, be ready with the air tank valve, just in case,' he warned himself. The great fins loomed to his right. The hull blotted most of the sky from his view. It looked as if he would curve down to a spot beside the same airlock from which he had been expelled. It seemed to be still open. Then he saw the shape of a helmet rise around the curve of the ship. Someone was out on the hull. Tremont switched on his radio and listened. The space-suited figure climbed completely into view. There appeared to be a line running from the belt into the airlock, and the figure carried a long pole of some sort. "'Oh, there you are, Tremont,' came Bra's voice over the receiver. "'I've been waiting for you.' The chuckle that followed made Tremont curse, which in turn provoked a hearty laugh from the other. "'You didn't think I'd forgot you,' said Bra. "'We figured out what happened as soon as we heard you were putting out those distress calls. After that, it was just a matter of timing.' Have you had an amusing trip? Have you found out you can't make anything of those papers yet? countered Tremont. Oh, the coding? It might take a little time, but we have plenty. Now, now, Tremont, that kind of abusive language will get you nowhere. Tremont had drifted to a point above the other's head, almost within reach. He was kicking out in little motions that betrayed his eagerness to come to grips with bra or something solid. "'Why, Tremont, I do believe that you thought I came out to bargain with you,' chuckled the blond man. "'Not at all. I told you that you'd be no trouble. I just came out to finish the job Peters bungled.' Tremont saw the pole jabbing upward at his stomach. Instinctively he grabbed at the end. Bra was not disturbed. "'Take it with you, then,' he laughed, letting go his end with a powerful push. Let me know if you're alive the next time you come around, so I can come out again. Tremont began to swear at him, then got a grip on himself long enough to snap his radio off. He had begun pulling himself down the pole when Bra had shoved. That sapped some of the force, but it was still enough to send him spinning out into the void once more. The ship receded slowly. He saw Bra return to the airlock and enter. A moment later, that light was cut off and Tremont began to back off into space as he had the first time. "'They know all about it,' he realized. "'They could leave me any time just by burning a little fuel. Peters wouldn't care about wasting it. I paid for it. Maybe he's just too lazy to calculate the course correction.' If so, he decided, the pilot was right. Tremont might drift back, but two more hours from now, when he would be at his closest, it would be too late. He would be too near the end of his air to use it to make sure of the last few feet. He looked at the pole in his grip. It was an eight-foot section of aluminum from the cargo racks. "'Maybe,' he muttered. Whirling the pole around by the end, he managed, after considerable trial and error, to slow his wild spin enough to keep the ship in view. The only question, then, was whether he dared to take the chance, and he really had but one choice. The full orbit would be too long a period. He estimated as well as he could the direction of his progress, allowed a few degrees which he fondly hoped would curve him in to a closer approach at the meeting point, and hurled the pole into space with all his strength. After that there was nothing to do but wait and hoped that he had cut his speed enough to bring him to the ship ahead of schedule by a shorter orbit. Tremont finally gave up looking at his watch when he found himself peeping every three minutes, on the average. The immensity of space was by now instilling him a psychological chill, and he drew both arms in from their sleeves to hug an illusion of warmth 
to him. The air pressure in the sleeves gradually overpowered the springs of the joints and extended them to make a cross. As far as he could tell from the gauges lined in a miniature row along the neckpiece of the suit, his heating system was functioning as designed. The batteries had an excellent chance of lasting longer than he would. He began to dwell upon thoughts of squeezing Peters in the steel grip of his gauntlets until the pilot's fat face turned purple and his eyes popped. Another promising activity would be to bang Bra's head against a bulkhead with one hand and Dorothy's with the other. "'Wonder if they found the gun in my locker,' he mused. Finally, only a lifetime or two after he hoped to see it, he sighted the ship again. His watch claimed the trip had lasted less than ninety minutes. He encountered unexpected trouble approaching the hull. Realizing that he was lucky to come close at all by such a guess, he tried to steer himself with brief jets from his air tank, and wound up on the verge of bashing directly into a fan. He avoided that, but had to use more air to spin back for a more gentle contact. The metal felt like solid earth to him as he seized the edge of a fin and planted the magnets of his boots firmly on the hull. It was perhaps twenty minutes later, when Tremont was beginning to worry again about his air supply, that the hatch of the airlock began to open. Crystals of frost puffed out as the water vapor left the air. Bra's helmet appeared, then the whole space-suited figure floated up before the spot where Tremont was watching. The hijacker dropped the magnet of his lifeline against the hull and started to turn around. Tremont grabbed the edge of the hatch with one hand, yanked the magnet loose with the other, and kicked Bra in the right area. The space-suited figure shot off, tumbling end over end into the void. A startled squawk sounded over Tremont's receiver. "'See how you like it!' he snarled. He ignored the begging of the suddenly frightened voice and dived into the airlock. In seconds he had the outer hatch shut and was nervously watching the air pressure building up on the gauge. If they notice it all, they'll think it's Bra coming back, he exulted. He made it into the central shaft without meeting anyone. Pulling himself forward in the bulky suit was an awkward task, but well worth it for the expression on Peter's face when Tremont burst through the control room hatch. After dealing with the pilot in about two minutes, most of it spent in catching him, Tremont went back along the shaft and found Dorothy in her bunk. Before she could release the netting, he folded the bunk upon her and secured it to the hook. Only then did he allow himself the time to remove his helmet and make free of the ship's air. "'What are you going to do?' demanded the girl, rather shrilly. Tremont realized that she must have seen the unconscious Peters floating outside in the shaft. "'You won't like it,' he promised. "'Tremont, I didn't know they'd do anything to you. Can't you and I make some kind of deal?' Tremont stared at her lovely. "'But I'd have to really sleep some time,' he pointed out gently. "'How can I trust you?' He was hardly a million miles out from the satellite system of Centauri Six when the space patrol ship he had called, managed to put a pilot aboard to land the Annabelle for him on the largest moon. Tremont returned wearily from helping the man in the airlock, which he did with a practice efficiency that surprised the pilot, to resume his talk with the patrol ship captain waiting on the screen. "'We could have done it sooner, you know,' said the latter, curiously. "'Well, now that I see him beside you, perhaps you'll explain your request to delay, and also what those pips trailing you are.' "'It's all the same story,' said Tremont, and explained his difficulties. The patrol captain frowned and expressed a wish to lay hands on the hijackers. "'Well, the due back in,' Tremont consulted his watch, "'about two hours. I wanted them near the ends of their orbits as you approached.' You mean there are three bodies out there? Live ones, in spacesuits, said Tremont. Experience is a great teacher. As soon as I sighted Bra coming back, I set up a regular system. He explained how he had removed all tools from the three spacesuits, added extra tanks, and stuffed the trio into them, either unconscious or at gunpoint. 
Then, having fastened the ankles together and wired the wrists to the thighs so they couldn't move at all, I launched them one at a time with enough pressure in the airlock to give four-hour orbits. That gave me sleeping time. And what about them? asked the captain. Oh, at the end of that period, they'd come drifting in at one-hour intervals. Counting all the necessary operations, each of them got thirty minutes actually out of the suit to eat and so on. Then out he'd go while I fished in the next one. They didn't like it, but they weren't so tough one at a time. Let's see, mused the captain. Every four hours. You'd have to spend, why, only two hours processing them. As a result, you kept complete control and came shooting in here with your own satellite system revolving about you and your friends. How have they been passing the time? Well, either figuring out how to take me next time, guessed Tremont, or wishing they were moving in more honest circles. End of Satellite System by Horace Brown Fife. The Skull by Philip K. Dick. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Greg Marguerite. The Skull by Philip K. Dick. Conger agreed to kill a stranger he had never seen, but he would make no mistakes, because he had the stranger's skull under his arm. "'What is this opportunity?' Conger asked. "'Go on. I'm interested.' The room was silent. All faces were fixed on Conger, still in the drab prison uniform. The speaker leaned forward slowly. "'Before you went to prison, your trading business was paying well all illegal, all very profitable. Now you have nothing, except the prospect of another six years in a cell." Conger scowled. "'There is a certain situation, very important to this council, that requires your peculiar abilities. Also, it is a situation you might find interesting. You were a hunter, were you not? You've done a great deal of trapping, hiding in the bushes, waiting at night for the game. I imagine hunting must be a source of satisfaction to you. The chase. The stalking." Conger sighed. His lips twisted. "'All right,' he said. Leave that out. Get to the point. Who do you want me to kill?' The speaker smiled. "'All in proper sequence,' he said softly. The car slid to a stop. It was night. There was no light anywhere along the street. Conger looked out. "'Where are we? What is this place?' The hand of the guard pressed into his arm. Come. Through that door. Conger stepped down onto the damp sidewalk. The guard came swiftly after him, and then the speaker. Conger took a deep breath of the cold air. He studied the dim outline of the building rising up before them. I know this place. I've seen it before. He squinted, his eyes growing accustomed to the dark. Suddenly he became alert. This is— Yes, the first church. The speaker walked toward the steps. We're expected. Expected? Here? Yes. The speaker mounted the stairs. You know we're not allowed in their churches, especially with guns. He stopped. Two armed soldiers loomed up ahead, one on each side. All right. The speaker looked up at them. They nodded. The door of the church was open. Conger could see other soldiers inside, standing about young soldiers with large eyes gazing at the icons and holy images. I see, he said. It was necessary, the speaker said. As you know, we have been singularly unfortunate in the past in our relations with the First Church. This won't help, but it's worth it. You will see. They passed through the hall and into the main chamber where the altarpiece was and the kneeling places. The speaker scarcely glanced at the altar as they passed by. He pushed open a small side door and beckoned Conger through. In here. We have to hurry. The faithful will be flocking in soon. Conger entered, blinking. They were in a small chamber, low-ceilinged, with dark panels of old wood. There was a smell of ashes and smoldering spices in the room. 
He sniffed. What's that? The smell? Cups on the wall, I don't know. The speaker crossed impatiently to the far side. According to our information, it is hidden here by this... Conger looked around the room. He saw books and papers, holy signs and images. A strange low shiver went through him. Does my job involve anyone in the church? If it does... The speaker turned astonished. Can it be that you believe in the Founder? Is it possible a hunter, a killer? No, of course not. All their business about resignation to death and non-violence. What is it, then? Conger shrugged. I've been taught not to mix with such as these. They have strange abilities, and you can't reason with them. The speaker studied Conger thoughtfully. You have the wrong idea. It is no one here that we have in mind. We've found that killing them only tends to increase their numbers. Then why come here? Let's leave. No. We came for something important, something you will need to identify your man. Without it you won't be able to find him. A trace of a smile crossed the speaker's face. We don't want you to kill the wrong person. It's too important. I don't make mistakes. Conger's chest rose. Listen, speaker. This is an unusual situation, the speaker said. You see, the person you are after, the person that we are sending you to find, is known only by certain objects here. They are the only traces, the only means of identification. Without them, what are they? He came toward the speaker. The speaker moved to one side. Look, he said. He drew a sliding wall away, showing a dark square hole. In there. Conger squatted down, staring in. He frowned. A skull! A skeleton! The man you are after has been dead for two centuries, the speaker said. This is all that remains of him, and this is all you have with which to find him. For a long time Conger said nothing. He stared down at the bones, dimly visible in the recess of the wall. How could a man dead centuries be killed? How could he be stalked and brought down? Conger was a hunter, a man who had lived as he pleased, where he pleased. He had kept himself alive by trading, bringing furs and pelts in from the provinces on his own ship, riding at high speed, slipping through the customs line around Earth. He had hunted in the great mountains of the moon. He had stalked through empty Martian cities. He had explored. The speaker said, Soldier, take these objects and have them carried to the car. Don't lose any part of them. The soldier went into the cupboard, reaching gingerly, squatting on his heels. It is my hope, the speaker continued softly to Conger, that you will demonstrate your loyalty to us now. There are always ways for citizens to restore themselves, to show their devotion to their society. For you, I think this would be a very good chance. I seriously doubt that a better one will come along. And for your efforts there will be quite a restitution, of course. The two men looked at each other, Conger, thin, unkempt, the speaker, immaculate in his uniform. I understand you, Conger said. I mean, I understand this part about the chance. But how can a man who has been dead two centuries be— I'll explain that later, the speaker said. Right now we have to hurry. The soldier had gone out with the bones, wrapped in a blanket, held carefully in his arms. The speaker walked to the door. Come. They've already discovered that we've broken in here, and they'll be coming at any moment. They hurried down the damp steps to the waiting car. A second later the driver lifted the car up into the air, above the housetops. The speaker settled back in the seat. The first church has an interesting past, he said. I suppose you are familiar with it, but I'd like to speak of a few points that are of relevancy to us. It was the twentieth century that the movement began during one of the periodic wars. The movement developed rapidly, feeding on the general sense of futility, the realization that each war was breeding greater war with no end in sight. The movement posed a simple answer to the problem. Without military preparations, weapons, there could be no war, and without machinery and complex scientific technocracy there could be no weapons. The movement preached that you couldn't stop war by planning for it. They preached that man was losing to his machinery and science, that it was getting away from him, pushing him into greater and greater wars. 
Down with society, they shouted. Down with factories and science. A few more wars and there wouldn't be much left of the world. The founder was an obscure person from a small town in the American Middle West. We don't even know his name. All we know is that one day he appeared, preaching a doctrine of non-violence, non-resistance, no fighting, no paying taxes for guns, no research except for medicine. Live out your life quietly, tending to your garden, staying out of public affairs. Mind your own business. Be obscure, unknown, poor. Give away most of your possessions. Leave the city. At least that was what developed from what he told the people. The car dropped down and landed on a roof. The founder preached this doctrine, or the germ of it. There's no telling how much the faithful have added themselves. The local authorities picked him up at once, of course. Apparently they were convinced that he meant it. He was never released. He was put to death and his body buried secretly. It seemed that the cult was finished. The speaker smiled. Unfortunately, some of his disciples reported seeing him after the date of his death. The rumor spread. He had conquered death. He was divine. It took hold, grew. And here we are today, with a first church obstructing all social progress, destroying society, sowing the seeds of anarchy. But the wars, Conger said, about them. The wars? Well, there were no more wars. It must be acknowledged that the elimination of war was the direct result of nonviolence practiced on a general scale. But we can take a more objective view of war today. What was so terrible about it? War had a profound selective value, perfectly in accord with the teachings of Darwin and Mendel and others. Without war, the mass of useless, incompetent mankind, without training or intelligence, is permitted to grow and expand unchecked. War acted to reduce their numbers, like storms and earthquakes and droughts. It was nature's way of eliminating the unfit. Without war, the lower elements of mankind have increased all out of proportion. They threaten the educated few, those with scientific knowledge and training, the ones equipped to direct society. They have no regard for science or for a scientific society based on reason. And this movement seeks to aid and abet them. Only when scientists are in full control can the— He looked at his watch and then kicked the car door open. I'll tell you the rest as we walk. They crossed the dark roof. Doubtless you now know whom those bones belong to, who it is that we are after. He has been dead just two centuries now, this ignorant man from the Middle West, this founder. The tragedy is that the authorities of the time acted too slowly. They allowed him to speak, to get his message across. He was allowed to preach, to start his cult. And once such a thing is under way, there's no stopping it. But what if he had died before he preached? What if none of his doctrines had ever been spoken? It took only a moment for him to utter them, that we know. They say he spoke just once, just one time. Then the authorities came, taking him away. He offered no resistance. The incident was small. The speaker turned to Conger. Small, but we're reaping the consequences of it today. They went inside the building. Inside, the soldiers had already laid out this skeleton on a table. The soldiers stood around it, their young faces intense. Conger went over to the table, pushing past them. He bent down, staring at the bones. So, these are his remains, he murmured. The founder. The church has hidden them for two centuries? Quite so, the speaker said. But now we have them. Come along down the hall. They went across the room to a door. The speaker pushed it open. Technicians looked up. Conger saw machinery whirring and turning, benches and retorts. In the center of the room was a gleaming crystal cage. The speaker handed a slam gun to Conger. The important thing to remember is that the skull must be saved and brought back for comparison and proof. Aim low, at the chest. Conger weighed the gun in his hands. It feels good, he said. I know this gun. That is, I've seen them before, but I've never used one. The speaker nodded. You will be instructed on the use of the gun and the operation of the cage. You will be given all data we have on the time and location. The exact spot was a place called Hudson's Field, about 1960, in a small community outside Denver, Colorado. 
And don't forget, the only means of identification you will have will be the skull. There are visible characteristics of the front teeth, especially the left incisor." Conger listened absently. He was watching two men in white carefully wrapping the skull in a plastic bag. They tied it and carried it into the crystal cage. And if I should make a mistake? Pick the wrong man? Then find the right one. Don't come back until you succeed in reaching this founder. And you can't wait for him to start speaking. That's what we must avoid. You must act in advance. Take chances. Shoot as soon as you think you've found him. He'll be someone unusual, probably a stranger in the area. Apparently he wasn't known." Conger listened dimly. "'Do you think you have it all now?' the speaker asked. "'Yes, I think so.' Conger entered the crystal cage and sat down, placing his hands on the wheel. "'Good luck,' the speaker said. "'We'll be awaiting the outcome. There's some philosophical doubt as to whether one can alter the past. This should answer the question once and for all." Conger fingered the controls of the cage. By the way, the speaker said, uh, don't try to use this cage for purposes not anticipated in your job. We have a constant trace on it. If we want it back, we can get it back. Good luck. Conger said nothing. The cage was sealed. He raised his finger and touched the wheel control. He turned the wheel carefully. He was still staring at the plastic bag when the room outside vanished. For a long time there was nothing at all, nothing beyond the crystal mesh of the cage. Thoughts rushed through Conger's mind helter-skelter. How would he know the man? How could he be certain in advance? What had he looked like? What was his name? How had he acted before he spoke? Would he be an ordinary person or some strange outlandish crank? Conger picked up the slam gun and held it against his cheek. The metal of the gun was cool and smooth. He practiced moving the sight. It was a beautiful gun, the kind of gun he could fall in love with. If he had owned such a gun in the Martian desert, on the long nights when he had lain cramped and numbed with cold, waiting for things that moved through the darkness. He put the gun down and adjusted the meter reading of the cage. The spiraling mist was beginning to condense and settle. All at once forms wavered and fluttered around him. Colors, sounds. Movements filtered through the crystal wire. He clamped the controls off and stood up. He was on a ridge overlooking a small town. It was high noon. The air was crisp and bright. A few automobiles moved along a road. Off in the distance were some level fields. Conger went to the door and stepped outside. He sniffed the air. Then he went back into the cage. He stood before the mirror over the shelf, examining his features. He had trimmed his beard, they had not got him to cut it off, and his hair was neat. He was dressed in the clothing of the middle twentieth century, the odd collar and coat, the shoes of animal hide. In his pocket was money of the times. That was important. Nothing more was needed. Nothing except his ability, his special cunning, but he had never used it in such a way before. He walked down the road toward the town. The first things he noticed were the newspapers on the stands. April 5, 1961. He was not too far off. He looked around him. There was a filling station, a garage, some taverns, and a ten-cent store. Down the street was a grocery store and some public buildings. A few minutes later he mounted the stairs of the little public library and passed through the doors into the warm interior. The librarian looked up, smiling. Good afternoon, she said. He smiled, not speaking because his words would not be correct, accented and strange, probably. He went over to a table and sat down by a heap of magazines. For a moment he glanced through them. Then he was on his feet again. He crossed the room to a wide rack against the wall. His heart began to beat heavily. Newspapers. Weeks on end. He took a roll of them over to the table and began to scan them quickly. The print was odd, the letters strange, some of the words were unfamiliar. He set the papers aside and searched farther. At last he found what he wanted. He carried the Cherrywood Gazette to the table and opened it to the first page. He found what he wanted. Prisoner hangs self, an unidentified man held by the county sheriff's office for suspicion of criminal syndicalism was found dead this morning by— He finished the item. It was vague 
uninforming. He needed more. He carried the Gazette back to the racks, and then, after a moment's hesitation, approached the librarian. More? he asked. More papers? Old ones? She frowned. How old? Which papers? Months old, and before. Of the Gazette? This is all we have. What did you want? What are you looking for? Maybe I can help you. He was silent. You might find older issues at the Gazette office, the woman said, taking off her glasses. Why don't you try there? But if you'd tell me, maybe I could help you. He went out. The Gazette office was down a side street. The sidewalk was broken and cracked. He went inside. A heater glowed in the corner of the small office. A heavy-set man stood up and came slowly over to the counter. "'What did you want, mister?' he said. "'Old papers. Uh, a month or more. To buy? You want to buy them?' "'Yes.' He held out some of the money he had. The man stared. "'Sure,' he said. "'Sure. Uh, wait a minute.' He went quickly out of the room. When he came back he was staggering under the weight of his armload, his face red. "'Here are some,' he grunted. Took what I could find. Covers the whole year. And if you want more—" Conger carried the papers outside. He sat down by the road and began to go through them. What he wanted was four months back, in December. It was a tiny item, so small that he almost missed it. His hands trembled as he scanned it, using the small dictionary for some of the archaic terms. Man arrested for unlicensed demonstration. An unidentified man who refused to give his name was picked up in Cooper Creek by special agents of the sheriff's office, according to Sheriff Duff. It was said the man was recently noticed in this area and had been watched continually. It was Cooper Creek, December 1960. His heart pounded. That was all he needed to know. He stood up, shaking himself, stamping his feet on the cold ground. The sun had moved across the sky to the very edge of the hills. He smiled. Already he had discovered the exact time and place. Now he needed only to go back, perhaps to November, to Cooper Creek. He walked back through the main section of town, past the library, past the grocery store. It would not be hard. The hard part was over. He would go there, rent a room, prepare to wait until the man appeared. He turned the corner. A woman was coming out of the doorway, loaded down with packages. Conger stepped aside to let her pass. The woman glanced at him. Suddenly her face turned white. She stared. Her mouth opened. Conger hurried on. He looked back. What was wrong with her? The woman was still staring. She had dropped the packages to the ground. He increased his speed. He turned a second corner and went up a side street. When he looked back again, the woman had come to the entrance of the street and was starting after him. A man joined her, and the two of them began to run toward him. He lost them and left the town, striding quickly, easily up into the hills at the edge of town. When he reached the cage, he stopped. What had happened? Was it something about his clothing? His dress? He pondered. Then, as the sun set, he stepped into the cage. Conger sat before the wheel. For a moment he waited, his hands resting lightly on the control. Then he turned the wheel, just a little, following the control readings carefully. The grayness settled down around him, but not for very long. The man looked him over critically. You'd better come inside, he said, out of the cold. Thanks. Conger went gratefully through the open door into the living room. It was warm and close from the heat of the little kerosene heater in the corner. A woman, large and shapeless in her flowered dress, came from the kitchen. She and the man studied him critically. It's a good room, the woman said. I'm Mrs. Appleton. It's got heat. You need that this time of year." Yes, he nodded, looking around. You want to eat with us? What? You want to eat with us? The man's brows knitted. You're not a foreigner, are you, mister? No, he smiled. I was born in this country. Quite far west, though. California? No, he hesitated. In Oregon. What's it like up there? Mrs. Appleton asked. I hear there's lots of trees and green. It's so barren here. I come from Chicago myself. That's the Middle West, the man said to her. You ain't no foreigner. 
Oregon isn't foreign either, Conger said. It's part of the United States. The man nodded absently. He was staring at Conger's clothing. That's a funny suit you got on, mister, he said. Where'd you get that? Conger was lost. He shifted uneasily. It's a good suit, he said. Maybe I better go some other place, if you don't want me here. They both raised their hands protestingly. The woman smiled at him. We just have to look out for those Reds. You know, the government is always warning us about them. The Reds? He was puzzled. The government says they're all around. We're supposed to report anything strange or unusual. Anybody doesn't act normal. Like me? They looked embarrassed. Well, you don't look like a Red to me, the man said, but we have to be careful. The Tribune says... Conger half listened. It was going to be easier than he had thought. Clearly he would know as soon as the Founder appeared. These people, so suspicious of anything different, would be buzzing and gossiping and spreading the story. All he had to do was lie low and listen, down at the general store, perhaps, or even here in Mrs. Appleton's boarding-house. Can I see the room? he said. Certainly. Mrs. Appleton went to the stairs. I'll be glad to show it to you. They went upstairs. It was colder upstairs, but not nearly as cold as outside, nor as cold as the nights on the Martian deserts. For that he was grateful. He was walking slowly around the store, looking at the cans of vegetables, the frozen packages of fish and meats shining and clean in the open refrigerator counters. Ed Davies came toward him. "'Can I help you?' he said. The man was a little oddly dressed, and with a beard. Ed couldn't help smiling. "'Nothing,' the man said in a funny voice, just looking. "'Sure,' Ed said. He walked back behind the counter. Mrs. Hackett was wheeling her cart up. "'Who's he?' she whispered, her sharp face turned, her nose moving as if it were sniffing. I've never seen him before. I don't know. Looks funny to me. Why does he wear a beard? No one else wears a beard. Must be something the matter with him. Maybe he likes to wear a beard. I had an uncle who— Wait! Mrs. Hackett stiffened. Didn't that—what was his name? The Red. That old one. Didn't he have a beard? Marks! He had a beard. Ed laughed. This ain't Karl Marx. I saw a photograph of him once. Mrs. Hackett was staring at him. You did? Sure, he flushed a little. What's the matter with that? I'd sure like to know more about him, Mrs. Hackett said. I think we ought to know more, for our own good. Hey, mister, want a ride? Conger turned quickly, dropping his hand to his belt. He relaxed. Two young kids in a car, a girl and a boy. He smiled at them. A ride? Sure. Conger got into the car and closed the door. Bill Woolett pushed the gas and the car roared down the highway. I appreciate a ride, Conger said carefully. I was taking a walk between towns, but it was farther than I thought. Where are you from? Laura Hunt asked. She was pretty, small, and dark in her yellow sweater and blue skirt. From Cooper Creek. Cooper Creek, Bill said. He frowned. That's funny. I don't remember seeing you before. Why? Do you come from there? I was born there. I know everybody there. I just moved in. From Oregon. From Oregon? I didn't know Oregon people had accents. Do I have an accent? You, you use words funny. How? I, I don't know. Doesn't he, Laura? You slur them, Laura said, smiling. Talk some more. I'm interested in dialects." She glanced at him, white-teethed. Conger felt his heart constrict. I, I, I have a speech impediment. Oh, her eyes widened. I'm sorry. They looked at him curiously as the car purred along. Conger, for his part, was struggling to find some way of asking them questions without seeming curious. I guess people from out of town don't come here much, he said. Strangers. No. Bill shook his head. Not very much. I'll bet I'm the first outsider for a long time. I guess so. Conger hesitated. A friend of mine, someone I know, might be coming through here. Where do you suppose I might— He stopped. 
would there be anyone certain to see him, someone I could ask, make sure I don't miss him if he comes? They were puzzled. Just keep your eyes open. Cooper Creek isn't very big. No, that's right. They drove in silence. Conger studied the outline of the girl. Probably she was the boy's mistress. Perhaps she was his trial wife. Or had they developed trial marriage back so far? He could not remember. But surely such an attractive girl would be someone's mistress by this time. She would be sixteen or so by her looks. He might ask her some time if they ever met again. The next day Conger went walking along the one main street of Cooper Creek. He passed the general store, the two filling stations, and then the post office. At the corner was the soda fountain. He stopped. Laura was sitting inside, talking to the clerk. She was laughing, rocking back and forth. Conger pushed the door open. Warm air rushed around him. Laura was drinking hot chocolate with whipped cream. She looked up in surprise as he slid into the seat beside her. I beg your pardon, he said. A am I intruding? No. She shook her head. Her eyes were large and dark. Not at all. The clerk came over. What do you want? Conger looked at the chocolate. Same as she has. Laura was watching Conger, her arms folded, elbows on the counter. She smiled at him. By the way, you don't know my name. Laura Hunt. She was holding out her hand. He took it awkwardly, not knowing what to do with it. Conger is my name, he murmured. Conger, is that your last or first name? Last or first? He hesitated. Last. Omar Conger. Omar? She laughed. That's like the poet Omar Khayyam. I don't know of him. I know very little of poets. We restored very few works of art. Usually only the church has been interested enough. He broke off. She was staring. He flushed. Where I come from, he finished. The church? Which church do you mean? The church? He was confused. The chocolate came, and he began to sip it gratefully. Laura was still watching him. You're an unusual person, she said. Bill didn't like you, but he never likes anything different. He's so so prosaic. Don't you think that when a person gets older he should become broadened in his outlook?" Conger nodded. He says foreign people ought to stay where they belong, not come here. But you're not so foreign. He means Orientals, you know? Conger nodded. The screen door opened behind them. Bill came into the room. He stared at them. Well, he said. Conger turned. Hello. Well. Bill sat down. Hello, Laura. He was looking at Conger. I didn't expect to see you here. Conger tensed. He could feel the hostility of the boy. Something wrong with that? No, nothing wrong with it. There was silence. Suddenly Bill turned to Laura. Come on, let's go. Go? She was astonished. Why? Just go. He grabbed her hand. Come on, the car's outside. Why, Bill Willett, Laura said. You're jealous. Who is this guy, Bill said. Do you know anything about him? Look at him. His beard. She flared. So what? Just because he doesn't drive a Packard and go to Cooper High? Conger sized the boy up. He was big, big and strong. Probably he was part of some civil control organization. Sorry, Conger said. I'll go. What's your business in town? Bill asked. What are you doing here? Why are you hanging around Laura? Conger looked at the girl. He shrugged. No reason. I'll see you later. He turned away and froze. Bill had moved. Conger's fingers went to his belt. Half pressure, he whispered to himself. No more. Half pressure. He squeezed. The room leaped around him. He himself was protected by the lining of his clothing, the plastic sheathing inside. My God! Lara put her hands up. Conger cursed. He hadn't meant any of it for her, but it would wear off. There was only a half amp to it. It would tingle, tingle and paralyze. He walked out the door without looking back. He was almost to the corner when Bill came slowly out, holding onto the wall like a drunken man. Conger went on. 
As Conger walked, restless in the night, a form loomed in front of him. He stopped, holding his breath. Who is it? A man's voice came. Conger waited, tense. Who is it? The man said again. He clicked something in his hand. A light flashed. Conger moved. It's me, he said. Who is me? Conger is my name. I'm staying at the Appleton's place. Who are you? The man came slowly up to him. He was wearing a leather jacket. There was a gun at his waist. I'm Sheriff Duff. I think you're the person I want to talk to. You were in Bloom's today, about three o'clock? Bloom's? The fountain, where the kids hang out. Duff came up beside him, shining his light into Conger's face. Conger blinked. Turn that thing away, he said. A pause. All right. The light flickered to the ground. You were there. Some trouble broke out between you and the Willet boy, is that right? You had a beef over this girl. We had a discussion, Conger said carefully. Then what happened? Why? I'm just curious. They say you did something. Did something? Did what? I don't know. That's what I'm wondering. They saw a flash and something seemed to happen. They all blacked out, couldn't move. How are they now? All right. There was silence. Well, Duff said. What was it? A bomb? A bomb? Conger laughed. No, my cigarette lighter caught fire. There was a leak and the fluid ignited. Why did they all pass out? Fumes? Silence. Conger shifted, waiting. His fingers moved slowly towards his belt. The sheriff glanced down. He grunted. If you say so, he said. Anyhow, there wasn't any real harm done. He stepped back from Conger. And that Willet is a troublemaker. Good night, then, Conger said. He started past the sheriff. One more thing, Mr. Conger, before you go. You don't mind if I look at your identification, do you? No, not at all. Conger reached into his pocket. He held his wallet out. The sheriff took it and shined his flashlight on it. Conger watched, breathing shallowly. They had worked hard on the wallet, studying historic documents, relics of the time, all the papers they felt would be relevant. Duff handed it back. Okay, sorry to bother you. The light winked off. When Conger reached the house, he found the Appletons sitting around the television set. They did not look up as he came in. He lingered at the door. Can I ask you something? He said. Mrs. Appleton turned slowly. Can I ask you, what's the date? The date? She studied him. The first of December. December first? Why, it was just November!" They were all looking at him. Suddenly he remembered in the twentieth century they still used the old twelve-month system. November fed directly into December. There was no quarter-member between. He gasped. Then it was tomorrow, the second of December, tomorrow. Thanks, he said, thanks. He went up the stairs. What a fool he was, forgetting. The founder had been taken into captivity on the 2nd of December, according to the newspaper records. Tomorrow, only twelve hours hence, the founder would appear to speak to the people and then be dragged away. The day was warm and bright. Conger's shoes crunched the melting crust of snow. On he went, through the trees heavy with white. He climbed a hill and strode down the other side, sliding as he went. He stopped to look around. Everything was silent. There was no one in sight. He brought a thin rod from his waist and turned the handle of it. For a moment nothing happened. Then there was a shimmering in the air. The crystal cage appeared and settled slowly down. Conger sighed. It was good to see it again. After all, it was his only way back. He walked up on the ridge. He looked around with some satisfaction, his hands on his hips. Hudson's Field was spread out all the way to the beginning of town. It was bare and flat, covered with a thin layer of snow. Here the Founder would come, here he would speak to them, and here the authorities would take him. Only he would be dead before they came, he would be dead before he even spoke. Conger returned to the crystal globe. He pushed through the door and stepped inside. He took the slim gun from the shelf and screwed the bolt into place. It was ready to go, ready to fire. For a moment he considered. 
Should he have it with him? No. It might be hours before the Founder came, and suppose someone approached him in the meantime. When he saw the Founder coming toward the field, then he could go and get the gun. Conger looked toward the shelf. There was the neat plastic package. He took it down and unwrapped it. He held the skull in his hands, turning it over. In spite of himself, a cold feeling rushed through him. This was the man's skull, the skull of the Founder, who was still alive, who would come here today, this day, who would stand on the field not fifty yards away. What if he could see this, his own skull yellow and eroded, two centuries old? Would he still speak? Would he speak if he could see it, the grinning aged skull? What would there be for him to say, to tell the people? What message could he bring? What action would not be futile when a man could look upon his own aged yellowed skull? Better they should enjoy their temporary lives while they still had them to enjoy. A man who could hold his own skull in his hands would believe in few causes, few movements. Rather, he would preach the opposite. A sound. Conger dropped the skull back on the shelf and took up the gun. Outside something was moving. He went quickly to the door, his heart beating. Was it he? Was it the Founder, wandering by himself in the cold, looking for a place to speak? Was he meditating over his words, choosing his sentences? What if he could see what Conger had held? He pushed the door open, the gun raised. Laura! He stared at her. She was dressed in a wool jacket and boots, her hands in her pockets. A cloud of steam came from her mouth and nostrils. Her breast was rising and falling. Silently they looked at each other. At last Conger lowered the gun. What is it? he said. What are you doing here? She pointed. She did not seem able to speak. He frowned. What was wrong with her? What is it? he said. What do you want? He looked in the direction she had pointed. I, I don't see anything. They're coming. They? Who? Who are coming? They are. The police. During the night the sheriff had the state police send cars, all around, everywhere, blocking the roads. There's about sixty of them coming, some from town, some from behind. She stopped gasping. They said, they said... What? They said you were some kind of a communist. They said... Conger went into the cage. He put the gun down on the shelf and came back out. He leaped down and went to the girl. Thanks. You came here to tell me? You don't believe it? I don't know. Did you come alone? No. Joe brought me in his truck, from town. Joe? Who's he? Joe French, the plumber. He's a friend of Dad's. Let's go. They crossed the snow, up the ridge and onto the field. The little panel truck was parked halfway across the field. A heavy short man was sitting behind the wheel, smoking his pipe. He sat up as he saw the two of them coming toward him. Are you the one? he said to Conger. Yes. Thanks for warning me. The plumber shrugged. I don't know anything about this. Laura says you're all right. He turned around. It might interest you to know some more of them are coming, not to warn you, just curious. More of them? Conger looked toward the town. Black shapes were picking their way across the snow. People from town. You can't keep this sort of thing quiet, not in a small town. We all listened to the police radio. They heard the same way Laura did. Someone tuned in, spread it around. The shapes were getting closer. Conger could make out a couple of them. Bill Willett was there with some boys from the high school. The Appletons were along, hanging back in the rear. Even Ed Davies, Conger murmured. The storekeeper was toiling onto the field with three or four other men from the town. All curious as hell, French said. Well, I guess I'm going back to town. I don't want my truck shot full of holes. Come on, Laura. She was looking up at Conger, wide-eyed. Come on, French said again. Let's go. You sure as hell can't stay here, you know. Why? There may be shooting. That's what they all came to see. You know that, don't you, Conger? Yes. You have a gun, or don't you care? French smiled a little. They've picked up a lot of people in their time, you know. You won't be lonely. He cared all right. He had to stay here, on the field. He couldn't afford to let them take him away. Any minute the Founder would appear, would step onto the field. 
Would he be one of the townsmen, standing silently at the foot of the field, waiting, watching? Or maybe he was Joe French, or maybe one of the cops. Any one of them might find himself moved to speak, and the few words spoken this day were going to be important for a long time. And Conger had to be there, ready when the first word was uttered. I care, he said. You go back to town. Take the girl with you. Laura got stiffly in beside Joe French. The plumber started up the motor. Look at them, standing there, he said, like vultures, waiting to see someone get killed. The truck drove away, Laura sitting stiff and silent, frightened now. Conger watched for a moment. Then he dashed back into the woods, between the trees, toward the ridge. He could get away, of course. Any time he wanted, he could get away. All he had to do was leap into the crystal cage and turn the handles. But he had a job. An important job. He had to be here. Here, at this place. At this time. He reached the cage and opened the door. He went inside and picked up the gun from the shelf. The Slem gun would take care of them. He notched it up to full count. The chain reaction from it would flatten them all. The police. The curious. Sadistic people. They wouldn't take him. Before they got him, all of them would be dead. He would get away. He would escape. By the end of the day, they would all be dead, if that was what they wanted. And he... He saw the skull. Suddenly he put the gun down. He picked up the skull. He turned the skull over. He looked at the teeth. Then he went to the mirror. He held the skull up, looking in the mirror. He pressed the skull against his cheek. Beside his own face, the grinning skull leered back at him, beside his skull, against his living flesh. He bared his teeth, and he knew. It was his own skull that he held. He was the one who would die. He was the founder. After a time he put the skull down. For a few minutes he stood at the controls, playing with them idly. He could hear the sound of motors outside, the muffled noise of men. Should he go back to the present where the speaker waited? He could escape, of course. Escape? He turned toward the skull. There it was, his skull, yellow with age. Escape? Escape when he had held it in his own hands? What did it matter if he put it off a month, a year, ten years, even fifty? Time was nothing. He had sipped chocolate with a girl born a hundred and fifty years before his time. Escape? For a little while, perhaps. But he could not really escape, no more so than anyone else had ever escaped, or ever would. Only he had held it in his hands, his own bones, his own death's head. They had not. He went out the door and across the field empty-handed. There were a lot of them standing around, gathered together, waiting. They expected a good fight. They knew he had something. They had heard about the incident at the fountain. And there were plenty of police. Police with guns and tear gas creeping across the hills and ridges between the trees closer and closer. It was an old story in this century. One of the men tossed something at him. It fell in the snow by his feet and he looked down. It was a rock. He smiled. Come on, one of them called. Don't you have any bombs? Throw a bomb. You with the beard, throw a bomb. Let them have it. Toss a few A-bombs. They began to laugh. He smiled. He put his hands to his hips. They suddenly turned silent, seeing that he was going to speak. I'm sorry, he said simply. I don't have any bombs. You're mistaken. There was a flurry of murmuring. I have a gun, he went on, a very good one, made by science even more advanced than your own. But I'm not going to use that, either. They were puzzled. Why not? Someone called. At the edge of the group, an older woman was watching. He felt a sudden shock. He had seen her before. Where? He remembered. The day at the library, as he had turned the corner, he had seen her. She had noticed him and been astounded. At the time, he did not understand why. Conger grinned. So he would escape death. The man who, right now, was voluntarily accepting it. They were laughing, laughing at a man who had a gun but didn't use it. But by a strange twist of science, he would appear again a few months later, after his bones had been buried under the floor of a jail. 
And so, in a fashion, he would escape death. He would die, but then, after a period of months, he would live again, briefly, for an afternoon. An afternoon, yet long enough for them to see him, to understand that he was still alive, to know that, somehow, he had returned to life. And then, finally, he would appear once more after two hundred years had passed, two centuries later. He would be born again, born as a matter of fact in a small trading village on Mars. He would grow up learning to hunt and trade. A police car came on the edge of the field and stopped. The people retreated a little. Conger raised his hands. I have an odd paradox for you, he said. Those who take lives will lose their own. Those who kill will die. But he who gives his own life away will live again. They laughed, faintly, nervously. The police were coming out, walking toward him. He smiled. He had said everything he intended to say. It was a good little paradox he had coined. They would puzzle over it, remember it. Smiling, Conger awaited a death foreordained. End of The Skull by Philip K. Dick Star Mother by Robert F. Young This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by T. C. Parmalee Star Mother by Robert F. Young A touching story of the most enduring love in all eternity. That night her son was the first star. She stood motionless in the garden, one hand pressed against her heart, watching him rise above the fields where he had played as a boy. And she wondered whether he was thinking of those fields now, whether he was thinking of her standing alone in the April night with her memories, whether he was thinking of the verandahed house behind her, with its empty rooms and silent halls, that once upon a time had been his birthplace. Higher still and higher he rose in the southern sky, and then, when he had reached his zenith, he dropped swiftly down past the dark edge of the earth and disappeared from sight. A boy grown up too soon, riding round and round the world on a celestial carousel, encased in an airtight metal capsule in an airtight metal chariot. Why don't they leave the stars alone, she thought. Why don't they leave the stars to God? The general's second telegram came early the next morning. Explorer 12 doing splendidly. Expect to bring your son down sometime tomorrow. She went about her work as usual, collecting the eggs and allocating them in their cardboard boxes, then setting off in the station wagon on her Tuesday morning run. She had expected a deluge of questions from her customers. She was not disappointed. Is Terry really way up there all alone, Martha? Aren't you scared, Martha? I do hope they can get him back down all right, Martha. She supposed it must have given them quite a turn to have their egg woman change into a star mother overnight. She hadn't expected the TV interview, though, and she would have avoided it if it had been politely possible. But what could she do when the line of cars and trucks pulled into the drive and the technicians got out and started setting up their equipment in the back yard. What could she say when the suave young man came up to her and said, We want you to know that we're all very proud of your boy up there, ma'am, and we hope you'll do us the honor of answering a few questions. Most of the questions concerned Harry, as was fitting. From the way the suave young man asked them, though, she got the impression that he was trying to prove that her son was just like any other average American boy, and such just didn't happen to be the case. But whenever she opened her mouth to mention, say, how he used to study till all hours of the night, or how difficult it had been for him to make friends because of his shyness, or the fact that he had never gone out for football, 
Whenever she started to mention any of these things, the suave young man was in great haste to interrupt her and to twist her words by re-questioning into a different meaning altogether, till Terry's behavior pattern seemed to coincide with the behavior pattern which the suave young man apparently considered the norm, but which, if followed, Martha was sure, would produce not young men bent on exploring space, but young men bent on exploring trivia. A few of the questions concerned herself. Was Terry her only child? Yes. What had happened to her husband? He was killed in the Korean War. What did she think of the new law granting star mothers top priority on any and all information relating to their sons? I think it's a fine law. It's too bad they couldn't have shown similar humanity towards the war mothers of World War II. It was late in the afternoon by the time the TV crew got everything repacked into their cars and trucks and made their departure. Martha fixed herself a light supper, then donned an old suede jacket of Terry's and went out into the garden to wait for the sun to go down. According to the timetable the general had outlined in his first telegram, Terry's first Tuesday night passage wasn't due to occur till 9.05 but it seemed only right that she should be outside when the stars started to come out. Presently they did, and she watched them wink on one by one in the deepening darkness of the sky. She'd never been much of a one for the stars. Most of her life she'd been much too busy on earth to bother with things celestial. She could remember, when she was much younger and Bill was courting her, looking up at the moon sometimes, and once in a while when a star fell, making a wish. But this was different. It was different because now she had a personal interest in the sky, a new affinity with its myriad inhabitants. And how bright they became when you kept looking at them. They seemed to come alive almost, pulsing brilliantly down out of the blackness of the night. And they were different colors, too, she noticed with a start. Some of them were blue and some were red. Others were yellow, green, orange. It grew cold in the April garden and she could see her breath. There was a strange crispness, a strange clarity about the night that she had never known before. She glanced at her watch, was astonished to see the hands indicated two minutes after nine. Where had the time gone? Tremulously, she faced the southern horizon and saw her Terry appear in his shining chariot, riding up the star-pebbled path of his orbit, a star in his own right, dropping swiftly now, down, down, and out of sight beyond the dark, wheeling mass of the earth. She took a deep, proud breath, realized that she was widely waving her hand and let it fall slowly to her side. Make a wish, she thought, like a little girl and she wished him pleasant dreams and a safe return, and wrapped the wish in all her love and cast it starward. Sometime tomorrow, the general's telegram had said. That meant sometime today. She rose with the sun and fed the chickens, fixed and ate her breakfast, collected the eggs and put them in their cardboard boxes, then started out on her Wednesday morning run. "'My land, Martha, I don't see how you stand it with him way up there. "'Doesn't it get on your nerves?' "'Yes, yes, it does.' "'Martha, when are they bringing him back down?' "'Today, today.' "'It must be wonderful being a star mother, Martha.' "'Yes, it is, in a way. "'Wonderful and terrible. "'If only he can last it out for a few more hours,' she thought." If only they can bring him down safe and sound, then the vigil will be over, and some other mother can take over the awesome responsibility of having a son become a star. If only. The general's third telegram arrived that afternoon. Regret to inform you that meteorite impact on satellite hull severely damaged capsule detachment mechanism, making injection impossible. We'll make every effort to find another means of accomplishing your son's return. Terry! See the little boy playing beneath the maple tree, moving his tiny cars up and down the tiny streets of his make-believe village. The little boy, 
his fuzz of hair gold in the sunlight, his cherub cheeks pink in the summer wind. Terry! Up the lane the blue-denimed young man walks, swinging his thin, tanned arms, his long legs making near-grown-up strides over the sun-seared grass, the sky blue and bright behind him, the song of cicada rising and falling in the hazy September air. Terry! Probably won't get a chance to write you again before takeoff, but don't worry, Ma. The Explorer 12 is the greatest bird they ever built. Nothing short of a direct meteorite hit can hurt it, and the odds are a million to one. Why don't they leave the stars alone? Why don't they leave the stars to God? The afternoon shadows lengthened on the lawn, and the sun grew red and swollen over the western hills. Martha fixed supper, tried to eat, and couldn't. After a while, when the light began to fade, she slipped into Terry's jacket and went outside. Slowly, the sky darkened and the stars began to appear. At length, her star appeared, but its swift passage blurred before her eyes. Tires crunched on the gravel then, and headlights washed the darkness from the drive. A car door slammed. Martha did not move. Please, God, she thought, let it be Terry, even though she knew that it couldn't possibly be Terry. Footsteps sounded behind her, paused. Someone coughed softly. She turned then. Good evening, ma'am. She saw the circlet of stars on the gray epaulette. She saw the stern, handsome face. She saw the dark, tired eyes, and she knew. Even before he spoke again, she knew. The same meteorite that damaged the ejection mechanism, ma'am. It penetrated the capsule, too. We didn't find out till just a while ago, but there was nothing we could have done anyway. Are you all right, ma'am? Yes, I'm all right. I wanted to express my regrets personally. I know how you must feel. It's all right. We will, of course, make every effort to bring back his remains so that he can have a fitting burial on earth. No, she said. I beg your pardon, ma'am? She raised her eyes to the patch of sky where her son had passed in his shining metal sarcophagus. Sirius blossomed there, blue, white, and beautiful. She raised her eyes still higher and beheld the vast parterre of Orion with his central motif of vivid forget-me-nots in his far-flung blooms of Betelgeuse and Rigel, of Bellatrix and Safe. And higher yet, and there flamed the exquisite flower-beds of Taurus and Gemini, there burgeoned the riotous wreath of the crab, there lay the pulsing petals of the Pleiades, and down the ecliptic garden path, wafted by a stellar breeze, drifted the ochre rose of Mars. No, she said again. The general had raised his eyes, too. Now slowly, he lowered them. I think I understand, ma'am, and I'm glad that's the way you want it. The stars are beautiful tonight, aren't they? More beautiful than they've ever been, she said. After the general had gone, she looked up once more at the vast and variegated garden of the sky where her son lay buried. Then she turned and walked slowly back to the memoried house. End of Star Mother by Robert F. Young Recording by T.C. Parmalee, Dallas-Fort Worth, Texas